<laughs> the, the mayor is a little bit delayed, so we're going to go ahead and uh, call this meeting to order as we have a quorum. Um, let's go ahead and stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag's right over here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Robbie if he'd do our prayer for us. Yeah. Almighty God, we love you and we're thankful for our time together this morning to discuss the business of the city and uh, just the work that has gone on by city staff and council over the last few months. So uh, bless our time together, that you would be glorified in it, and uh, just give us clear thoughts and clear direction for the future. Uh, God, we want to pray special prayer for Terrence uh, today and uh, just the struggles that uh, he and Angela are are going through right now and just pray for comfort and uh, peace and healing in that situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so, yeah, the mayor is um, delayed. Is the clicker? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, the mayor's being interviewed by CNBC as we speak. Uh, so he's uh, uh, at TI about the TI project. So... Uh, he'll join us, he and Nate will join us when they get here. Uh, it shouldn't be too much longer. Uh, the agenda today um, is somewhat fluid. Uh, while the, doing the opening comments and going over the 23 work plan, if they're not back by the time I'm done with that, then Clint's going to jump up and do uh, start on, or maybe finish, uh, start and finish the streets and stormwater. And then we'll just kind of move things around. Our goal is to have these middle uh, presentations stay where they are because most of those are being done by outside folks. So uh, we'll, but we'll move things around as we need to here on, on today. Um, so uh, as it relates to the 24 work plan um, and kind of teeing all this up, so most of what we'll be focused on and talking about today relates to our, um, our massive CIP plan and the financial effects of that, both the cost of the projects and how we pay for it. Uh, so you'll, you'll see that come through today. And by the, at the end of today, we'll need some uh, head nods on what you think about uh, that program and us moving forward with it. Uh, remember that there is a separate meeting that we um, that we discuss the five-year CI plan, uh, CI, CIP plan. That's not for today, although we'll we'll touch on that. Um, but we'll have a separate meeting uh, to introduce uh, our five-year CIP plan. Um, so, secondly, is uh, the thing that you'll notice through all of this is. Um, us building our reserves for the next couple of years to uh, weather the um, you know the the storms that uh, storms you know they're, they're not um, they can be overcome we just have to uh, increase our reserves in order to do that particularly in the utility fund and that's related to uh, the debt as well uh, on the operation side. Uh, you'll see that we have very few new positions that we're requesting this year. Uh, last year we had 30-something positions that we requested uh, and filled. This year, uh, 424, it's much less. It's a handful. It's three or four uh, in the general fund and I think three in spread among the other funds. So a whole lot less, uh, fewer positions. There is uh, market adjustments, cost of living for all employees built into the budget and then uh, adjustments to the pay plan for police, fire, and streets that are baked in here as well. Uh, and then I think the other thing that you will see as we uh, kind of weave through our discussion is um, taking care of what we have. Um, this is just a summary of the input that I received from each of you council members, kind of condensed. <coughs> there was some other input that was more kind of granular, operational, that isn't listed here. Um, that is still on my list of things to do, uh, but this, these are things that uh, we have baked into our work plan as well. Uh, from a financial expectations and a focus standpoint, just highlights, uh, Mary will go over the details of the financials at the end of the day. 
but uh, we, we have had significant increase in our property tax base, um, split between new value added and values, uh, property values going up of existing properties. Um, we will be proposing um, a slight tax increase for CIP programs for the general fund for 24 with the idea that if things hold like we believe that they'll hold, that there will be decreasing pressure on the rates uh, beginning in about 26. Uh, we'll see a five-year snapshot of our best guess today of what finances look like over the next five years. But there starts to be some relief in 26, um, and it really builds up in 27 and 28. So uh, I believe while we'll be asking for uh, a tax rate increase, 100% of that of which is capital related. We're keeping the, proposing to keep the m and rate unchanged. Uh, so uh, tax rate increase that we'll be talking about relates fully to our capital projects. Sales tax revenues continue to be strong. A lot of that is the one-time dollars that we're getting from the major construction activity. Um, as you'll also see, we're kind of setting aside those accumulated dollars in the general fund as one-time monies, reserves, for one-time things. Uh, but you'll see reserves in the general fund uh, going up for those reasons. In the utility fund, uh, you know, we've got this massive amount of uh, debt coming on, some of which uh, will hit, um, the effects of which will hit immediately, some of which will be capitalizing interest, which means that we don't really have to start making payments on a lot of that debt um, until those projects are done. So that's the way we're, we're kind of weathering the storm here. Um, as we talked about at previous meetings, our proposed utility rate increase is going to be uh, not on the backs of the residential customers. It will be fully on the backs of the larger customers, uh, and we believe that's a fair approach because uh, those customers are the ones driving the need for these capital expansions which are then uh, driving the need for more revenue, which is generated by both volume and rates. Volumes won't be uh, sufficient until 28, 29, 30. So we've got to bridge a gap between now and then. And, and you'll see that in our uh, presentation about the um, rates that we have a little bit later. Will, will Dan will be here to talk about that. Uh, group Health Fund has had such a great run over the last several years. Uh, we've had a little bit of a struggle with it this year. It's continuing into next year. It's not, not terrible. It's just um, it's, it's ticked up a little bit. And so uh, we have a slide on that. It's nothing to um, worry about at this point. We are watching it. We did change um, third party administrators. So we want to make sure that um, this isn't going to be an annual trend of, of growth. but. Um, Spending has increased, I think, 10% or something like that in claims, which, um, you know, historically is a lot for us, but I think we've just been blessed with um, just great fund performance for many years. So uh, we do have uh, some challenges in the group health fund. The general fund has, has propped that fund up a little bit uh, to bring that back to the reserve levels that need to be, but uh, that was built into our budget as well. Um, utility fund, we're probably not going to spend a whole lot of time today, by the way, on utility projects because we've talked a whole lot about those, we kind of know what they are. Um, I will, tell you, uh, will say that um, uh, at the end of the budget meeting today, and I'm, I'm uh, assuming that we're going to be done with the budget today, if we're not, we can extend to tomorrow, but uh, my goal is to be done today, but after the meeting today, after we close, we're going to have a special call meeting that should take just a minute or two to approve the um, bonds that G2A just went out for, uh, for their $200 million bond issue that is the water plant and the wastewater plant expansion for the next few years, okay? Uh, the rates were good. They were a little better than we expected. Uh, here's the, here's the uh, interesting thing to me. I think Mary thinks it's interesting, but that may be where it stops. But uh, on $200 million, uh, one basis point difference. So a basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. So it's 0.01 or 
really technically 0.0001. So on $200 million, every one basis point over a 30-year period is equivalent to over $600,000 in savings. So um, we saved about $17 million in interest over what we thought we were going to have to pay for this, uh, for this debt. So that's real money. Uh, so we're, we're thankful for that. But that meeting uh, will be immediately at the end of the budget workshop, and we'll zip in and zip out and uh, be done with that. Um, and then I've also, uh, I have mentioned that I believe there will be rate relief in the 29-30 time frame, uh, depending on volumes. If volumes come more quickly than we're projecting, then uh, our, we'll uh, modify our rate structure, you know, accordingly. So, uh, solid waste fund, that, this one's a little tricky. Um, you know, reserves are less than we need on that. Uh, in 24, and remember that TASWA um, raised their gate rate in January, and I'm told they're doing it again in January, this coming January, um, to get their rates up to market um, market levels is what I'm being told, another five dollars. So we didn't build that into this budget because I just found that out yesterday. Um, so, my hope then is that with that extra revenue generated by TASWA, that they'll be passing that back to the city. And if they do, like I'm hopeful that they will, then we won't need a rate increase in the, in the solid waste fund. If they don't increase it, then we will need a rate increase. The thing is, we won't know that until late summer or early fall. So what we'll be proposing is, let's just go with what we have right now. When we get that information and commitment and, and number from TASWA, we'll come back to you and say, hey, here's what they said. Uh, and based on that, we'll, we'll be able to make the decision on what we do on the rates. So, little, uh, I don't know, surprised, disappointed, curious as to uh, why they're doing that. But it's their decision, but it does affect us. Uh, but we just want to make sure that um, we we're protected in that and all that. So, a uh, little kind of up-to-date information on that. All right, these next few slides, um, really just kind of informational to illustrate the things that I've uh, just said, which is the utility fund has much more pressure on rates over the next few years than the general fund on the tax rates. So, we did some uh, five-year projections. I bet my green one will work on this one. <laughs> Boom. Um, the five-year projections. Notice that the revenue in this, um, you know, from 22, 23 to 28, pretty straight. You know, pretty uh, not not much uh, up and down in the um, projections there. That's the general fund. Utility fund is a little bit different. So three lines on here. One is debt service. Uh, which you can see uh, debt service costs going up significantly beginning in 24-25. Also notice, they've got these observations up here by the way. Uh, also notice that the red line, which is expenses, very, very closely follows the, the shape of the uh, green line, which is to be expected because so much of our expenditures in the utility fund are debt related. So you would expect that shape to be uh, very similar, and it is. Uh, there's also this little gap here between revenue and expenses for a few years, and that's us building up our reserves until we get to this point where this debt really starts to take off. Okay, so you've got the, all those things going on. Also notice, um, it's not really a nice straight line. There's kind of a little bit of a bowl shape here. Um, so, if we put those two side by side, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation here between general and utility funds uh, revenues. It starts to widen here in the years that we're in. It kind of peaks, the widening peaks in 24, starts to come together in 26, and you'll see this really steep, um, it's kind of hard to detect on this slide because we're talking about 
you know, so much money, but uh, this really steep increase in utility revenues, which is really <coughs> largely rate-based, not volume-based yet. The volumes start to hit in this time, this time frame. But notice that, uh, that the widening uh, decreases during this time, which doesn't look like a lot until you look at that graph. And so this is a graph of year-on-year -year revenue change. So how much percentage-wise in, in both the general and utility fund do our, get our revenues change uh, from year to year? So when we project out to 25, 26, 27, there's this huge spike here. And that's because um, our rates are having to compensate for the lack of volumes at this time in order to pay for this. So this is our projected debt service. Uh, in the utility fund over the next um, 50 years, or 30 years, I guess. Um, this does include the 20, all the 23 issues. So this includes the debt that is on the books, or will be on the books um, this year. Um, so that's the problem that we're trying to solve with uh, volumes and rates. We're having to do it up front with rates until the volumes catch up. So you notice that this year-on-year -year percent increase really goes back down towards the end of this decade. Um, we have a similar issue in the general fund. It's just not that pronounced. I mean, this goes from $8 million to $60 million, so that's a 7 or 8x change in debt service. It's, while it's significant in the general fund, it's not 8x, it's 2x or something. So, And this is just the... Um, this, the slope of the general fund, um, you know, debt service as well. Okay, um, in terms of the 23 work plan, so this is the work plan that we set last year and uh, the progress that we've made on this. And we've seen this at the budget planning meeting and at the uh, CIP meeting, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these. What you need to be looking for are green and yellow um, stars, which means that they're either done or they're in the works and should be done, you know, shortly. So we have made very good progress on all of these things. There's a few of these items in here, like the rec facility, that we intentionally uh, went and did the planning, decided to move on from, so we just kind of, it's green, but not because uh, we're moving forward with the project, but because we've completed the planning process enough to get your direction. So um, there's a couple of items in there like that. Uh, we've been a little bit delayed on some of the fleet just because of long lead items. Uh, one example is the uh, aerial ladder truck that we ordered a year ago. October. So, and we don't expect to get it for another few months. So, 10 months? Okay. So, you know, 18 months, 20 month lead time on those things. So, uh, it's not that we haven't um, pursued those, it's just that, that we haven't completed those, so we can't, can't really say that that's fully green. A um, couple of other items, like the, uh, last year at this time, we said, hey, we may, need, uh, we may need a rate adjustment, and then before we approve the budget, um, you guys said, hey, let's hold off on that, let's see kind of how things are going, and so we, we actually, uh, you know, uh, didn't do the rate adjustment there. So, um, streets and uh, pothole crew, as of last week, we have those pothole crew and CIP crew filled. Okay. Hey. Um, now, we still have a two or three or a few open positions in streets, uh, but part of what we're trying to do with our uh, rates, and, uh, our, our pay increases in streets, is actually. Um, increase, enhance our ability to fill those open positions. Um, so uh, we're making group good progress on that one as well. Uh, these, are, these next two slides are, are more um, uh, broad, uh, smaller projects. Some of them are larger, but um, just more CIP related. Uh, we haven't really made much progress on right away from 56 to West Travis, simply because that hasn't been a priority. Um, we're, we're trying to get right of way, our right of way activities right now are laser focused on the 36 inch line and we're making good progress on that, um, not done there yet. We brought a few of those to you guys last meeting for you to consider, um, but we, we haven't really made progress on that. That's not a pressing project, 
Uh, the text dot dollars aren't even there yet. Um, so that's still on our radar. It's just not a, not a huge uh, deal. We're just now starting on the Fairview Park and Restroom concession. I think we're going out to bid. Yeah. When are we going out to bid on that one? For the Fairview Park? Yeah, uh, restroom. Fairview Park restroom, we're not ready to go out for bid on that one yet. We're ready to go out for bid for the, um, the Conroe Bees gotcha. restroom. And we just, we just installed um, MLK right. restroom right. It's as well. So, um, so anyway, making, making great strides on most of these. We've intentionally kind of um, put to the side Shark Tooth Park design right now so that we can get some of these other projects completed. Um, that's still on our list to do as well. It's just um, not on the front burner. Um, this master plan really <coughs> on trails is going to be for the next X amount of years. Um, I mean, we've got monies budgeted, uh, I think, 750000 a year for the next five years uh, for trail construction. So that's on our list as well. Uh, there is a very large trail project that we've submitted a grant for uh, that runs from the high school-ish up through to Binkley. And um, it's a two-mile, two-point-something-mile two mile trail, $5 million in some change. Um, we believe that we have a shot at getting the grant dollars for that, so our portion of that would be much less than $5 million, but um, we are making inroads on some of those parks projects, and particularly the trails. Um, okay, so let me see if I have an update from Nate, who said... So they're doing MSNBC today? Um, yeah, just okay. like just we went first. So. Um, they got us at eight thirty four. So, in the effort to keep moving, I'm going to have Clint start, and then we'll jump on to the uh, flyovers when Nate gets back. So let me jump in the streets. Are you driving? Oh uh, yeah. Okay. The streets. You're going the streets. Yep. <laughs> Service uh, to fix the, 
to basically do 20 year projects on streets. So uh, any street that's fully reconstructed, curbing gutter, all that stuff, that qualifies for bond proceeds. General maintenance, um, typically, um, we don't want to issue debt on a um, five or 10 year fix and then be paying on it for 20 or 30 years. So there's kind of a balance there on how, how it gets funded. Um, Hot all crews, we have three maintenance workers uh, that are actively going out and uh, looking for potholes. May not feel like it sometimes, but when the rain hits, a lot of them pop up. So um, citizens continue uh, to let us know where they're at. We'll get them filled uh, and then get them on the list to uh, uh, add it to the condition of the roads. Uh, and we also added a crew for right-of-way mowing. If you remember last summer, we talked a lot, and probably the last, what, four years now, We've looked at uh, hiring out um, mow crews uh, to mow all the rights of ways and, and different things, and we just had a really hard time finding dependable uh, work. We attempted to do a uh, request for qualifications, so we didn't pick the low bidder, and we picked someone that was qualified, and they didn't even work out. Um, and so we just defaulted last uh, last year to say, let's just hire uh, people in-house and, and, and mow that in-house. So uh, I feel like that program has been successful. Uh, Parks has done a good job on a lot of it, and then uh, streets right away when guys come in and do some of the more rural areas uh, of mowing. And just general cleanup, right? If we've got somebody that's dumping trash or something like that, somebody's got to do that. So uh, that crew helps um, a lot of us. Um, this map's kind of hard to see. I've got two more slides on here, but the red <coughs> is uh, everywhere that we've uh, touched for asphalt, that's actually like full mill and overlay. Um, the green is the chip seal areas, and then uh, the blue is concrete paving. Most of those are uh, utility cuts. Uh, so when someone comes in and messes the road up, we come back in and pave it. So this is a little zoomed in version there. Um, you can kind of see, we try to do whole neighborhoods of uh, chip seals. Uh, some of these areas are mill and overlay. Uh, this is uh, close to City Hall uh, that you probably saw there. Uh, Little Lane is not done yet, but it's on our list to do, or it's not done yet, right? It's on our list to do uh, right now. So, um, and then this is a, another uh, kind of zoomed in area of the work that we've done. So all these small, small things are utility cuts. Why do we do utility cuts? New houses going in, uh, new service lines, being repaired, so we have crews literally all over the city touching each one of those. So if you see a spot in town that just has rock in it, it's one of these spots. We don't have crews that can come in and do each one of these every single day as it happens. A, it's really hard to get asphalt or concrete in that small quantity. Uh, so most of the time they build those up and then they come in and they do a whole bunch of them all at once over a couple of days. So. On those, we try to keep the rock in there so that it's drivable, but be patient with us trying to. Asphalt plants are really finicky on uh, allowing us to, to do that. I mean, in Lubbock, if it, it was too windy, the asphalt plants would shut down. So, very, uh, very uh, fortunate to be able to get on the one. These are all the potholes that we filled. I don't know if your house is, is anywhere on this, but we filled all potholes all over the place. This actually shows um, the red are in 2022 and the blue are in 2023. So uh, lots of potholes that happen and uh, we try to get all those filled as, as quick as possible and having that crew uh, from last year actually makes it uh, even easier. We don't have to pull other people off of our projected work committee to make those repairs. One of the other projects that, that Streets worked on uh, this year was the parking lot uh, downtown. Uh, they went in, this was a before picture here, it's uh, lovely. Uh, they went in and did a full um, chip sill there. We cleared out some trees. Uh, we actually installed two solar lighting uh, panels out there. Um, so that, that parking lot really got cleaned up and with some of the buildings that are being renovated along that area, it, it, it looks way different than it has, it has before. Safer, uh, cleaner. Nicer, and then this is a, a mill and overlay that we did on North Crockett. Um, we milled it down. We probably drove on it. Some of our roads that looked like we we just blew it up. What we did is we took out several layers of chip seal over the years, 
and then it came back and, and did a two inch overlay on that. Um, so that's a that's more of a reconstruction project, but not a total reconstruction because we didn't mess with with the base. All right. So hey, let me point out another another project we did that served a lot of purposes. So uh, was it 22 or 23 that we did the? It's probably 22. We did the. Um, Old Iron Post parking lot. So we did that with internal crews, remember. We were looking for more space downtown for parking, entered into an agreement with Old Iron Post uh, to be able to use their, their uh, parking lot on East Houston. <coughs> we would um, renovate it, and um, so our street crews did a great job. That parking lot is full all the time, um, but we were able to do that in house. and. The cost of us doing it in-house is so much uh, less than hiring it out. So I'm thankful for uh, those are two examples of parking downtown that we enhanced uh, just with our own term, internal crews. So, uh, yeah, depending on the size, I mean, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's two or threefold on what we can do it for versus Hold. it's fourfold now uh, versus what we can do. So we try to do as much as we can in-house, but uh, again, sometimes, sometimes uh, the timing of those things to make it a little more difficult. So, uh, currently uh, we've uh, touched uh, 5.6 miles of asphalt paving. Uh, that's milling overlay, patching, uh, chip seal of almost 10 miles of road, uh, 0.95 miles of concrete, actually 200, uh, 456 cubic yards. That's those utility cuts or panel replacements like we are doing, uh, did yesterday on the Lloyd Lake. Uh, road uh, and then 491 potholes. So um, more than one pothole a day gets filled. All right, so <clears throat> you can tell me if I need to slow down on this, but I put all of these. I asked Kim McHorn to give me uh, a presentation on how we calculate our PCI or paving condition index, and they sent me 41 slides. So the point of these slides are to let you know how much work goes into grading a street. So if a water line has a leak, <coughs> it grade, it's grade went from 100 to 0 pretty quick, right? It's leaking, we've got to fix it. If a sewer line has a, has a clog in it and it's backing up somewhere, that went from 100 to 0. If the street has a crack in it, can you still drive on it? So streets are way more complex on at what point is it considered complete failure and we need to fix it? And at what point is it a, a maintenance issue? So uh, these slides are very, very detailed. I did a joke uh, yesterday with the mayor. If you want to take these slides home with you and mark off a 10-foot spot in your street and attempt to grade it, I'll compare it to what they came up with and we, it'll be like a little test to see how accurate uh, your calculations are. Uh, but. Um, the PCI index is a standard ASTM uh, practice on roads, and um, anytime we get someone to do this, we want to make sure they're using the same standards every time uh, so that we get accurate uh, numbers and grades on our streets. We don't want to play with the curve uh, on the grade, so we want to make sure it's the same every time. Um, so some of the stuff <coughs> they look at is the distress quantities, and they look at the distress densities, and they come up with a deducted value from 100, and then they allow for deductions and corrective deduction value, and then that comes out with the PCI score. Lots of fun stuff. Are you ready? I'm moving fast. So there's a lots of things that can cause distress. This is just for asphalt. There's a whole other 40 slides on concrete if we want to go into it. Uh, but there's alligator cracking. There's bleeding, block cracking. The depression, jet blast, patching, oil spillage, rivalry, running, 17 different things. And a car with a high-tech video drives over every square foot of our paving and comes up with what all those calculations are, how many of them there are in a certain area, and then divides that by the square footage of that area to come up with a density, and then they use the software to look at these curves, and there's probably about 17 different curves you can go to to come up with what the deducted value is, and then you determine if it's low, medium, or high, uh, 
because that adds weight to the, the scores and values. And you come up with what those values are for each distress, and you calculate what the allowable deduction is, and then you iteratively go through and do a calculation to come up with the actual value. And at the end of the day, you come in with a, an actual value of what that street is. So that street graded out to 57.5. So we did this with every single street in the city of Sherman. Uh, Kevin and Eric didn't do all these calculations for us. We had a computer program uh, that ran those. But there's a lot of detail that goes into this. Um, it's bipartisan. It comes up with, it, it is what it is, right? And so the idea is every three or four years we'll be going through this process to make sure we're prioritizing uh, our um, streets and our repairs accordingly. So once you get the score, then the question is, is how how bad is the street used, or how you know how do you balance one street versus the other? Right, 75 obviously is a little bit higher priority than uh, King Street, for example. Um, and so um, that's when we start adding the uh, cost benefit value. So what does it cost? Uh, to come in there. So what cost benefit looks at is it obviously takes the score. Uh, so whatever the, the street scored at, it takes the amount of traffic that's on the street. Thoroughfares, uh, major highways have higher values for there. Uh, it looks at their functional class, primary, secondary, tertiary. Uh, their treatment equivalent annual cost. This is important. So how much would it cost to fix it? And how long is that fix going to uh, stay before you have to do something else, right? So. If you could do a $500 repair in the last five years, uh, that number would be uh, $100 per year to fix uh, because we do have a budget we have to stick with. Um, and then uh, how close is that intersection or, or that section of a street um, slipping into the next category? So there's things you could do to a street that could take it from uh, a score of 80 up to 100 by just crack ceiling or by doing a chips hill. Uh, but at some point, that street gets so bad that it's going to slip into the next level, which is mill and overlay. And so if there's streets that are about to slip into the next category, we want to get those things fixed uh, this year so that we don't have a, a larger repair to do uh, moving forward. Um, so those are all the factors that come in on how we develop our work plan. And this, again, if you want to know exactly how we come up with that calculation, it's there. Uh, but this kind of shows, and these are actually our values, um, of where the priorities are. So uh, PCI goes from 0 to 100. Uh, we have lots of new subdivisions that just pop up, right? And then the, the, the value of it increases. So we want to try to hit these higher values first. And as you'll see, the higher values are typically streets that are in a little bit better condition because all they're going to require is that crack seal or that chip seal uh, in this area. And then you get to the second priority, which is uh, more reconstruction-esque. And this, this actually shows up. This is a great picture. So this area here is your preventative stuff. That's your chip seal, crack seal, um, routing of concrete streets and sealing those joints, keeping the water out of the subgrade, uh, resurfacing. Uh, that's where you may do a <coughs> building overlay, where the subgrade is still OK, or there's some spots in there that you need to, to fix, uh, and then reconstruction, the streets that have kind of fallen off uh, the path, the subgrade uh, is really messed up and we need to go in there and, and actually do full reconstruction. So these two boxes here, we use our general fund and our annual materials budget and our, our street guys to do those repairs. Uh, these could qualify, depending on the size of the project, uh, for the CIP money that we that you guys authorized last year to spend. Um, so that's kind of the idea. The hope is that we can do all that in-house. Uh, like Kevin said, that's fourfold. So we can we can do a lot more roads if, if we can do it in-house. But we've got to prioritize those roads. So when in the future, when we get calls about where we should be working, just know that there's a, there's a lot of information that was put into this. At the same time, uh, you're going to see... Um, here in a little bit, this is the map that the program spit out. So this is your work <coughs> plan for 2023. Well, if you notice, there's areas that are kind of all over the place, right? Well, in this neighborhood, we're probably just going to do the whole neighborhood. We're not just going to do what the program shows. So um, Kevin and Eric are still working on 
prioritizing mobilization, those types of things. So what areas can you jump in and get a lot done? What sections of street like this, right? We're not going to come in and do this section, this section, but then skip that one 500-foot uh, spot uh, in front of the mayor's house and then the rest of it, right? Uh, so um, it's a starting point, and then we use our, our, our supervisors and our managers to help hone in on what actually needs to happen. Um, so um, part of what's on the, the list for last year was to do full reconstruction in this area of Blanton and uh, Scott Bell and Grant area. So we're still leaving that on the list uh, to do. Um, it is on the, it did show up on the five-year plan, um, but we're going to continue to, to do that with our in-house crew, the CFP crew that we recently uh, got filled. So now it's a matter of coordinating timing of, of crews and Concrete, uh, we're going to redo the concrete curb and gutter, so we've got to get that in there and do all that. And then year two will be this area, uh, which is using some of that bond fund uh, money. And then this shows the five year work plan. So in five years, these are all the areas that we're touching in town uh, with the, the, the currently approved budget. So um, it's, it's kind of a balance. If you tripled our budget, we wouldn't be able to necessarily triple our workload because we don't have triple the amount of people or equipment. So at some point, if you start hiring it out, then you just cut your your uh, your funds uh, by uh, uh, a fourfold. So um, lots of projects on there. What what me and Kevin and Eric did talk about this last week because we just got this map updated. Uh, we had them redrive some of our thoroughfares because of all the uh, construction, traffic bypassing. Uh, we had them update that just like last month. So we just got these updated maps. Uh, it was nice to see that some of the stuff that's on here, we've already done. We did this year in between when we got that. Um, Tuck is, a, is, is one here that they said needs to be overlaid, and we, we just finished that this month. Uh, Little Way is on here. Um, so there's several on there that just gave us confidence that just from our perspective on dealing with streets every day, it matched up with the, with the program. So we feel like that, uh, that model is, is being fairly accurate. So these colors just have to do with the year that they're in, not the uh, treatment types. So the reason that map's important is because we are in the final year of our street sales tax program. Remember that's a four-year program. We've got to re-up that every four years. It's time to re-up. Uh, we've got a couple of slides on that. But this is the visual that we'll use uh, and have it printed out and put it at City Hall, uh, you know, out outside council chambers for public to see and PNC folks to see that uh, here's our work plan, here's what we're doing, uh, at least partially. The street sales tax won't cover all of this, but it helps us to be able to do all of this with it. The other way to say it is, without it, that's probably not our work plan. We, we're we're going to have to cut back our work plan or find the money from somewhere else, which we don't have a plan for not having the street sales tax money. Uh, we don't have a plan B for that yet. If it doesn't pass, we'll we'll develop a plan and come back to you. But uh, the reason this map's important is that's our work plan for street sales tax for the next four years. It's a terrible looking map. Those are zoomed in areas uh, of town. You'll see Travis Street's on here. Um, that's not because it's in bad shape. We just need to go back in a, a, a route and seal the cracks on the concrete. So that's it. One of those, it's in that top category. We want to keep it at the top uh, for as long as we can, uh, along with some of these other subdivisions. Uh, so, do we want to go back and, and review the PCI calculations again? Sure. <laughs> yeah. It is. It, we joke about that, but, um, and I, I don't want to do that. But, uh, <laughs> even I don't want to do that. Um, but we get questions pretty regularly about. How do you guys decide? My street's worse than any other street in here. I mean, we use scientific, you know, defensible methods to determine what our work plan is, right? It's data-driven. It's, you know, complex calculations. It's detailed. We, we don't just guess. We have, as Clint said, we drive every mile of city street to assess the conditions, and then we plug it into this system and it tells us what the plans are now. We can modify those. We can choose internally because of 
you know, number of complaints or whatever, um, you know, to, to do something different. But there is a method to the madness, and it's not just arbitrary like some believe because the street in front of their house isn't being paved while the next street over is. Uh, it, we're not picking on people. We just have a, a system that uh, helps us prioritize these things. So be, you guys be the mouth, mouthpieces for us on this, uh, that it's not just willy-nilly, uh, you know, hey, what street do we want to do next year? We've got a five-year plan based on data. And we'll drive this periodically, um, probably update the PCI, oh, every five years. Uh, or, or more frequently as needed. Yeah, and we talked about, I mean, that's traditionally five years is, is the rule. With all the construction and growth that we have, it, we'd probably do it sooner than that, right? Once 75 is done, that would be a good you know, jumping off point in 1417, where now everybody's using the roads that they're used to using again. Um, we're re looking at some of those conditions because it's obvious some of the roads uh, that, were, that, were, that are on this work plan are a result of. 75 construction. Right? They're just people are using different roads and they have to work because they're trying to avoid delays or wanting to traffic up on the road. That, the, that was the driving factor why we had some roads be driven was because of the 75 construction and forced traffic on so many of our streets <coughs> that we wanted to re drive again after 18 months. They, they, they changed considerably, so we wanted that plan to reflect that. Also, I would add that that van that Robert was talking about, that has all the lasers and the cameras, that van cost over a million dollars that they drive to, to make all those calculations. It's not just a cheap investment. We didn't pay them a dollar. Hey, Clint? Yes. Can you go back to the map on the east side? <coughs> Specifically, uh, Cherry Street, is there a mark in there? That, uh, that street is horrible. I can testify for that. We can we can look at that. Uh, Cherry, Cherry Street. Cherry. Let's look and see where Cherry Street is on that list. Because that one almost feels like you're at red next to paychecks sometimes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guarantee we don't have speed problems there, right? What's that? No one speeds down that street. Over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. Natural speed bumps. We'll look and see where that's at. I, mean, I would guess if you're saying that, it is probably on this Honestly, street. the police yeah. department can tell you about that. They, they drive that road every day from private. It does, it does look like there's some of it uh, down yeah. there. Ooh, is that right? Uh, down there, that's not all of it. I don't know which section you think is or is it, the worst, but it's that fun. might be one where, hey, if we're out there mm -hmm. already and it's on our plan. I would say from Travis all the way to Willow. Yes. Really bad. Okay. Is this map accessible for you know to zoom in on and see and for the you know for us that if someone has a question for us about yeah. their street, we yeah. can make it. Yeah. yeah. Currently, it's not, but we can we can add it to okay. our. Own. Yeah, because yeah, this is hard to hard to see. Yeah. In, but we do have a high quality. I think we have a high quality. Map that, we I can, we that will allow it to be zoomed in. And knowing it's subject to change based on that's the whole thing. Is it's it's, it's it, yeah. streets is so different than than water mm -hmm. here, right? So it is subject to change. But this is we have a plan moving forward and, and a calculated projection on why we picked what we did instead of just. Uh, what about the uh, the railroad crossing? Who's who's in charge of that? So those are the railroads in the charge of those crossings. Uh, we I, I feel like I know BNSF has had three or four different people <coughs> in charge that have left and new people <coughs> coming in. Um, what's the other uh, railroad that you've been dealing with? Uh, you know? Yeah, they've yeah, had at least two or three different people. Yeah. There's not so much complaints. Most of the ones I've heard is being It's it's not a quick process. They'll if we yeah. go out there and, and fix it without their permission or without proper planning, we get in big trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's been and we've gotten some of them taken off as they've been some of the tracks. Yeah. But yeah, that is a couple years ago we had us uh, did a number of the crossings from near downtown. <coughs> Yeah, there's just some on the side streets that are terrible, yeah. right? That are pretty much abandoned railroad, but pretty much they still own rights to it, so we can't just. Yes. I guess we could, but we would get in trouble. Mm -hmm. All right.
Do you want to talk about? Talk about street sales tax. Um, yeah, I'll I'll take that just briefly. Is that uh, that's the next step here? Yeah. Right? Is it just I'll do it from here. Okay. And then let you, uh, you finish up with stormwater. Keep going. Yeah, just, storm. No, you stay there. I think it's all right. It's okay. So uh, we mentioned street sales tax. Um, <coughs> it's about two point. Uh, sales tax has been going up. 2.4 million a year now for street sales tax. Uh, the last, our last program, the last four years, 2021, 20, 22, 23, was about 8 million. So that tells you how much it's grown in just the last two or three years. Most of that was on maintenance. Some of that was on equipment, and that's that's what that slide is. So how this works is um, every four years we got to go back. It, uh, the language on the ballot that so we have to take this back to the voters every four years the language on the ballot is set for us we don't we can't modify that um, so it gives us uh, descriptions uh, of what the actual language has to be as a reminder uh, it cannot be used for um, new streets so um, we can't, uh, you know, for Bel Air Boulevard, I'm using that as an example, as a I mean, you know, non-existent street. Um, can't do new streets with it. It has to be for maintenance and repair and rebuilding of the streets that existed at the time it's passed, right? So that's, uh, if it passes in November, whatever streets are on the books, November of 23, those are the only streets we can touch for the next four years. Can you? What's the definition of exist? How much do they have to exist? Um, do you mean like if it's a gravel road somewhere, is that considered a street? Or my sense is um, if it's platted and it's dedicated, then it's a street because the part of the other definition of a street is an entire width of way held by easement or dedication. So if it's um, if we have that already on the books, it's already platted, it's already dedicated, uh, and there's some semblance of a street there, then it it is fair game. Okay. And next areas that, that maybe come on after that. Uh, yeah, could they be in our ETJ? That's a, that's a great question. I don't think we've we've not used it in the past for that. But that's a nuance that we haven't actually looked at. A lot of those are in bad shape. <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> so, just curious. Yeah. Now, I know for sure we cannot use them for ETJ areas. Mm -hmm. Can we use them for if they if the streets existed as of November, when it's passed, and subsequent to that November, they're annexed and brought in, can it be used for that because it is an existing street? It is a right of way. It, it would be dedicated. So I don't know. We can look into that. Okay. That's a great question. You guys are. You guys are. Thank you. Um, obviously, it can't be used for highways or state roads. So we can't use this as our match for TxDOT. It's got to be for city streets. Um, and so this will come back. I think the next slide is the uh, calendar. So in August, we'll come back with the ordinance calling the election which will be for November 7th. Um, there are some reporting requirements. We've got to report to the, uh, the status and the results of that uh, to the comptroller by so many days after the election. Uh, there are notice requirements in the newspaper. So that, that gives you the calendar. But uh, unless you tell us otherwise, and we would very strongly suggest we go back out for this because we don't have a plan B and it's worked very well. Uh, our plan would be to, to re-up this. Uh, our history with this uh, uh, passage of this has been very positive. Um, the lowest, the lowest to my recollection is like 78% approval. Uh, and it's ranged in that 80%. I think maybe the highest was like 81%. So it's right at 80% plus or minus approval. So uh, I think it, you know, a good chunk of that success is us being able to demonstrate through maps and other uh, other ways, just word of mouth, 
Uh, hey, we're doing what we said we were going to do. Here was our plan. Here's how we accomplished it. Here's how we did on it. Here's our plan for the next four years. Uh, subject to, you know, change, modification, but um, having a plan going in, I think, is the key to success in that. So. Robbie, that's a quarter on the sales tax rate? It's one-eighth. One-eighth. One-eighth of a cent. Um, and, again, it's just a four-year. It sunsets automatically in four years. And so um, two, mm, one or two cycles ago, the legislature was contemplating making it eight years, but that didn't, it didn't, uh, didn't pass. So we've been on that four-year track since 2000. Uh, 2007 was our first election year, so that was... 2008 through 11. So, anyway, uh, any tentative um, input on that? Is there any reason you guys would think we would not want to pursue that? Okay. All right. Keep going. All right. Stormy and Sherman. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the stormwater utility uh, uh, rate and program and, and where we're going and what we want to do uh, moving forward. So, uh, Sherman. Like most cities in Texas has a history of uh, flooding. Uh, if you've been around, these are all the, I, I pulled this up out of our uh, master plan and didn't realize how often some of this occurred uh, back in, in the 2006-2007. Uh, the two events in June of 2007 July of 2007 <coughs> triggered the need to do an actual uh, flood study of Post Oak Creek, uh, which is kind of most of the uh, developed area of Sherman. Uh, since that uh, and the passing of, of the fee, we've had a couple other events. Uh, 2015 wasn't a major flood, it was prolonged rain. I remember it kind of started raining in like January 1 and it didn't stop until Father's Day. And so we had lots of uh, failed subgrades, roads, bridges, all that kind of stuff. Texoma was, was, went from record low to record high in about 30 days. Uh, and then in 2017, we had some additional flooding in Post Oak Creek. So, uh, 2013, this was officially created. This is the, the watershed of Post Oak Creek. Um, there, if you'll notice, it doesn't include, this is 691 and 75. Uh, that area of town drains uh, to the north towards the Nissan. Uh, this area of town, which the high school is right here, uh, drains uh, south and southeast uh, to Choctaw Creek. Uh, so those are uh, areas that we haven't really done detailed studies on. Uh, but this report specifically focused on that. So all the projects in there are just for these areas. Uh, these were a list of the projects at the time, and then beside it, here are the projects that, that we completed or did additional studies to determine if uh, cost benefit uh, weighed out on that. So originally there were 27 projects. We uh, whittled that down to 18 cost estimate. 2013 price is at 55 million. There's no telling what those updated prices are for 2023 or moving forward. I'm sure it's much higher, uh, but you'll see here uh, we've, we've done a lot of acquisition uh, from uh, severe repetitive loss properties. Uh, we actually did a study at on several of these detention ponds, uh, town center detention pond, um, and uh, several of these. We actually did a flow calculation. What I ask our engineers to do is um, if we put a pond there, how much does it drop the floodplain? And, and a lot of those, the, the results came back that if you spent $10 million, you were going to save three or four inches of, of, of downstream flooding, which the cost benefit there did not add up at all. And so they're not complete, but we did the study to determine that it didn't make sense to spend the money on there. Um, where it does make the sense to spend some money, is in connection with developers. Uh, most of those locations either have an existing pond or will have to have a pond uh, when it's developed. And so one of those projects, the Sherman uh, Hills, I believe, they're putting a pond at, at one of these locations. I think it's this one. Um, and, and so adding a little bit of money to oversize uh, their pond, actually we did an updated model to show that that actually helped. So those are ways I think that's better to spend that strong money and going out and buying the property, uh, digging in a big, big hole and not having a, a, an impact. And um, the reality is, too, that $10 million that you spent protecting downstream property, 
would it be more valuable just buy the property that is at higher risk um, instead of spending the $10 million? So we balance that through this program on several locations. Um, specifically ones that come in for new building permits because they just recently budgeted. Um, we, I called Mary several times and said, hey, they're wanting to put in, uh, they're wanting to remodel this house, I'd rather buy it at a deep discount and not ever have it flood again. Uh, because even if it's private property and it floods, they call 911, we still show up, right? And so we're putting a bunch of people at risk because the property was built somewhere that it, it, it shouldn't have. Um, these are uh, projects that we've completed. Uh, we, we purchased, um, there is a, uh, a property uh, just west of the cemetery on 56 that had a bunch of trailers that were right in the middle of the floodplain. Uh, those were purchased. Um, Kessler Road project, if you're around here in that, that project, we bought all those homes. Um, and another kind of feather in our hat, all the properties that we purchased through this program, uh, we didn't have to go to eminent domain or, or condemnation on any of them. They were all voluntary sales. Uh, so we were able to work out uh, with those property owners. Uh, and a lot of them wanted to leave. They just couldn't sell uh, without letting the, the, buyer, the future buyer know that it's a flood property, which means most people don't want to buy it. Um, and so all those areas are now park areas or open space that we maintain. Um, we partnered with Magnolia Village uh, on some oversizing of their ponds. Uh, we did some drainage improvements at Seven Suns, uh, and then we updated our floodplain ordinance and all of the uh, detailed mapping of Post Oak Creek. So those maps were actually updated last year. Last year, it took like seven years to get FEMA to update the maps, but that was a big deal um, to take into account of what actually is there. Um, these are some of the other locations. Uh, ongoing projects. Uh, we've got a project to do some erosion repair at Center Street. That's not actually removing the floodplain of Center Street. So, in order to get Center Street out of the floodplain, that bridge would have to be elevated, I think, three or four or five feet. We don't have the funding for that, but there's some erosion problems under that bridge that were uh, are under design. We're hoping to fund this year uh, to pay for that. Uh, Blanton Drive has some drainage problems. Talked about the Hills of Sherman, uh, which is right in this area, uh, <coughs> upsizing their detention pond. Uh, there's lots of erosion along Post Oak Creek. If it touches our park or uh, our cemeteries, there's things that need to be repaired and improved there that erosion projects are not cheap. Um, South Travis Street Bridge, right down here. Um, we actually went out there and, and, and looked at, at that yesterday. Uh, they expect that to be open by the time school starts. So um, that was a project that was funded by federal bridge dollars. Um, so we only had to pay 10% of, of that new bridge. And um, TechStop took care of that. Um, 75 main lanes, obviously that project's undergoing. Um, that was their goal in that project in between 56 and Park. The reason that's elevated the way it is is to ensure that it doesn't, not the frontage roads, but the main lanes uh, stay out of the, uh, of, they don't flood. Uh, hey, that hundred year. Clay, can you explain to us what the difference between a flood zone and a flood plain? So it's it's floodway and flood plain. So a floodway is the part that's actually moving water. So the mainly the creek area. The flood plain is the area that when it fills up and it just kind of backs up into and that's where you have those areas of standing water. It is adjacent to it but it's not it's not actively moving. Okay. Uh, so the floodway we don't allow any structures to be in uh, at all. Um, the flood plain they can be in if they do certain uh, flood protection or elevate out of that, okay. that area. And because these maps have been updated over the years, there's always going to have structures that are in the floodway or floodplain that are existing, and we, we don't have authority to go and tear them down, uh, but if they do flood, we could not issue a new building for those areas. So, so the uh, severe repetitive loss program that we did in 2017, we partnered with FEMA. FEMA paid 75% of the cost, we paid 25% of the cost, and those we targeted for the areas that were in floodways um, and, and that, that type of thing. So, so I, 
think a lot of you are new from when we originally went through kind of what is a stormwater utility fee. Uh, it is a fee that we charge uh, everybody in the city. Um, and uh, it's dedicated just to stormwater. Uh, the fee is authorized by state law and it kind of evaluates your stormwater project needs like our impact fee has done and, and assesses those uh, to help for, for anybody that basically uh, contributes to the need for stormwater. So uh, what it's based on is uh, impervious area. So uh, your front yard when it rains, part of that water soaks in into the ground and does what it needs. If it hits your paving, your, your driveway, it hits and it goes into the street. So uh, your driveway is impervious, your roof is impervious, um, some gravel services are impervious, and so that's where that, that term comes from. And so what uh, the study was done is they looked at, they took aerials and more kind of computer analytics and determined uh, the impervious area for every property in Sherman, uh, and also every re residential house. And they figured out that the average house in Sherman has an impervious area of about 3,400 square feet. Uh, that, that, that's from, that's roof line, sidewalks. Um, it doesn't include the right of way, it's just the driveway there. Uh, and th that's how they determine what's called the ERU or the equivalent residential unit. And so the fee is based on that unit. Um, and so if you are a commercial property, this commercial property, um, its total square foot of impervious area was 81,000. Uh, so 81,000 divided by 3,400 means that it's equivalent to 24 residential homes. And so they would be charged 24 of those units versus a resident uh, average home would only be charged one of those units. So what was also uh, proposed in, uh, in effect was to tier uh, the residential structures uh, so the average home is here, uh, and, and they're charged one unit. Uh, if you have a smaller home or, you know, a smaller driveway, uh, you're only charged uh, about 60% of that unit. And then if you have a larger house, over 6,000 square feet of impervious area, not livable area, uh, you would be charged uh, almost double for that. And that's common um, across, across the board, which is just you know, paying for those impervious areas. So there's not a lot of the tier three residential uh, insurance, but they do exist and they do get charged a little bit more. Does anybody know what our fee, our current fee is for one residential ERU is? No, they not. No? <laughs> one buck. One dollar. Yeah. So uh, average home gets charged one dollar every month on their water bill, along with their trash, uh, water, and, and sewer usage. Um, and so that one dollar was approved, and so that equivalent that is about four hundred and fifty about it's four hundred fifty eight thousand of revenue a year that's generated, and that's a, a bucket that has to be used specifically for stormwater projects. So in two thousand seventeen, um, we issued about four million dollars in bond money uh, to help kind of kickstart that program. Uh, one of the big projects that we worked on was Lambert Road. Uh, not only did it cost the most, but it took the longest to complete. Uh, but, um, and if you'll remember, that's only for 60 or 70 percent of Lambers Road. When that project was bid out, it came in over budget that we didn't have, and so we pulled back part of the drainage structure that needs to happen there by the, the car dealership. It's still on our list to do, but it didn't happen with, with this funding. We also funded part of the setting sun's drainage uh, projects. We did uh, get the Post Oak Creek um, map updated, and we were able to purchase about 1.2 million of property uh, and get it out of the floodway, uh, flood, flood zone. Um, so, current budget, as we know, that four million costs money to serve that debt, and so we're spending about 275,000 a year on debt service for the projects that are here. Um, we've got, like you saw on the earlier side, we've got two guys that are dedicated specifically to stormwater projects. Obviously, some of the bigger stuff, repairs, streets, and whoever else we need comes and helps, but they're dedicated specifically to that. Uh, they have an equipment and material budget of about 80000 a year, uh, which comes up to 462000 So Mary doesn't like this number because if you'll notice, it's higher than what the revenue is. So um, the reality of this program is it gives us a, 
an additional bucket of money to pay for these things. But in reality, when storm drain projects come up, it's coming out of the general fund uh, because there's, there's just there's not enough money to fund it completely out of this. Uh, and there's some projects that just need to happen. And so we add that to our general CIP list, just like we do with street, street repairs or street improvements. So it's not the wrong way to do it, but um, what we're asking today is maybe to make this budget a little bit bigger. Uh, so, it, math's real easy. If you take one dollar and, and make it two, then you've got twice as much money. If you make it three, you've got three times as much money. Uh, and again, that's kind of, that's what the, the residents would be paid, would, would have to pay each month. Um, and so an example of like a water burger, uh, their fee right now is eight dollars. We would jump up to twenty-four dollars. Uh, Walmart, a, a bigger user, would be paying about seven hundred. Um, one of the big concerns when we first approved this program was how uh, citizens and, and companies would, would deal with this. Um, when it first happened, we did have some calls. Um, we only had, uh, I know Panda called and asked about it. Uh, they were more curious why it was on their bill after I explained it to them. It was, it was a non-factor. And so uh, it wasn't as um, confrontational as, as we thought it might be because it is a new program. Um, and now most people probably don't even know it's on their bill um, because of all the other things are so much, much higher than that. But um, again, this kind of shows uh, if uh, $2, if you were to approve a, a increase from $1 to two, uh, that would generate an extra 458,000 a year. Uh, where we would propose to put that is, is to increase the, the staffing uh, by one person. Um, and then also increase their budget to actually do some just general maintenance things that we can do in-house. And then that would leave about 361 of a potential to issue debt service on if we wanted to, uh, to, to do some additional projects. And I'll get to those here in just a second. Um, yeah, hey, Clint, back on that slide. Every, roughly every $60,000 is $1 million in projects. Ish. So 360,000 uh, would be uh, five to six million dollars in CIP projects that we could do if we allocated. Right. And if approved, we would create, we don't have a specific list now because there's not money there really. Uh, but if, if approved, we would come back and, and do a presentation on what we're proposing to do uh, as part of that. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, that we talked about a lot when we first uh, approved this was um, who, is there anybody we exempt from this fee? Um, and so by state law, we're required to exempt undeveloped properties. Obviously, their impervious area is zero, so they shouldn't be charged anything. Uh, state property institutes of higher education. Uh, so Austin College is not a, a part of this program, and, then, um, and that's already included in those, in those revenue streams. One thing that you could consider uh, that's allowed, but we decided um, last time not to, to include city property, county property, school districts, or uh, religious institutions. So um, currently all of those, um, those groups are, are paying the fee, and I don't know that I had any of those um, groups call and ask what was going on with those groups, but those we have the option uh, to exempt if, we, if, we, if you guys want. And that's part of the, the ordinance that would have to be updated in that. Um, this is um, showing you what uh, the current certificate fee is here. Um, I also pulled the chart from 2017 and then added the updated fees. Uh, Mary and Craig and Finance went and, and pulled all these numbers to kind of show you what the fee was in, in 17 versus what it is now. Uh, so we were in the $1 range. The only other one that was in the dollar range was Capel. Uh, they're now four dollars. Um, so just showing you, if asking. I think Robbie's got it on his slides to ask for two. I'll ask for three, but we can uh, y'all decide that. Um, but that's kind of the range for these areas. I do in Lubbock because I'm from Lubbock, and uh, it always kind of cracks me up how big their fee is. But uh, they're at um, about eleven dollars. It's because there's nowhere for the rain to go when it does rain. <laughs> it could be. I don't know. They, they took the approach of what is it going to cost to fix all of our problems. 
they got the number back and they approved the fee to get rid of all the problems. What's their annual rainfall versus our? Um, our <laughs> annual rainfall in Lubbock is probably like nine or ten inches a year. What's ours? It's close 40, to 40, isn't it? 36 yeah. or 8. Yeah. Uh, 35 to 40. But well, we have creeks. Yeah. They don't. Yeah, they don't have creeks. Yeah. It's just <laughs> flat. Huh? Just, yeah. So anyway, so flat. That, that's relative there. Um, wow. All, all, almost every city has a, this fee, and it's just another uh, way to uh, create another bucket to, to do those things that are specific to stormwater. Um, so, um, again, these are the list of, of projects that we've either completed or are working on. Um, some of the things that we could uh, continue to do um, is um, partnering with developers on oversizing detention uh, where needed. Uh, we need to finish the, the, the Lambert Road um, bridge project. Um, if you look back at, I don't think I showed it. Definitely that. With the development happening on the south side of town, near Shepherd, um, there's probably some value in doing a full study on Choctaw Creek and that drainage basin to make sure that those maps are accurate, which is this whole area here, which is growing over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and so that's another project similar to this study that would be specifically for the Choctaw Creek area. We could also potentially do one in, in this area as well uh, from a study standpoint, which would pinpoint some projects that would be needed there. But, um, bridges and, and erosion protection are always very expensive, um, and so we do those when we have to, and unfortunately sometimes we do them when a bad thing happens, but uh, we're monitoring them, and, and those will get done somehow, because uh, they're needed, uh, but this is a way to help uh, bridge the gap to what's needed in bridge the gap. We all have one on bridge the gap. Bridge the gap. Bridge the gap. All right, that's all I got. Okay. Um, hey, let's take a 10 minute high water mark. Uh -huh. uh, and then Nate will uh, start on the flyovers. So, 10 minutes, and let's, uh, let's try to keep it, keep it going.
Okay, oh, you welcome got back to uh, World Budget Meeting. Uh, we are unveiling today, uh, for the very first time, for your eyes only, uh, footage from Sherman 3. Woo! Sherman 3. Our third drone in the past eight years, seven years actually. Um, and uh, it's got a much better camera, so this will this be in 4K today. So get your glasses on. Um, and uh, it's much easier to handle. It's got a lot longer range on it, so we can fly about three miles out in one direction. There's about double what we can do with the old one. Uh, so it's really neat, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Um, a lot of these, we're going to do a before and after kind of look uh, at Robbie's suggestion of what things looked like exactly, well, actually 53 weeks ago, since uh, it was a little earlier last year. Um, and we'll start off with Bill Air. Uh, so this is one of the more dramatic ones that you will uh, see today. That was June 7th of 2022. That's what Bill Air was looking like then. Today, obviously, a uh, much different look. He's blurry. Uh, you see the townhouses going in, in there in the front, as well as the single family behind it. We've got the dog park in, as well as the regular park there in the middle. And then this really gives you your first uh, real look at what the uh, phase two is going to look like. 700 homes back here behind what was already built. And if you look on the far right side of the screen there where the uh, truck was driving over there, uh, that will be Bel Air Boulevard. That's the city's participation in this. Uh, and that will be something that we will put in as this phase uh, goes in over the course of the next year. Uh, Flipping around now to look at the multifamily portion, uh, where the trees are is kind of where the multifamily will be, and to the right of there, looking in the middle, of course, uh, and then the city has some obligations for a uh, east-west street there as well. The lagoon is where? Uh, it's, it's, it's about where the tree grove is. Oh, okay. Yeah, where the for sale trees are. It's just right in the middle. Side. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's really good. So yes, yeah, so this will be uh, the first multifamily building going over here. Multifamily will fill all in through there, and then the lagoon will kind of be right there in the middle section. Obviously, everybody's very excited about the lagoon. I probably get more questions about the lagoon than I do about anything else that we do, so people are still very excited about that. Uh, Tell them there's two lagoons right down the road? <laughs> 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 Uh, this is Washington Meadows. Uh, this one's not quite as dramatic, but we did want to give you a look at what it was versus what it is. A lot of these houses, most of these houses are occupied now, as you'll see with the uh, trampolines in the backyard. Um, all these back roads have been added in the past year, as you see there, kind of second phase at the back side of that development. Uh, we'll get a look at 1417 in and of itself. So this is a good short video. See the new houses going in on that one. Heritage Ranch, another one uh, where quite a bit has changed. They had just kind of started moving dirt last year uh, when we met. Uh, as we'll see, they have really laid out the entire first section now. Um, a lot of the work has been done underground. A lot of the uh, pipes and uh, drainage systems have been installed underground. Um, and as you can see, they are ready to start putting in the road. So yeah, that, that part of dirt, little patch of dirt you saw on the, on the 2002 video was just this little piece right here. So they've really done a lot as far as expanding that out to start building the first phase. Uh, and then, of course, on the, we're going to hit the uh, no-fly zone here in that city. It's another short one. Uh, and then that project also includes uh, that ramp reversal, if you guys remember from the uh, CIP, uh, that is uh, to uh, take that section and move the, Highway exit further to the east so that uh, people will be able to get off and get off the plane view. Uh, this is Three Oaks, so last year uh, we were looking at just that little area right there, phase one, didn't have any houses, now it's all built out. Uh, and they have started phase two on the old Sherman nursery land there. As you can kind of see how that will uh, meet in there. Friendship Road, uh, Robbie's favorite project, uh, Hickory Hill. PD is what you're seeing there. Uh, so the city will be putting that road in along this side that will go down to about where they're stopped there. Uh, that'll be phase one. That'll be a project for this year. Uh, you kind of see their uh, road starting to go in. And then thanks to the uh, upgraded uh, range on the drone, we're going to get to fly all the way down uh, to where this road will go. So you see Lake Robbie Captain over here on the side <laughs> um, with uh, the road that will come through here. 
And then after we turn right, after we get over Sand Creek, you'll see that once it meets up with the current section of Friendship Road, which is right over here, uh, it's a straight shot all the way down to OB Groner. So that will, of course, be a major north-south uh, road for the city of Sherman as that western portion uh, continues to fill in all the way down there to OB Groner. The Interurban Parkway, currently known as Moore Street, uh, this is currently slated for a next year project. Um, that uh, hill that you saw there at the beginning, that'll be smoothed out a little bit. And we will build, uh, much like we did down uh, you know, close to the high school, the first two lanes of this road. If you've driven on this road recently, uh, you can you will, uh, not be too happy because it's in pretty awful shape after the work at the Grove over the last year. And we will get a nice look at the before and after there as well. Uh, so last time we looked at the Grove, they only had this front section of apartments done. Uh, they've now added the whole back section as well. And then you'll see, so this is uh, last year, and you'll see the added houses here in two seconds. So they've uh, been, since finished and opened all these apartments in the back half of that development. And then as you can see, they've really filled in a tremendous amount of those uh, 220 some lots there. Uh, you see the work being done across the street in Pellwork Phase 4 that will kind of fill in this L shape here that you see. Um, that road uh, that goes to Steeplechase will be carried across, as you can see. It will not go directly in, so it will come around like this uh, to discourage people from using that really as a through street. Another uh, 135, 140 houses there. Get a great look at our beautiful high school. Uh, the mayor and I were out at, at TI. It's actually cool. You can see uh, the high school from the hill on TI, which is kind of neat. See Sherman's future coming together. We won't really talk about this part of the road. Um, <laughs> this is, of course, uh, the Moore Street connection that has uh, just had all sorts of problems during its uh, during the last year. Uh, had to have utilities relocated, a water line that has to be encased in steel now. And then we'll pick up Flannery Road here, which will be uh, the next phase, the interurban parkway. Uh, if you look over at Progress Rail, this line of trees right here, uh, this is where Sedco will bring Progress Drive across to T in to there. Um, so that will be the first section that the city will handle up to Progress Drive. The second section will actually be down by TI, which we'll get a, a double look at today. Um, so the road will continue on its normal path here until it ends there and then it'll head over this way uh, as it crosses, uh, what is that, oh, no, Choctaw Creek. So this is Choctaw Creek. This is the big $20 million bridge that needs to be built. Really, all of this area right here is in the floodplain, so it's got to be a really long bridge. And then once we get past the floodplain, it'll cut back over to this line of trees. You can see where that road will fit in right there as it goes toward Shepherd. There's a little look at TI. We'll get a better look at it later on in the presentation. Um, but yeah, that'll be a, of course, major project for the city to so build those roads out to support TI as the first phase of the southern portion. <coughs> Highway 75, uh, this is, I think, in all the videos that we've done of Highway 75, which there have been uh, probably a dozen at this point, I think this is the biggest jump that we have seen uh, from one video to another. A lot of changes from it, from what it was four months ago when we did this. Uh, as you can see, they're getting ready to take down the bridge over Post Oak Creek there and rebuild that into three lanes. Uh, the Park Street exit, which just closed at the uh, uh, end of last month, is already completely destroyed um, as they work on this final section that will bring together um, what they've done on the uh, north side with, with what they've done on the south side. Uh, really kind of crazy traffic arrangement here. Another neat thing about these drones is that we get these updates on the highway, specifically in 1417, uh, to our folks at the fire department. And because the traffic switches um, from one lane to another so often, it really helps our emergency responders keep up with exactly um, how the flow of traffic is going. So if there is a accident on uh, one of these roads, as there often has been, uh, that they know the best way to reroute traffic and also that they know the best way to get there given the conditions of the roads that they have to work with. But here we're coming up on uh, the intersection with Highway 56. Uh, they are getting closer and closer by the day. We were hopeful that they'd have that done by 
4th of July this year. That's clearly not going to happen, uh, but hopefully only a couple more months there. And we do plan to do uh, something kind of cool when that reopens. We'll probably do a kind of uh, grand reopening for downtown Sherman, kind of a ribbon cutting uh, when 56 opens. Uh, as you know, and as we'll talk about more in future meetings, uh, the highway construction has been really hard on downtown. A lot of our businesses down there are really suffering. Uh, so we want to make a big deal out of that when that highway finally reopens, kind of get back to some degree of normalcy. Here uh, we're looking at Travis Street where they have rebuilt half of the bridge. Uh, that was, of course, a nightmare while that was closed. They are going to have to reclose the street again to rebuild the other half of the bridge. Uh, so Washington will return to its uh, awful state that it was while that was going on. And then you can actually get all the way to the end of the project, and then you see where that will pick up. Uh, once we're done here and finish that gap that goes between here and 82 as the next phase of construction on the highway. Jump over to 1417 now, uh, another road where a lot of changes have happened in the last couple months. Um, a lot more pavement down, uh, really kind of, uh, you're able to see now far better than you could at any point before uh, what this road is really going to look like when it's all done. I uh, don't really have too much to say about this one. The new bridge over the Sand Creek there. Um, there's our uh, second look at Washington Meadows to the right. Uh, as you see that Washington Street exit, uh, or sorry, not at Washington Street, Washington Street intersection um, kind of finally taking its final form there. Backyard left over there. What's that? Uh, the backyard's there, right next to 1417. Or, oh, uh, yeah. Sure. <coughs> Uh, so this really gives you a good look at what that cross-section will be once they're completed. That, as we've talked about many times before, will be the eventual uh, uh, connection there uh, that will connect Taylor Street all the way over to Little Lane. And then you see, as we kind of shift into overdrive here, the section of this project that really is lagging behind is this uh, part that we can't fly to because we get, we get to being in the uh, North Texas Regional airport, no fly zone, um, but as you can kind of get a glimpse of here, uh, a lot of dirt there, a lot of, um, a lot of pavement still be poured. Yeah. 75 and 82, uh, your guess is as good as mine is where you have to get <laughs> off the highway to access this these days, and, um, but this gives you an idea of some of the work that they've been doing, uh, some of the ramps, uh, particularly this one uh, close to coming in. Uh, Clint told, told me uh, yesterday, I did not know this, uh, this ramp that they've closed is not coming back. Uh, they are not rebuilding that. It's just not enough room to put another ramp there. Uh, so from now until the end of time, the only way to uh, make your right turn there is going to be to get off and go through the Lloyd Lake light, um, which is a That's right. Yeah. 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 That's strange. I want to give you a quick view of the southern portion of this because it has kind of uh, finally reached its final form as well. You see we finally have our Lambert exit in place um, and that's a ramp reversal done where you get off or you get back on. Water treatment plant. So we wanted to fly in from this direction um, to give you a look at the land here uh, where the city is considering uh, possibly putting that uh, storage facility. Uh, that would give us a couple of days, a week's worth of water there uh, outside the plant. Uh, this is the section of the plant that will eventually be uh, housed the uh, part two of the plant. They'll add another basin alongside this one and construct a building here, building here, another clear well right there. And then somewhere right in this area will be our pump station for our concentrate line. Concentrate line, of course, is all the things that we don't use, all the things that we take out of the water after it comes out of Lake Texoma. Uh, that line will run underground until it gets underneath 1417 right here. This is North 1417. It kind of zigzag over here, and then after it hits this tree line right here, it'll be open flow. So it'll just, we will create a creek basically there that will connect that point over to um, below this little lake right here. And then from there, it'll flow all the way back that's obviously a very important project if we hope to uh, continue getting more and more out of that water treatment plant. Have to have something to do with all the things we don't use. Can we have the permit for that now from TCEQ to be able to do that? So we've got <coughs> maximum on the gas on that. 
Our southeast sewer line, so this will be our main industrial sewer line. Uh, we'll kind of look at the route of that, so it, it zigzags underneath the highway here uh, before it picks up this kind of tree line that runs back behind Bel Air. Uh, this will be the uh, major connection, I believe, for TI and uh, the other industries in that area. And it will feed directly into our new uh, industrial sewage treatment plant, which you'll get a look at that around here in a second. Uh, it does have to go underneath the railroad tracks, so it'll come right along this tree line right here, go underneath the railroad tracks, and then, uh, I apologize, my flying on this one was not as accurate as I, uh, I was I would have hoped. Um, I kind of thought it went off this way. It actually goes more like this, over this way. Um, so you just have to look at the beautiful Grayson County for a few seconds before we get back on track. Now as we pick up these two little lakes right here, uh, this is kind of where the line will come. You'll miss these two lakes and then swing up toward the north. Uh, you start to see the water treatment plant come into view there, as well as our little treatment building right there. Uh, this land right here, uh, to the west of the pond there, to the south of the rest of the plant, is the land that we've got earmarked for the industrial treatment facility. Uh, as you saw at the CIP uh, presentation, the city owns pretty much everything around here, a lot of which is in the floodplain. Um, so we have tons of room to do what we need to do just a matter of finding the money. And of course, they've been uh, working to kind of revamp some of the uh, facilities there at the water treatment plant over the last couple months. Let's see that work. Yeah, on this one. A lot going on. Money for this is what the meeting at 4 o'clock today is about. some of our parks. Uh, I want to pause it right here so you guys can get a really good luck to basketball court. Uh, this was a, not only a council priority, this was a council idea uh, to kind of separate the uh, hooligans playing basketball over here from the small children. <laughs> so that court, as you can see, is really cool. They built a fence around it. Um, really an upgraded version of what we have anywhere else in the city as far as a basketball court. That will kind of become our crown jewel. Uh, and then this portion has a lot of that uh, old 1960s. Pause that, Nate. If you would. Yeah, that's the uh, th that entire area is, as Nate was about to say, I think, uh, is what we're planning on redoing uh, with uh, new playground equipment, all weather surface, inclusive surface. Uh, we, we don't have it designed yet uh, because we obviously don't want it to be designed until we get the approval to. Uh, move forward, but part of our bond package uh, is to is to uh, replace that aging playground equipment uh, with uh, with new, and it would be in that area that you're looking at there. Uh, the pavilions, the, the pavilions are down. Can you, can you back up like three seconds, maybe, or at least. I don't even know if you can see. Okay, you can kind of see on the very left part of the screen there. <coughs> Those are the ones that we'd be replacing. Right, that, the one right there. Yeah. And then there's one to the left that's further. Further uh, back. No, to the, east. to the left, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So obviously, it's, uh, one of the main focuses today will be parks, which is why we wanted to uh, give you an aerial view uh, to remind you of what we, what we look like today. A cold day that day, so the splash was not overly uh, busy. And then, as you can see, the pickleball courts get a really good look at those. Uh, really close. Perfection. <laughs> Perfection. And then uh, you'll, you'll stick with me through our 270 degree turn here. We'll get one look at the uh, clearing that's been done across the street. This, of course, was kind of the largest parcel of undeveloped land uh, in the proper. Uh, that has now been cleared in anticipation of a large multifamily development at that location. 
MLK Park is not something uh, that is in the cards uh, for this budget year, but probably for next budget year, uh, looking at maybe adding something like a splash pad there uh, to serve that part of the city. Uh, but we did want to give you a look at our new bathroom facility that was installed right there, and the repaved parking lot that right next to the playground. Uh, that's something that's long been needed there, obviously. Uh, so I want to give you a quick look at that. Then Old Settlers, uh, a lot of the work that's going to be done at Old Settlers is not going to be uh, overly visible. Uh, the, a lot of the lights that you'll see, not particularly on the quad here, but on the backfields, uh, are very old, very old uh, electric systems that just are not up to uh, modern safety standards. So I think we're planning to spend a couple million dollars um, upgrading the lights at these fields and making sure that they are as safe as they can be for the children's. Anything else on that one, Teresa? Yeah, yeah uh, future uh, possibility for spray ground as well, but not in the 23-24 budget. On park, right next to the airport, my favorite place to fly. Uh, this is why we stay nice and low on this one. Uh, this is another one. This rock feature is uh, pretty old and worn out. Another one where we're looking at upgrading or expanding the current splash pad that you saw there as well as putting in some new multi or all surface, uh, what do you call it, all surface environment. <clears throat> and then there, the uh, playground that was added with the help of the Rotary Club, and the soccer fields, which as you can see, are very well used. On Grove West, another place where, uh, if you'll remember back when we did the uh, initial designs of the athletic complex, uh, something that was contemplated in part two of that project was to add a splash pad for this part of the city. I think that is one of the things that we will be looking at to do with bond money for this next year. Uh, I don't know if that is still, Teresa, the plans to kind of put it over here, uh, kind of close to the road, uh, but that is something to look at, of course, the next year, part of that bond money that we'd like to spend on parks. And a wonderful lighted fields. Lots of good use. Another area of the city where lots of houses have been added over the course of the last year. Uh, kind of a higher end home product there that's going in for the backside. Global Wafers. So uh, there's our new police station. You should really check that out if you haven't seen it yet. A beautiful building. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then this is the uh, best look at the global wafers that we've gotten yet. And really, up to this point, we've only really seen dirt moved out here. As you can see, they're getting started on the construction of the first building itself, uh, with the piers going in. Not nearly as much activity as there is over at TI, but certainly moving in that direction because they have added some cranes uh, to start going vertical there. You'll see those pads with cranes there. And then on the south side of this project, uh, you'll see the detention pond that was put in, a large detention pond there, to serve that property as well. And then our final video, which is my favorite before and after of uh, the evening, will be a TI project. Uh, if you'll remember uh, 53 weeks ago what TI looked like, well, I, I, I brought this to remind you. This is, uh, this is the TI project on June 7th, 2022. They have moved a lot of dirt, but not much else. We'll get a fresh look uh, from the beginning of this week at the current state of the project. Uh, if you wonder how much can be built in a year, well, this is how much you can build in a year if you've got enough money. Talking, I know we'll get a, a more detailed update on TI, but the mayor and I were talking to uh, their safety manager out there this morning. He said on site they average between 950 and 1,000 contractors every single day. Uh, and you'll see a lot of those cars parked here in a second. Uh, so the vertical portion of this building is really coming along. As you can see, they've even got the roof going on here, which is just mind blowing to me. Uh, these cranes are 400 foot cranes, they run on these tracks. Um, back and forth. The other thing the safety manager was telling us is that is that gives them the most heartburn out there is worrying about if 
two of these cranes are swinging at the same time, but they're not swinging in the same direction. Uh, so just absolutely astounding what's been accomplished out there uh, in 53 short weeks. And then wanted to give us one last look at Shepherd Drive, since this is going to be one of our major financial outlays for the next year. Uh, this is the portion uh, between TI and the highway that will be built at four lanes uh, of an eventual six lanes to serve TI, and that will connect with Interurban Parkway, where we saw that uh, kind of dump in on the west side of the TI property. And then uh, we missed it. Back a little bit. Uh, it's the water tower, the new water tower. Uh, probably be going in pretty close to the old water tower in this general area. Okay. And the uh, designs on that, Clint was showing me the other day, really cool, would be a lighted water tower that you'll be able to see from the highway. Uh, so it'll kind of be a Sherman's really statement water tower that will um, that you'll see really as you come into Grayson County. So that'll do it uh, for our drone update, uh, the inaugural flight of Sherman 3. Unless you want to go back and look at anything that we covered. I didn't see anything from the, the new hotel. <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah. Yeah, the before and after? Oh, yeah. The same <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for progress. Same as 2020. <laughs> All right. Um, so, does anybody need, I, I want to keep keep moving on this. Anybody need a break? I'm going to give you some Can we just take a break? Okay. Um, I'm going to have uh, Jason come up from Will Dam, and uh, we'll start with the, on the continue on the utility side of things with the rate study, and then um, yes, and then we've got our, our folks here from Pete Nichols that will follow up with our utility master plan. So, uh, Robin, do you know what slide I need to be on? Or uh, let's see. So it should be um, uh, keep going north. Keep going up. Oh, no. oh, you know what? It's south. It's, it's, it's after. It's, uh, it's past Nate. It's, it's after Nate. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. We're moving these things around. Right Keep going. It's after those, that section. There we go. 51. And don't go to the brick side. Whew. All right, ready to roll. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jason Gray with uh, Land Financial. And obviously, we've been working uh, with the city staff, Robbie and Mary and Clint and Wayne, and um, everybody here trying to make sure that your water and sewer rate structures are sufficient to meet your upcoming needs. We've got a, a couple of uh, significant changes that we want to talk with you briefly about. I know that Robbie has already kind of briefed you on some of these coming forward, but we've got some specific numbers to work through as well. Um, a couple of couple of just um, bullet points and changes since uh, last time that we talked with you. Um, we're constantly updating volumes as new information comes in from your major users, and so we're we're just in, in continual communication with your staff on that. Because as you can probably imagine, when you're making changes of this magnitude, a five or ten percent change in volumes, or even the timing when those volumes come on, can can have a, an impact. Um, overall that we're looking at. So we're in constant communication and have the latest information built into our models uh, that look at both the water and the sewer side. Um, same thing on the on the debt side, the CIPs, um, those are, as you know, uh, evolving uh, as we work through this. Currently at 676 million and change uh, for the CIP over the next several years. That's due to higher water costs and additional wastewater treatment plant expansion costs that I know that, again, you've been briefed on and we're not going to get into detail this morning. Uh, but that, that number has increased a bit. Uh, the key issue is that we're looking at constantly is will the additional revenue um, from the additional use and the growth that you have within the systems uh, continue to support not only the debt but the operations as needed. So the forecast cost of service, again, a chart that you've seen in the past, you can see from 2023 going from around 30 million or so total, um, and you can see in, in green, that's the debt service that is being, uh, that's, that's used uh, to fund that 600 plus million dollars in CIP increases uh, pretty dramatically, obviously, over the next several years as you continue to build out um, these major, major projects. 
of the things we want to talk about and actually spend a bit of time on this morning is this concept of what we call in the water business an inverted block rate. And that's just kind of fancy language for the more you use, the more you pay. Um, it is uh, very common. In fact, I would say uh, the typical uh, rate structure that is now being used in areas where conservation is becoming more and more important for water. Um, what we're looking at right now is currently you have a, a, a flat rate, a, a single base tier rate. doesn't matter if you use a half a million gallons a month or a gallon a month. Um, you're paying 347 a gallon. And what we've looked at with staff is beginning to look at implementing this inverted uh, tier block rate where we go from 1,500 gallons up to 20,000 gallons, which is a, a pretty significant residential user um, that is essentially the that the, the top end of your typical residential use case is about 20,000 gallons, about three, three to four times your average residential use um, across the city as a whole, would continue to pay basically that 347 uh, for both year one and year two. So there would be zero increase on the vast majority of your residential customers and bills uh, over the next two years. And the way that we're able to do that is by beginning to implement these, these uh, differentiators in between these tiers. So again, up to 20,000 gallons, you're still paying the base tier rate. Between 20 and 100,000 gallons on your residential and your commercial, it would go up by a quarter, 25 cents per 1,000 gallons in the first year, 50 cents in the second year, a dollar in the third year, and a dollar 25 in the fourth year. And the idea here is to begin to phase in uh, this, this pricing signal uh, for users that as they continue to use more water, gradually over time, they'll start to see it's going to make an impact and a larger impact on their bill again over time. I just can't emphasize enough that when you're looking at this inverted block um, rate, um, 20,000 gallons on a residential customer, again, is the vast majority of your residential users. Um, once you get up over 20,000, there will be a few, 20 to 50,000 20 to 50,000 gallons of residential users. There might be a very small handful, north of 50,000 gallons, uh, but uh, after that, it's, it's really uh, extremely rare. But once you get up to 100 to a half a million gallons, um, again, we start to see another 25 cent jump in the first year, another 50 cent jump the second year, and then a half a million gallon and gallons and above. And there we're talking really about commercial users. I can't imagine you have any residential users using a half a million gallons in a month. Um, so, that is the idea, the concept between, behind this inverted block rate. And the same idea on the sewer side, right? So um, the same pattern of phasing this in over a number of years, uh, beginning at uh, 1,500 to 100,000 gallons a month on the sewer side. And so again, that's going to take care of all of your residential customers, or essentially all of your residential customers. And again, I'll point out you have 395,000 gallons per day. Both year one and year two, we're able to keep that rate at 395 per thousand gallons um, on the sewer side as well. So again, for the vast majority, if not all, of your residential customers um, would see no volume increase in the water um, or the sewer side in those first two years. Your commercial customers and then your large commercial customers as well uh, would begin to see that tiered block rate come into effect um, in, over the next couple of years. Jason, I want to yes. point out too that for residential customers on the sewer side, uh, they're capped after 9,000 gallons a month. So uh, they can use you know, 50,000 gallons a month, which by the way is just, that's what small restaurants use. So there's probably, I don't know how many houses would use that. But they're on the sewer side, they're capped unless they have a uh, separate meter uh, for some reason, uh, which they don't generally, so, um, but on the sewer side, they're capped at 9,000 gallons a month for residents. Yeah, single family. Yeah. So, there's a lot of numbers, obviously, and we're not going to go through all of these. This information is in your packet about um, what these charges would be for your typical um, residential and the residential commercial category for 5 eighths to 5 3 quarters inch meter, which is your common residential meter size. Current uh, is uh, 2418 on the base rate. That would stay 2418 for 23 and 24, and then begin to move up a little bit uh, to 2491 uh, for your rate change in October of 25. And then again here on the volume rate for the vast majority of users, zero increase um, 
347, 347, 347, um, in 23 and 24. And then the large customers, you can see how it breaks down, and you've got some agreements in place, obviously, for these customers. Uh, but you can see that those that are using above the half a million gallon mark will begin to see that tick up over time. Um, and it's, uh, you know, again, what the, the idea here is um, the more you use, the higher the impact, overall impact on the system and the more risk that there is, uh, the, the more that those customers end up paying. So, same idea on, this, on the uh, wastewater side, um, all meters, 929 as your base, 395 as your volume per thousand, and as Roger pointed out, a 9,000 gallon cap on uh, the residential side. No increase in the 23 or 24 rate plan. Um, starts to increase by 25, and you can see there as it goes out. For those that are higher users, they see a higher increase. So as we feather in uh, this inverted block rate as we move forward. So what does that mean to the, to the customers? You can see we've got a couple of different use scenarios here. Uh, 1,500 gallon um, water and wastewater user, which is kind of what we consider to be your sort of your, your baseline um, residential rate. This is your you know single person or um, you know, two people within a, a, a residence that doesn't use a lot of outdoor watering. Uh, this is just inside use. Today, for, for that use case, 1,500 gallons water and sewer, they're paying 33.47. That rate will remain constant for the next two years and then begin to go up by uh, about a dollar uh, for the October 25 rate, a 3% increase, 5.2% increase, and then a 6.4% increase, and then the levels off for the remainder of the five, you know, the, the next five years that we've got in our plan here as well. I'm a 6,000 gallon user, which is pretty close to your typical, your, your common, 6,686. By the end of five years, it would go up uh, to 7,621. But again, those first two years, zero increase. Commercial monthly, I'm sorry, 30,000, which is a high use residential, 9,000 gallon wastewater you see here. Today, they pay 16201. They would start to see a small increase in the first year because they start to hit that second tier after 20,000 gallons. So they'd be charged an extra 25 cents per 1,000 gallons for, the, for, those, for that, those gallons between 20 and 30,000. So they're going to see a $2.50 increase based on that high use. Commercial monthly um, inside charges for a two, typical fish meter. Again, you can see here, I won't walk through all of them, 0% um, increase for the, for the typical um, you know, kind of residential, I'm sorry, commercial user. Um, at 20,000 gallons of both water and wastewater, no increase for the first two years, and then three to six percent increases after that. And for once you get up into the 200,000 gallon use, again, uh, because of those those inverted block rate charges, they start to see some increases in the first couple of years, and then on um, as you, you can see as we go out further. One of the things we did want to make sure that we point out, I know that you've seen this chart in the past, uh, but right now your current rates for a 5,000 gallon water and wastewater user, we use that number simply because it's easy to assess across the state. Uh, right now your customers pay a little under $60. Uh, by 2027, if this plan were adopted and fully implemented as stated here, uh, which again, we're going to encourage you to constantly remain looking at this, you'd be at $67.85 by 2027. Right now, the state average is at 76.47 today. That's not the state average in seven or in five years. That's the state average today. And you can see here how the variety of different cities, generally speaking, within the area, roll out. You're still today. You're on the very low end um, of the comparison cities that we look at. Even if you implemented all of these all of these changes for a 5,000 gallon use, which again is a pretty typical um, residential use case, you're still below the state average below most of those that are on the chart for their rates today. I can tell you many of these cities are our clients. Um, some, of them aren't, some of them aren't, but they're all looking at water rate increases as well. So um, just something to kind of keep in mind as, as, the, as the overall perspective, particularly on the residential use, and I'll also say on your large and industrial users, uh, you've got very competitive rates, and uh, you, you will continue to have very competitive rates. Um, again, a lot of numbers here. I won't get into a lot of detail here, but I just will take a moment to point out your net revenues line, which is, is just what it sounds like, revenues minus expenses. There are a couple of years here that as some of that debt service begins to come on, I know that you've been briefed on this in the past, no surprises, uh, but there are a couple of years where those net revenues go negative. 
That's one of the reasons why we're um, always advocates of a multi-year rate plan. So you can look at it and prepare for that. You're building some additional revenues in these early years. You're using them in the out years. And that's just part of the plan to keep it relatively smooth so that there, you don't have any bill shock for any of your customers and react to something that's a negative net revenue. You come back and have to change, you know, increase rates by 10, 15 percent. The plan um, you know, will be able to easily cover um, all of those net revenues over time. Um, and, and again, you can see how it, how it shakes out. Obviously, you know this, you've been told this, I know many, many times and thought about it, I'm sure. Um, these revenues will change significantly as the years go up and down. Um, one of the reasons to constantly be taking a look at it, particularly given the dynamic nature of the community today. Uh, finally, just a couple of caveats. Um, additional revenues from, from the inverted block rates, uh, the, the different uh, use uh, rate sources, um, they are sufficient to cover what we see as all of the additional debt, all of the additional operational costs over time. Um, but it does rely on a number of assumptions. Again, I know this isn't the first time you've heard this, but it's always just important to keep in mind um, the timing of the commercial water purchases. You know this. There is a, a lot of timing um, you know, aspects that go into this, which is why we're in communication with your staff on really every couple of weeks. We're, we're updating and looking at and, and figuring out, okay, we've got a little bit of new information. What does this do? And we'll run the numbers and we'll look at it. Um, the interest rates in terms of debt, we think that they're reasonable assumptions that we've got in place here, but three years from now, I couldn't tell you what interest rates are going to be. Um, if they are significantly different, you're going to have to look at that, obviously. The internal growth and the expense increases, we think we've got a very good idea what that's going to look like, but again, it's always something to keep in mind. And then there are a couple of years where um, we are looking at some additional support from SEDCO, from the general fund, from impact fees that are built into the plan, which again, I know that's not news to you, uh, but just a reminder that that continues to be a, a, an underpinning aspect of how this works over time. And if any of these change significantly, as they have already and will continue to, um, you know, it's just it, they, they, the, the impact can be material. So uh, with that, do you have to take any questions that you've got? Or, or? Yeah, I do want to also point out, so uh, this is the draft version. Uh, I don't expect it to change significantly, but our hope would be as we, uh, throughout the summer, as we bring back uh, draft budgets and tax rate approvals and things, we would also bring back this rate plan for you guys to adopt, uh, and then we'll, as, as Jason said, uh, you know, probably adopt this no less frequently than annually. So we'll look at it again and adopt another one in a year's time. Uh, we, I can't imagine a scenario where we need to do a rate adjustment mid-year, but if we did, it would be because there's something drastic that has changed with these assumptions. But uh, from an expectation standpoint, probably sometime in August, I would guess, we would come back with a resolution for you guys to support uh, this five-year rate plan, uh, and we'll do that every year. Uh, I would like to see um, some numbers that are very lowest users, closer to that 1,500, maybe broke out by percentage, like say our lowest 10% of users, and break that lowest down to two separate um, and see what the numbers are to keep those rates flat for the absolute bottom lowest percentage like the 1500 to say 3000 gallon because I think those are going to be our most economically depressed users like and for how long for the full five years and see how if we can keep that at the very bottom um, to keep that low, because I don't think we're going to earn a lot of revenue off increasing them by 6% anyway, but that might make a significant impact to those very smallest users, and I'd like to see that broken down if I could. So it might be that uh, that uh, 1,500 gallons is, you know, zeros. And you said 3,000? 15 so to 3,000. I don't know if the water department could give us some numbers. Like, what is the... Yeah. So maybe there's another, there would be, in that case, there would be another band. Yeah. yeah another Zero oh, to yeah. 3,000. Right. <coughs> yeah. That's already included Zero. in the base. So the base charge is up to 1,500 gallons. So is that what you're talking about? Is keeping the base charge the same? Well, I think there's a difference between a 1,500 gallon user and a 20,000 gallon user. To my mind, for residential, that's mm -hmm. a pretty broad swath. And if we could carve off the very bottom of that, say, 1500 to three, which you're talking about probably 
a senior living alone. Um, that's probably, I'm guessing, a pretty small number of our user base. Yeah. And we're not going to get a lot of revenue from bringing them up 6%, but it could make a significant difference to them for that $6 or whatever. Right. So I would just like to see that number broken out just a little bit more. I know that probably the juice isn't worth the squeeze necessarily for us in dollars and cents, but it probably will be for the user. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. That 1,520,000 gallons on the residential side probably covers 95% of your residential and that is most of your residential customers most months, right? Um, and so if you're looking at, you know, what would that be between that 1,500 gallons to 3,000, as Mary points out, the first 1,500 gallons is included in the base rate, right? Yeah. Um, at, so between that 15 and, and roughly 3,000 or so, we can look and see if there's, yeah. a, or, see if there's a number that, that makes, you know. Yeah, or we could just, so. I guess, transversely, just, inc just increase the base from 1500, zero to 1500 to zero to three, would do the same thing, right? There'd be a bigger impact from that. From that, okay. Yes. How, so Mary, that that affects everybody. Did we look at how many customers were? We did, and it was it was a lot. It was just looked at one month, and there was about 3,000. 3,000 customers that used 3,000 or less. less. But that also included, you know, if someone moves out on the fifth of the month. Sure, and, sure. So oh, you can't okay. really tell. How many of those were beginning or ending accounts? Yeah. So it would have to be a bigger sample. Okay. 3,000 is, I mean, we have about 15,000 accounts now. That's commercial, industrial, everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there's, that could end up being 15, 15 to 20% of our total right. uh, yeah. number of customers, residential customers. So, But your idea is, hey, let's just see what that looks like. Maybe that. Maybe that 3,000 is 2,500. I mean, we can make the band whatever we want to. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever the breakover makes the most sense from what our users are using. Yeah. But there is a, you know, uh, a people who have, are on fixed incomes that are living right. alone and their water usage is very low. I don't want to just automatically lump them in with the up to 20,000 gallons because in my mind that's a different customer. And I don't think the 6% that we're going to get from them really makes a big difference to us, but it will to them, and I would just like to look at that just a little bit more. We, we can absolutely time. flesh that out and see how big of a difference it, yes. that makes um, so that we can look at it and say, okay, well, what would the impact be yes, sir. Yeah. To, to the other, the other yes, classes and those kinds of things? And you're talking about really from year three to five. Right. I'm, yeah. Right. Yeah. Per, right. Per, right. Per two, right. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Three yeah. to five, and right. and if we push it out three to five, if it's a small group of users and it's a small rate, does that really make a big difference to us? And could we afford to look at doing something else? Right. That's okay. Right. Yeah. We we have to figure that out. Okay. Um, there's there's lots of other million ways to, to to slice and dice this, but uh, we look at what we call a tier analysis and see. How much of your revenues and how much of use is coming from every thousand gallons, basically, in any customer class? So, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll work with y'all and figure that out. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Good job. Right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thank you. Uh, Fred is going to introduce our next uh, round of speakers. Everybody good? We need a. We're going to keep rolling yeah. unless somebody raises their hand and Let's says go. they need a, need a break. Let's so. go. All right, so a couple of years ago, we hired uh, Prince and Nichols and uh, Cullen uh, Carlson to help with our water and wastewater master plan. Little did we know that what we originally talked to them about scope-wise, uh, which was probably two and a half years ago, has drastically changed with all of the industrial growth and everything we're doing. Um, but this is vastly important in the timing of everything that we do. Used to, when, when me and Tom started, a development would come in and we'd say we got plenty of capacity in sewer and we got plenty of water, no big deal. And now every development that comes in, we go, uh, we need to check with Colin and make sure the model uh, works out well. So um, he's going to talk about all the, the steps and all the work that they did to get our model um, updated, uh, which is probably already got a call today for someone who wants to get an update on, on the development. Um, and then also about um, how we're, we're creating that long-term CIP plan. Uh, so, go for it. Clint, um, good afternoon, or 
Good morning, everyone. So, as Clint mentioned, I'm going to kind of walk through our process here and how we developed the Water and Wastewater Master Plan, how we came to those recommendations. Um, kind of take a look through a, a quick overview, kind of start with the, where we ended up and why we were doing this, talk about kind of those demographic projections because that is super important to everything that we're doing on the planning side, walk through the water and wastewater planning processes, and ask any questions. So quick overview, why are we doing this? Um, I saw earlier when I walked in, we were going through a, a bunch of drone videos and getting to see everything. Your staff is great. Uh, working with Wayne, Tom, Clint, uh, Jim, Nathan, all of those guys, they have a great understanding of the system. But what we came in to do was kind of be that drone and go up to that 10,000 foot feet of where are we at now and where are we going in the future. And so the, the big first key deliverable that we're working on is we want to provide a roadmap for the future. So there's lots of development interests, there's these new large industrial users. What kind of infrastructure do we need to be planning for on the water and wastewater side to be able to handle this new growth? Uh, we also wanted to use the information that we developed to identify any existing uh, deficiencies that you have in the system. We developed some tools, a water and a wastewater model that I'll get into in a second, that um, we get to stress, we get to run through a lot of different operational scenarios to kind of figure out, all right, what do we need to address now? And what do we need to address in five years, ten years, and then through kind of the build-out planning period. And then we provided a list of uh, CIP projects, kind of phase right now based off of what we know. Um, develop a nice cost estimate to kind of put into that budget for uh, understanding if, if this happens, if this development comes in, well then we need to build this project and this is how much we need to budget for that. So moving on. Um, Key deliverables. What are we? What have we delivered to you guys to be able to use? As I mentioned a CIP map. Uh, this is a map of the water system. I apologize, it's kind of small, but it, it shows all of the projects that need to be uh, kind of planned for as development comes in over the next 20, 25 years, along with a summary of the projects that you know, Warrenders. Hey, these are projects that you guys are already designing. They're already under construction. Red projects, these are projects that we need to be working on in the next five years, the next ten years. And then the blue projects are anything beyond that ten year planning period. So this is kind of that stair step of when new development comes in, when these large users come in, what do we need to be planning for? Another key deliverable are these hydraulic models. We spend a lot of time building these models. Uh, these models, as I mentioned, we can run them through a lot of different scenarios to say, well, what happens if this development comes in? And produces this much wastewater and needs this much water. What kind of stress is that going to put on the system? What is the impact on pressures, on fire flow availability? What kind of overflow issues might we have downstream? So now we have a very robust water and wastewater model that has multi uh, phases in there, 5, 10, 25 years. We can go in there and we can stress those and we can use these models for all different kind of things. Development reviews, excuse me, design support. So this is uh, some of the stuff that we've been using the, the model for specifically. Um, there's some big, uh, large diameter transmission lines. We can utilize the model to take a look through there. What are the contours? How do we uh, pick the right pipe class? Um, how do we size the pumps correctly? Uh, we're using the model actively to help us uh, do these design projects that kind of help you move forward. And then as I mentioned, development review. Clint alluded to this, there's a lot of development that is very interesting in coming to Sherman right now. We've included about 50 of those known developments right now into that model, but there's still new developers that are coming in daily. So this is a very dynamic process. We've developed our master plan based off of what we know. We've added some contingency in there, but then there's still new developers that come in that we need to say, okay, well, if you're going to come in and you're originally going to build 100 single family homes, but now you want to build 500 multifamily in your department. What is the impact going to be on the system? We can log into those models, we can run that operational analysis to determine what is going to be the impact on the system, what kind of new issues might be caused by that change in the state. So to kind of jump into the master planning process, I kind of pulled demographics out first. We sat down with planning staff um, to first define what is going to be our service area. Uh, 
so we define the service area as the city limits and then a little bit of infill into the ETJ as I think we know that there's some uh, interest out there to continue to grow. But we need to define what is going to be our service area so that we make sure that we're planning for all the growth within that area. How do we define the growth inside of that service area? Well, as I mentioned, planning staff tracks all of the developments that are proposed inside of the city at this time and the different statuses of those developments. So that's kind of helping us with our phasing of, you know, are they just at a you know planning level or are they going through design of, of these new developments out there? So that helps us kind of phase in. Is this a now project, a five-year project, a 10-year project? We were able to look at all of the proposed number of units, that's the number of people, that relates to a water demand, that relates to a wastewater flow. We can plug all this information directly into the model to see what that impact is. For anywhere where we didn't have any development information, uh, we utilize the uh, comprehensive plan. What is the future land use in those areas where we don't have any current development projected, but you know, do we need to plan for single family units? Do we need to plan for multifamily, commercial? industrial. That kind of helped us with the uh, infill in those other areas where we didn't have specific information on the developments. So taking all that information, looking out over the next 25 years, uh, projected population growing from about 44,000 today all the way up to about 90,000 in the next 25 years. That's doubling the population right now. And this is really just people, employees, this doesn't factor in those large industrial users. So I'll get into that and how we handle that on the um, water and the wastewater side in a moment. To get into the water master planning process, the, the water and the wastewater master planning process are very similar. Uh, kind of walk through the same step. This is a little diagram of how we move through the process here. So we start with project kickoff and data collection. The main thing is we didn't want to walk in day one and start with no information. We know that you guys have been planning long before Freeze and Nichols came out here and started helping with the plan. So we sat down with staff, we collected a lot of previous reports, we started going through all that, getting up to speed. And then we jumped in as a show, we did the demographic projections, we need to know what goes into the model, we need to know how it's going to grow. Then kind of through this middle process here, this was our focus of this master plan, is going through the capacity planning process. So we did pressure testing, I've got some slides on that, um, updating the GIS, the model, the calibration of the model, doing some field verification, and we performed system uh, analysis to see where do we have issues, develop that capital improvement plan. Down here on the bottom side, we kind of made some recommendations for that next step of we're planning for growth, we're planning for capacity, but in the future as you know, the city continues to grow, those pipes that are in the system, they continue to age. Y'all have already been doing a lot of work on the SSES side and a lot of condition assessments. So we were able to utilize some of that information and just kind of make some recommendations of how to make that more robust moving forward. And then the, the master plan uh, report that we've submitted the draft, working on finalizing now. So again, I'll go through these fairly quickly. This is the data collection phase. Sat down, collected a lot of information, a lot of historical water demand information which helped us to kind of take a look at how has the city used water over the past 10 years, past 20 years? And then what is that going to look like moving forward? So all this information with all the new developments, all the new people that are moving to Sherman, um, they all have a water demand associated with them. These new large industrial users, they all have a water demand um, they use. And so we see that number jump up moving forward based off of that new development those new large industrial users. So this water demand is what we need to serve through in, uh, capacity increases in the system. So another step of the process after sitting down, talking about the system, getting that you know, long-term understanding of how, they oper how the system is operated, the different pressure planes, the pump stations and everything like that, we installed about 12 pressure recorders throughout the system. These pressure recorders, they just go onto a fire hydrant and they track pressure over about a two week period of time. And what we do is we take that information, we have a model, it's a computer, um, but we want to make sure that this computer model uh, responds and acts like your system does in the field. 
So we install these pressure recorders. We take information from SCADA that the city currently has uh, on pump stations, elevated storage tanks. Um, all of the information of how that varies over time. We calibrate our model to this data. What we really want to do is build confidence that you can utilize this model as a planning tool to identify projects in the future and understand where you have deficiencies in the system. So we calibrate the model to this, as I mentioned. Over here, some of our calibration charts. The kind of black lines show here's how the pump station flows, tank levels, and pressures varied over time. And then we go through and we tweak our model, we update our pumps, we update our um, demand information, our diurnal patterns, and we calibrate to that. So you'll see the green, that is our model results from that same time period. So what we're really trying to do is get that dialed in to build that confidence. And right here, we've got a very well calibrated model that we can build trust in you guys that this can handle the, uh, the analysis that we perform on the system. So then we go through our existing system analysis. So here's a big map, lots of colors. We, we like our big maps, we like our colors. This shows on a typical max day, you know, a summer period, what are your pressures throughout the system whenever we're running all the pumps and we've got the high demands out in the system. It's really what we're looking for is we're looking for those low pressures, we're looking where we might have some issues in the system. And so we, we have a lot of great data here to understand, all right, you have you know, some areas that are on high points that you know may have some low pressure it's not busting any TCEQ requirements but there are some areas that you know as we recommend some capacity improvements those are some areas to focus on this kind of gives us a big kind of high level view of what's going on in the system over time and just kind of helps us check verify our model so this is a fire flow analysis. One of the things that we want to make sure that we have is enough capacity to meet any kind of fire flow demands. If we have to open up some fire hydrants, are we able to put out a fire in that area? So we run through that. The model can kick out fire flow demands. Again, in a lot of great shape. Some little pockets sometimes will show up as, as red, but those are maybe dead end lines, and those are opportunities for us to recommend looping in the future to kind of help with moving water around and making sure that you have enough fire flow. This is water age. This is another one where we want to take a look to say, okay, as we run the model, how is water aging over time? Water gets pumped into a storage tank, it sits there for a little while, the older the water gets, the maybe lesser the water quality. So this allows us to take a look at you know, different improvements that we can make on the water quality side, which can result in less flushing, uh, less water loss, all that different um, things that you want to use the water the way that the water is intended to use it, as opposed to having to flush and, and Water quality. So as we build the model, uh, start uh, analyzing the model, what are we doing from CIP drivers, uh, media increased capacity, where do we have low pressure, where do we have low fire flow availability, and then are there any lines that got too much water going through a pipe that's not big enough that's causing some of those pressure issues. And we want to increase the capacity of that to increase the pressure in the system fire flow and just make sure that we're meeting all the demands. And then extend service to any new areas in the system, any place where there's new development. Make sure that we right-size those pipes to those new developments as opposed to building an 8-inch now and then in 10 years having to go back and build a 12-inch. Let's right-size it now so we don't have to go tear up that road that we just put in. We also used it for uh, all of the work that's going on at the treatment plant. There's a lot of um, demand coming in the system. We want to make sure that we're sizing the treatment plans correctly. We have this nice little stair step chart that we worked with Jim and his staff and, and Wayne and Tom and all those guys to uh, understand you know, what different stair steps are we going to have to take along the way, what improvements are coming in at that treatment plant, and then how big does it need to be in the future. And here's our kind of final map. I, I led off with that, but then we have our CIP map. There's about 17 projects that we've recommended. Um, and we came up with a nice little summary for those. You look at those, don't get you know, too much sticker shock. We have quite a few contingencies in there, mainly because we're taking a 5% you know, look at these the alignments. We've kind of generalized them. We've said this is generally where they need to be. Um, those will be refined as you kind of get into that design process. But this is kind of that high level number. So if you kind of should be thinking about from a budget standpoint, uh, 
and when you're going into it, but that will be the point of this. Jumping into the wastewater process, um, again, kind of a similar approach um, as on the water side, so I won't stay there too long. One of the differences on the wastewater side, um, on the wastewater side, you can look in the manholes, you can see down. There was some missing information that we had kind of on inverts of pipes in different areas, so we went through and we researched as built data. Um, we had a surveyor go out to a lot of the manholes within the system, I think it was about 120 manholes, open it up, stick a, a ruler inside of it. Um, uh, not the most fun job, but they stuck a ruler in there to see how deep it was and that kind of helped us build the um, profile of the pipes in the system. The slope of the pipe on the wastewater side kind of determines the capacity of that, and so we wanted to make sure that we dialed that in so that we're uh, modeling the capacity of the system correctly. So, um, similar on the wastewater side, growth is about the same. We developed wastewater flow projections based off the historical information and projecting it out based off of the population and employment growth in the system. Um, this is kind of uh, this is a chart similar to the water side. This was looking at, well, as we continue to grow and the wastewater flow uh, continues to increase, this is your permitted capacity at the plant right now. Texas has a 75-90 rule, so whenever we hit 75% of that permitted capacity, we need to start planning for that expansion. Uh, whenever we hit 90% of that, we need to start the construction of that expansion so that when we hit that permitted capacity, the uh, expansion is online. So this is just a chart of we're looking at where we're at now, where the demands are going in the future. I'm not sure that ends up in a little bit. Um, on the wastewater side, on the water side we have the pressure recorders. On the wastewater side we have flow meters. They crawl down into that manhole. They put a band inside of the pipe. They put a sensor in there, and it's tracking depth and velocity, which helps us to understand how much flow is going through this line. We install those in the spring because we really want to capture a wet storm event. Ideally, in a wastewater system, you only have two are going through the wastewater system. Every wastewater system that you have, it's inevitable that you have some leaks some places. And so what we're trying to do is identify where are those leaks and what is the cause of those leaks. Is it a potentially a, a manhole lid got knocked off by somebody mowing the lawn? Or is it uh, some kind of defect in the pipe? So we install those meters. We have 12 meters um, for 60 days, two rain gauges, track that over time. Um, you get to see similar uh, to the pressure side or the water side. We got our depth, velocity, flow. When it rains, you can see that the flow increases. And so we're using all this information to calibrate our model and really understand the INI system. This helps us to kind of identify. Okay, you know, we can do this. We've done some SSES work. The older part of town tends to be a little bit leakier. And so when we're looking at this, how are we defining that? How are we um, making recommendations to continue to alleviate some of that I-9 in the system? And then what projects do we need to serve that? Um, similar on the water side, we built a wastewater model. It's got all the pipes in the system. Now there are some pipes where we didn't have some information, so we can prove that out. I uh, won't we'll get too technical on that, but we've got a nice uh, model where we can take a look at what's going on in the pipes um, throughout the system. Right? So we can build these nice little profiles whenever we take a look if a new developer comes in and says, hey, we want to add more flow. We go plug that development on and we say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, we're surcharging down there. So that project that we recommend in the CIP, um, we need to, to probably build that and we might need you to help us build, uh, build that line. So after we built the model, we calibrated the model, similar to the water side. This is a dry weather scenario where um, we're just matching up our diurnal patterns, our population, and our per capita flows, which is just how much flow is generated by each person. And then on the wastewater or on the wet weather side, when it rains, how are we matching up with uh, the response in the rain in the system? On the wastewater side, uh, we come up with our parameters of what pro what lines do we need to address. In the wastewater system, uh, you have some storage. These pipes are built, you know, oftentimes 10 feet underground. You have some storage in the system, and so it's built to kind of handle and attenuate some of that wet weather flow that's coming through. So we, we 
look at the system analysis and we say, okay, what lines are under capacity? We have some you know, red lines there. What lines are surcharging? Is it coming out of the pipe because there's some downstream restriction? Where do we have you know, excessive surcharging? And then where do we have model projected overflows? These are our triggers for when we are recommending those pipes. So is it the next five years, the next 10 years? It kind of helps to build into that phasing there. And this is kind of a, this is just a generalized, this isn't from the, the city of Sherman, but this is just kind of looking at where is our flow in that system and, and what's causing that. These are the drivers. Again, we don't want any overflows on the wastewater side. So anywhere where we're um, excessively surcharging, anywhere where we have overflows, let's address those. Those become project one, two, uh, and so on and so forth until in the future when we have those projects. And then extending service similar to what we did on the water side. This is that stair step chart on the wastewater side where we started factoring in. Okay, well, we need to make sure that we have the capacity uh, if it continues to grow with the projected growth in the master plan need to increase the capacity in 2027. Um, it's just a planning tool to kind of help when does this phasing need to happen. Swap that out. Uh, we made some, some last changes on this one um, because we were looking at some regional stuff. Generally, everything is the same, but we have a nice uh, CIP map that walks through. There's little numbers that say, given what we know now, Here's where the projects needed, when they need to be built. Came up with about 21 different projects. Uh, came up with the cost estimates somewhere on the water side. Summarize all that in the currently draft report. We're working on finalizing that. But that's a pretty dynamic, I, I know you have to kind of put a stake in the ground at some point, but just like our water modeling is dynamic, that list is dynamic both in prioritization of the projects and dollar amounts and everything else. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very much so. Alignment plays a big impact on this. Um, one of the other components, uh, I didn't have a screenshot of it, but for each of these projects, we have a little cut sheet that says, you know, here are the different line items, here's the link, here's a kind of a project description of what that is, and then it also has a project driver. So what is driving that? Is it an existing system issue, or is it something that is caused by growth in the system stream? So it is very dynamic. We, you know, kind of put our disclaimer on there is, those alignments are just based on what we know now. And then the, the numbers, you know, we have one, two, three, four. They could switch around and be four, three, two, one based off of this developer decides to move a little bit quicker than this other developer. So, so what we know now, but we, it is very dynamic. So that I know it's about $389 million worth of total projects. Is that have any overlap with what we're currently doing? It does? Okay. Because I know that yeah. those are two completely different numbers in total projects, but... Yeah, so... Yeah, there, there's an overlap. For okay. Sure. Fair enough. That's the easy answer. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Colin? Okay. Um, so, our plan was to um, have uh, our TI update, uh, which would be... Um, you know, 15 minutes or so, uh, and then take a little break, fill our plates, stretch our legs, and continue on. Uh, you guys, you guys, good for another 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Um, I think uh, it's the next slide. Yeah, it should be the next. and uh, Wayne met with uh, probably two dozen residents yeah. on Shepherd Drive. Um, that were own the property. That were own property along Shepherd Drive. Obviously, you guys had a significant impact on Shepherd Drive uh, and those residents. And so um, Austin kind of reached out uh, to the city and said, hey, we'd like to do a uh, kind of a, a citizen resident meeting. And so this is that was the second one that they did. Right. And so after seeing the presentation, I uh, convinced him to tell me to speak to you guys and give a similar presentation, just an update on what they're doing out there. It's, we, we saw Nate's uh, drone, we did a drone earlier, uh, and, and just seeing the difference in one year. Uh, but uh, he's on the front lines of this, and 
feel like they're doing a great job of responding to complaints and, and working with the city to help reduce the uh, negative impact on uh, traffic and all the stuff that goes with construction. So, and minimize any any complaints. Keep everybody happy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. So quick yeah, ride. And yeah, that's the we need to. Yep. Hi, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alejandro uh, Granados. Again, I work for Austin Commercial. I'm um, one of the project managers out there over the Civil Scope. Uh, now getting into the building. So, Civil Scope, you may ask, well, what is that? That's just all the piping that's going to go into the building. Uh, we eventually connect into the city main, and that's, I guess, talking about water, sewer. I guess we're talking about sewer just now. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. I see some familiar faces. Uh, so it lessens the nerves. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I guess like Clint mentioned, we sat down with the residents again. No, <clears throat> if you're living out there and, and you just see this big construction company come in, you feel like they're just not going to take uh, take into account your opinions or or I guess what what you've been living or where you've been living for the past twenty plus years. So we wanted we wanted to come across as we're not here just to make some money. We're here to I guess make sure that we're not inter interrupting people's uh, lifestyle, living around the area. So that's where we thought the best the best effort that we wanted to put our foot forward was sit down with everybody, uh, the city and residents, and understand. Hey, we're building a building, and we're focused hyper focused on schedule and budget, but what are we missing out on and not accounting for? So um, some questions got brought up about some, some minor trimming and and. Uh, I guess adding some flagmen at the road. So we've since addressed that, and now I guess we can jump into, I guess, what, what we talked about that day. All right, so I guess the, for starters, we have this list of items that we want to talk about is one site logistics. Um, when you look at our site, uh, I guess I'll, I'll run through exactly what, what you see and why it was planned in that location. Talk about uh, new access points to the site, given that Shepherd Drive is going to uh, be closing soon for renovations. Uh, something that I wanted to introduce on our new meeting was the fun facts. Uh, we, we, again, we get so hyper-focused on, on the um, activity and, and schedule and budget that we forget to realize, hey, this is a big project. we got all these cranes and, and workers and quantity of workers that we forget to uh, actually step back and identify how much work is really going on compared to, in my case, previous smaller projects that I've been on. Um, then we can talk about city infrastructure if we need to, and then chapter drive maintenance, and then I'll finish on with some Q&A. All right, so site logistics here, again, you, this is a big bird's eye view of the site, identifying where, where we're installing our cranes, where we're gonna have our fire lanes, and uh, where our entrance points are. So for reference, Identified about six different items. Water tower, that's the, probably the biggest reference point for everybody, right in the middle. Uh, then gates to the site. Um, I guess in reference to Shepherd Drive here at the bottom and then 75 from this road on the far right. So you'll notice that we got gate one, gate two, and gate three. So like I mentioned before, Shepherd Drive is going to be coming to a close soon, so we needed an alternative. Um, so that's where gate one comes into play. And there was some there was some thought process behind the numbering, especially because the other gates are closing. So gate one, I'll, I'll go a little bit more into detail on the next slide. And then these big circles that you see here are big power cranes that we're, that we're installing to lift all the heavy form work, um, loads of rebar, and all sorts of uh, uh, materials that we got on here. Uh, another thing is this big heavy red line is, is the uh, fire lane that We've been talking to Billy and his team about uh, making sure that they got adequate access to the site if ever we need them uh, to help us out. Um, and that was going to the next slide. So I'll have to on the previous slide. So uh, the site is laid out. Is it phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four? Oh, yes. Yes. So um, <coughs> there's a future slide that gives you a visual of what the buildings are going to look like. But yes. Uh, Currently, TI is planning for a, a potential of four fabs here, and right now we're contracted to two, uh, which is like you were mentioning, fab one, phase one being in this general area, fab two, fab three, and fab four. So again, to put things into perspective is all the cranes and 
and fire lanes and everything you see drill, drawn on the, drawn on this is for one and two fabs. So now you got a picture of this reflected onto the other side. All right. Anything else? All right. So going to our new access point off of uh, off the 75 Furnace Road. So you'll see that this is a drone shot uh, that we took just to identify the path that we're that we're taking now that we're not using Shepherd Drive. And so this was a big accomplishment of our team. Um, we were always accessing through Shepherd Drive, and that's where <coughs> I guess some of those concerns and uh, I guess driving out with muddy tires, making sure that that's not happening. And uh, now we've shared with the residents all our heavy truckloads and all our um, all our manpower is going to be accessing the site, crossing the creek, uh, across the creek, and going into the site. So as you can see here, down at the bottom, uh, to prevent any mud going out onto the frontage road, what we did is we installed some shaker plates, which is big four by four by eight plates with uh, angles on them. So every time you drive on, especially in our case, you'll feel bumpy right. So what that helps to do is knock off all the mud before you get onto the road. And then we got a 2,000 foot stretch, uh, almost half a mile, going to, Shep uh, to the frontage road. So by the time that we reach the frontage road, all that mud has been taken off the tires, off the vehicles themselves, and we're no longer tracking mud out onto the public streets. <coughs> and then activities during rain events, um, given that we still have access off of Shepherd, uh, what we had was this massive car wash, is, is what we called it. A big um, water pump that we embedded in the ground, poured concrete, and fed water to it. So anytime that we were exiting onto Shepherd, <clears throat> what we did is pass the trucks through there. A lot of pressure shot water into the uh, tires under carriage of the, uh, the uh, cabs and made sure that we're not tracking again. So, all right, move on to the next one. Unfortunately, I didn't have the drone uh, access to share with you guys today, but what we do here is uh, on a daily basis, we, we track activities by flying a drone in a circular motion all, all around the site, and it goes back and forth like as if you were mowing your lawn and captures about 300 photos a day. So that's, that's something that helps us uh, track activity, track progress, and uh, this is a good snapshot of, of what you see from the north end of the site. And uh, let's go on to the fun facts. So here, um, if for anybody that's driven down south or coming up north, you'll see all the cranes going on here. One massive, the massive crane that you guys have seen is the one I want to talk about. That one is what we call the Liebherr 11350 crane. And so something really, something really important about this one is you can see here, this, this roofing, roof framing is, is split up into three sections. And each individual, I guess, box of trusses weighs almost 100 tons, and that's why we needed it to, to carry this steel into place and place it. And so the, the lifting capacity of this crane is, is 100 tons. It's bearing about 60,000 PSI onto the ground, and it's a height of 450 feet. It's got eight foot tracks, so almost a, the height of your typical ceiling. And uh, the, the driver there is about two floors off the ground. And so, some, I guess a fun fact here is, you can't really see them, but that's a person right there, <laughs> compared to this massive here. <laughs> and Wayne, what's, the, uh, what's our design standard for uh, thoroughfares on concrete? Oh, the uh, 4,000? Yeah, PSI. I mean, it's like 4,500, yeah, 4,000 PSI. Yeah, so 4,000 PSI versus 60,000. <laughs> Just to put things in yeah, the <clears throat> Yeah, that would play hell on one of our streets. <laughs> so, we, we, always, we always joke around with our superintendents. That, that we always tell them is, you guys are having fun on this side because you got a lot of toys to play with. You got things all over the place. All right, the next item is, is concrete. So today we poured about, uh, we had here about 68,000 cubic yards. The update now, we're almost um, coming up on 100,000. And in comparison, just to, just to give you a, a volume perspective is the cubic yard is three foot tall by three foot wide by three foot long. Picture that cube is one uh, cubic yard of concrete. Now imagine 100,000 cubic yards of concrete. From this perspective, uh, 68,000 
in correlation to filling an Olympic sized pool, we're talking about 20 pools, and now you're upwards of almost 30, 30 Olympic sized pools. Is how much how much work and effort is going into this? Because not only do we have to pour it, but we got guys that have to finish it. And so that's something that I, I take pride in just because it takes a group effort. And that's, that's the real definition of teamwork, in my opinion. And so another fun fact is today we poured or installed 12,000 tons of steel. So all the steel is different sizes, but if we accumulate it into the same, the same bar, which is excuse me, an inch thick, if you drop all that down, you're talking about 3,000 miles of rebar. So it's halfway across the world. So that's how much how much rebar we've installed inside this concrete. Another, another fun fact, earthwork. So since the very beginning, um, when we started in May of last year, we've moved over 2,000 cubic yards in a day. Two million. Oh, I'm sorry, two million. <laughs> That's where the nerves come in. <laughs> so, and since then, we're almost at 2.5. So again, comparing that, that uh, cubic yard in relation to two million cubic yards, it's, that's how much dirt has been hauled off the site, and almost a million of just handled on site. All right, and then going going into this team team effort, we're we're at a thousand people and growing on site. So this is where all that trades, parking, traffic is, is coming into play. Um, and, and on a daily, we have safety orientation where almost. You walk into the room and there's about 20 people ready for orientation, safety orientation. And uh, today we, on 6-1, we celebrated a, a milestone of 100, or a million man hours to date. And so typically, uh, I haven't been on those sites. The last, the last uh, million man hours that I ever heard of was low life field. And we've reached that within a year. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then the city infrastructure is the goal. Yeah, so on, on, on that city infrastructure, uh, plans are 95, 800 uh, percent. Should be getting 100 percent this week. Uh, for so Shepherd Drive. Shepherd Drive is, is real close to 100 percent. We're expecting to bid that out um, in July through August with a full shutdown um, in September ish. Um, there's just there's so many creek crossings that are needing to be. If you've driven down that road, there's it's it's up and down, and so to put a third fair in there, it's it, we need to straighten it out. So we, we we've got up to eleven foot cuts, ten foot fill. So lots of elevation changes. There's just it doesn't. It would be impossible to try to build that and keep the road open at the same time for 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 that project. So we've coordinated with the residents. We've coordinated with TI. Uh, we co coordinated with Coherent that that road is going to be shut down um, probably starting in, in September. And coordinated um, with Shepherd Place. And Shepherd Place um, to get to get that completely shut down in order to speed that project up. Uh, we've coordinated with the county um, and and have a, an agreement with them to help um, improve Farmington, which will be the only exit for those residents, um, so that uh, the area of Farmington that's currently rock will be um, will have an oil overlay on it, which will help with the dust and help the residents get in and out for over a year um, to have to get into town a different way. But um, they're okay with it. They're not happy about it. But um, lots of coordination to be done there. Um, and this area will look vastly different when it's done, just like the TI side. Now, just an update given the, to the resident, uh, residents out there about the Shepherd Place. You know, it's still ongoing. Um, we've gotten first set of plan reviews for their first phase on, on that area. Right here. And this road right here is an extension of inner urban parkway. So if you think about the, this plan development from from Center Street all the way down past Shepherd through this development and then this will continue on to Madame too. So it will be a, a uh, very good road um, that parallels 75 as this whole area of town develops. That's in future years. That's not in our 24 um, no. budget, other than uh, what we talked about what I talked about on the very north side, just south of 1417 to uh, 
progress. Uh, that's the only portion that's really in our work plan. Uh, these are future future years. Uh, future alignments, yeah. Uh, but that, that's where we start engineering. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, and I bet it's in on the streets, right? Yeah. Okay. So is the um, in the slides here it talks about uh, production expected in 2025. So with this massive project, this is the rainy time of year. Are you guys on schedule or? Yes. I mean, we, we what we typically do on our schedule is we have a, we have, have a five day work week, and then any any rain that comes into play. We make that up on a Saturday. If it expands that, uh, if rain continues for more than a day during the week, then we start talking about overtime. Then we get into, um, I guess, plans of how to, how to catch up. But as of right now, we're, we're within a day and going to make up that day tomorrow. Oh, right. I'm sorry, Saturday. So you're, whole, you're, you're a year into it, yes. and you're within a day of schedule. Right, right. That's, uh, that's, it's a big team effort. You guys interested in some tree jobs? <laughs> actually. <laughs> actually <yeah. laughs> they, they have had an excellent city staff to deal with. Well, yeah, of course, sure. yeah. Ace is uh, smart as a team. Um, so you guys will, pro will probably be out of there when? I mean, if they're opening in 25, then you'll be out of there in 24 sometime? Uh, no, I mean, hopefully the next phases continue, so hopefully we're here and just... Okay, sure. Yeah, we'll build for, but phase one is oh, phase maybe one. out in, in 24 oh, sometime? Yeah, yeah, that's... We'll be doing some landscaping on the outside, but that's trying to, trying to hyper, I guess, accelerate the schedule to where the yeah, is able to get in there and furnish their building. That's it. We'll be doing some miscellaneous items. Outside. So is that mid? I mean, I don't need a day, but is it summer? Is it fall? Is uh, it... <laughs> so I would say... Uh, we're probably there scheduled probably to the end of 24. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. In phase one. Phase one. Yes. And then hopeful. Hey, we hope there's a phase two as well. <laughs> there you okay. go. Any other questions? Thank you for coming and, yeah. and doing this. This is uh, very helpful. All right. And some, there were two other slides I think we were oh, talking about. Sorry. And, oh, this was a visual that I'm sorry to overrun. No, no, no. You're, 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 still, you're still on time. But yeah, here's the, the quick visual of the four phases that we've been talking about. Phase one being this bottom right corner, phase two, three, and four. And so that's where he was mentioning the construction and fab started in 22, and uh, we're expected to be up and running in 25. And this, this road right here, is that road that you talked about? At yeah. Your gate one road? Yeah, so this this, uh, this one's now a little bit further north. Okay. But yes, that's, that, that is that road. That and then Shepherd is about. down. Down here. Down here, yes, in the water tower. Yeah. Right, and then the other one's just a picture. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, remember, you guys remember from the drone shot early at the uh, that dark colored uh, rectangle there on the upper left? Uh, those cooling towers are already going in place right there. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's I mean, amazing how far they've gone. And they, just they, for scale, that's an 18 wheeler parked over there. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, right there. They have a very large transformer being delivered tomorrow. Yes. Morning. At uh, like a 160 foot long rig and 12 foot wide, 18 foot tall. Yes. Hmm. Is that coming by rail? Or? It's yeah. coming by rail. Yeah. But then it's coming down Dewey, 1417, 75 service road. What time is that going to be on 1417? <laughs> <laughs> You'll know if you're there. <laughs> well, 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 it's, it's coming down 11, 1417, 75 service road to show. But overall, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for accepting us into your town. Uh, I will say, um, from the feedback that I've heard from everybody, everyone loves the food here. So. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, um, so we're actually, we're on schedule as well, uh, believe it or not. So we had scheduled to go ahead and um, have TI start, but, I mean uh, have uh, City Hall update start.
but we're going to fill our plates first, and we're going to pivot a little bit, and we're going to let Nate go uh, first after we fill our plates and stretch our legs to do the community improvement. So, 15 minute break to uh, stretch your legs, return calls, fill your plates, and then we'll get started after that.
All right. Uh, well, this is a kind of an interesting one for budget meetings. Since this is not strictly a, a budget uh, discussion. This is kind of more of a policy discussion. There's budget aspects to it, and we'll kind of get to that toward the end. Uh, but this is really uh, just wanting to kind of brag on some of the things that our staff have been doing over the last year or so. Um, when Zach took over as the executive director of public safety, uh, one of the first things I think that uh, he did was to convene this task force, and we'll talk a little bit about what it is um, and what it has done. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So um, one of the things that I, I, I recognize in the city is, is that we historically have been really siloed in different departments, right? And that's real easy when you have, I don't know, I think HR said we had over 600 employees at last count. So that's pretty easy to get that way. Um, but we do, we, we have a, a task force, a group that gets together to address issues within the city uh, that deal with quality of life, uh, really. And um, so I want to give a real big thank you to Chief Marshfield and Chief Jeff Coat. Uh, they're active on it. Rob Ray's active. Uh, Larry and Caitlin, they're back there. I asked them to be here because they're extremely critical to getting this done. So uh, I joke that this group does not have a budget, but we get a lot done through everybody else's budgets, right? I mean, uh, they each have a budget, and uh, it's one of those things where uh, it's not territorial. It, it's what do we need to do to get the issue accomplished. So, I, again, I just wanted to give a real big thank you to those people. Um, the, the, again, and it's beyond them, right? I mean, Chief Hartsfield has his car marshals that come. I know uh, Lieutenant Emmons, uh, Sergeant Carson, they're there. Um, Code enforcement is there, Andre, Katie. All of these people are together in a room uh, once or twice a month and uh, getting tasks assigned, following up on tasks, and making things happen. And so uh, I appreciate it, and it's well worth giving them the recognition in front of the council, and that's really what I want to do in these couple of minutes. So thank you. Yay. <laughs> hey y'all. Uh, and, and to be fair, Zach deserves uh, close to 100% of the credit for uh, putting this all together in the first place. Um, a lot of these issues, and this is kind of what this slide is about, um, a lot of these issues come from council. They come from people calling you guys and saying, hey, I've got a problem in my neighborhood. Uh, is there somebody who can take care of it? And one of the problems that we've, we've had traditionally as a city is a lot of issues, especially as they relate to things like code enforcement, are not necessarily one department issues. Um, they might touch three different departments because the, of the different uh, things associated with that. And especially when you're talking about cleaning up the city, which is kind of what our overarching goal um, has been. Uh, so what we did is, uh, you know, we were trying to combat the, the two problems that we saw, which were um, people saying, well, that's not my job, that's someone else's job. Uh, and people uh, not knowing what other departments were doing. So we might have, no one working on a problem because no one thought it was their job, or we might have three different people working on a problem and none of them know that the other people are also working on the problem. Um, so really, uh, kind of the uh, simple explanation of what this is, is we just said we're going to bring all the people together who might be able to solve some of these issues and we're going to sit them down in a room every two weeks and we're going to go over one by one all the things um, that we know of that are major problems in the city uh, when it comes to kind of quality of life, cleanliness, things like that. Uh, so Zach kind of already walked through some of the people involved. Um, Rob has been a tremendous help with Larry uh, through their department. Um, Chip in his department, Caleb, has been a huge help. Code enforcement has been a big part of it. And then police and fire as well. Um, so we wanted to kind of go through what our broad goals were. Um, hotels and motels were the first thing that we brought up. Uh, we have had and have several of our uh, more seedy uh, establishments in the city that are a tremendous problem from a number of different angles. Uh, they look bad, uh, they produce bad outcomes for the fire and police departments. Uh, they just have a number of issues associated with them, so we wanted to uh, make that our first priority. Um, commercial structures, we have done a great job with residential structures. We traditionally have not done commercial structures very often. When it comes to tearing them down, we wanted to move in that direction. Um, homelessness problem, of course, is something we hear a lot about, something that has gotten worse over the last couple of years. Uh, we wanted to focus on that. And then as it relates to kind of Rob and Larry's department, um, people just hanging a shingle and opening up a shop somewhere on a residential street 
um, the neighbors complain, you know, why are they working on cars in their driveway 24 hours a day, things like that. Um, so we wanted to uh, make sure that if someone was running a business, they were doing it in an appropriate way according to uh, what our requirements are. And we wanted to pick the low-hanging fruit first. Uh, we knew that there were a lot of very glaring issues that we thought we could address quickly, um, and as Zach said, without additional money. So the first and most pressing goal was the hotels and motels. Uh, I'm not going to use names uh, of these institutions, uh, but there were several of them located specifically along Texoma Parkway uh, that had become major, major attractive nuisances. Um, the type of people who were staying there uh, were causing a lot of problems. They were causing a lot of police calls, a lot of fire calls. Um, so we wanted to look at, at those specifically first and say, okay, what are, what are some of the things, using the tools we already have available, um, that we can do to um, kind of force these hotels to get better. So we uh, identified one in particular that was uh, 581 calls for service during the last year. Uh, that was during 2001, I guess, uh, which is just an amazing number. I mean, you're talking about a, a police car or a fire uh, or an ambulance being there every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, that's just, it's, it's not a tenable situation for the city. So what did we do? Well, first of all, uh, the hotel was operating illegally um, without a certificate of occupancy. They were branded under a national flag that they did not have the authority to be branded under. Um, so we worked with all of those different departments together. Um, Caleb towed a bunch of cars from the parking lot. Rob worked with them through the CO issues. Um, we uh, closed and destroyed the pool, which was just disgusting. Um, and we forced management, this was the biggest thing, uh, to enforce time limits on resident stays. So right now our, our code says that you can't have somebody living at your hotel. It's, it's against the law and for good reason because that, it's, not a good, it's not a good situation for the person that's living there. It's not a good situation for the city and it's created a lot of these problems. Uh, so we've had discussions with hotel management from a number of these different hotels to explain to them that you can't do this anymore. You can't allow people to stay here for longer. So what did that do? Well, at the at the problem hotel, the, the biggest problem, 581 calls, uh, we achieved a 49% uh, reduction in calls for service over the last year. So that's half as many um, just by going through those simple steps, working with the management, using the stick when we had to, um, to make sure that those hotels were operating in a way that our ordinances already required them to. And that really the goal of that is uh, our police, our fire department, our paramedics, they have a limited number of hours. They have a limited number of calls that they are able to get to. So if we're removing 250 calls from their call log in a given year, that's 500 hours or more that they are now free to work on other calls um, or not be there at that hotel. One of the things that we uh, were very worried about when we started doing this was uh, what I lovingly refer to as the cockroach problem, um, which is not the cockroaches in the actual hotels, although that is a problem. Um, but more that uh, when you shine a light in one corner of the room, of course, all of the cockroaches run away. Uh, but they're still there. They're still in the room. Um, so we wanted to be really vigilant at our other hotels um, that were kind of at that lower price point, that these problems weren't just being transferred to a different place, because that doesn't help anybody. Um, and what we saw after we... Uh, We've gone through the process with several of these hotels is that that has not been the case. Um, once we've eliminated these problems, for the most part, uh, they have gone away. They have not uh, migrated to other hotels. Um, maybe they've migrated out of the city. Uh, maybe it's just the uh, rules themselves that are having that effect. Uh, but we have not seen that, which is really, really good. That was one of the things we were most uh, concerned about. Uh, there was another hotel on Texas Parkway that was uh, had all of the same issues. Uh, that hotel was less willing to work with us, uh, and that has resulted in the hopefully permanent closure of that facility. We're currently uh, working to try to get that building uh, removed permanently and torn down. Um, so several different, and then uh, right now we're working with a number of other hotels, both on Texas and Parkway, and not um, to try to either get them shut down or to get them to comply with our laws. Commercial demolition. So uh, I have been in front of you guys on multiple occasions and bragged about uh, our, our residential demolition program. In my opinion, it's one of the most effective things we do as a city. It's one of the best uses of money that we spend as a city uh, because it really produces tangible results that improve neighborhoods at a really specific level. Um, and from the city's perspective, it takes 
buildings that are not productive, they're not places where people are able to live, it makes them into places where people can live, it increases the city's tax revenue from those properties, which is there's really no downside to what we've been able to do on the residential side. Uh, over the last five years, uh, since Chip we've touched 262 individual properties, and we've uh, destroyed over 800 individual structures, uh, which is pretty incredible when you think about five years of time. Uh, but we've only focused on residential buildings, and that was that was very specific. Uh, commercial buildings are harder to do for a number of different reasons. Uh, the biggest reason is that uh, the state requires us to test commercial buildings for asbestos, not for residential buildings. Uh, asbestos remediation is extremely expensive. It can easily double the cost of a demolition. Um, so when you're talking about having to do that on every single one of these, you're adding a tremendous amount of cost. You're adding time. These, these uh, abatements take time. Uh, and then you're also adding um, the state's direct involvement in that. So that's something that the state actually sends someone out to the site to make sure that we're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But we had a number of different commercial properties that were a problem. So uh, we said, okay, well, let's see, uh, let's see what we can do. Uh, so Zach kind of called this, uh, you know, the eyeball test is if it's something that is on a major thoroughfare, if it's something that you see right when you come into the city, uh, if it's really obviously dilapidated as you're driving down the highway, uh, that's something we want to focus on first. Uh, so something that met all of those, or two buildings that met all of those, checked all those boxes, um, were the old working man's friend gas station and next door the uh, old restaurant attached to uh, the Traveler's Inn. Uh, those right when you get off the highway, those are for two of the first buildings that you see when you get into Sherman if you're getting off on 56. Um, the restaurant in particular and the gas station a little less so um, were in deplorable condition. Both of them had become places where uh, people were living, camping out inside of. Um, we were having to send the police out there frequently to evict people. Uh, so we were able to work with the property owners in both of those cases and have those structures uh, removed. Usually on these commercial projects, uh, we, we don't do what we do on the, on the residential side. The residential side, our policy is and has been, if you want it gone, we will pay to get rid of it. On the commercial side, because these do cost more, uh, it's more of a negotiation. We work with the landowner to say, okay, we'll pay 75%, you'll pay 25%, we'll take care of the demolition, you take care of the abatement, whatever, whatever the situation calls for. Um, so we were able to eliminate about a dozen commercial buildings over the last year. Woodman Circle Home was all obviously a huge win uh, for us. Uh, that, pro that project just could not have gone any better from a uh, logistics point of view, from a financial point of view. I, I mean, it was, it, it was really something to be proud of as a city. Um, and and from a, I would say from a community uh, service point of view, that uh, we were able to work with everyone who really had a connection to that building uh, to make sure that they felt like they either got to visit the site one more time or they got to take a brick or they got to remove some piece of the building to keep that with them. We had gardeners come out and take up all the, the flowers that were planted that have been blooming for the last hundred years. Um, so we really did a fantastic job on that. It's something I'm really proud of. Um, and then uh, there was a large uh, warehouse on Mulberry Street, kind of right before you go underneath the, the uh, train tracks, uh, that had become like the others, uh, a place where the homeless were camping out, there were tents inside the building, um, police calls, fire calls, things like that, eliminated that, and then uh, one I didn't put on the list, but on South 1st uh, Street, kind of down where the Three Oaks uh, subdivision is going in, uh, there were a number of buildings down there on a couple different properties. Um, I think I think it was like seven or eight buildings down there that we removed off that piece of property um, that will allow that uh, subdivision to have a connection into it from up the street. Uh, just a couple pictures. There's the old working man's friend. There it is gone. There's the restaurant. Gone. Uh, there's some of the buildings on South Travis. South Travis. Those are gone. There's the Mulberry Warehouse. Gone. Uh, and then, of course, we're still working hard on the residential side, too. The commercial demolitions uh, take time away from our crew. Some of those we use outside crews for. Uh, but the focus of that program continues to be residential, and we continue to um, do as many of those as we can. This was an old house uh, that kind of, at one point, was a beautiful Victorian house, but it was literally falling down. Half of the, half of the house was falling off. Uh, that was a really hard negotiation uh, to get that gentleman moved to somewhere safer. 
um, have his possessions removed and relocated at our expense, and then taking uh, the house down and uh, removing that structure. And then uh, it's just another example of another uh, residential structure that we're able to do. Uh, so we're not we're not we're not losing uh, the core focus of the program. We're really just trying to expand it to uh, other commercial structures. Hey Nate, on that last slide, there was a future home of. <coughs> yeah. On that lot. Yeah. What what is it a future home That's of? That's the St. Mary's High School. Ah. Uh, the homeless encampments, uh, Sherman is not alone in uh, experiencing more increased problems with uh, the homeless over the past couple years. Um, we have, there's no simple solution there, obviously. Um, there's only so much uh, shelter space in the county, um, but we do have an obligation to our citizens to make sure um, that we're providing a safe city. So uh, this is something that we have tried to take a light touch with. Um, that we have tried to work with uh, the homeless rather than work against them uh, to let them know, hey, you can't be here, we're going to give you some time to leave, we're going to come back and check. Um, uh, Officer Carson, who we brought, he's kind of our, our link to the police department, uh, who is a part of this task force, has been really vital in uh, making those first contacts with the uh, encampments and uh, talking to them about that. One of the big problems we have is that uh, a lot of these, these guys are smart. Uh, they know that they, if they find a piece of property that is uh, not actively being watched over by its owner, that it, we can't just come kick someone off that piece of property. We have to have permission from the owners of the property to uh, ask them to move along. Uh, so we utilize our GIS system. We have a fantastic GIS department. Uh, to create a map of all the places and pieces of property where we have already received permission from the property owners um, who have told us, hey, we do not want the homeless camping out on our property, so that if we see a problem pop up in one of these locations, we don't have to do any due diligence, we can just go out and take care of it immediately. Uh, and then also to log individual instances of contact so that we can kind of keep track of the problems as well. I'm trying to move as quick as I can. You're doing good. Fine. Uh, yeah, so we give them time to clear, we uh, make sure that they uh, vacate the area, then we send in our code department, uh, we clean out all the underbrush so that you can see through the property um, so that there's not a recurring setback location. Uh, we've been very successful in removing uh, many of those camp encampments in the city. Uh, CO enforcement, this is uh, Rob's uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, we have had numerous complaints from citizens of people running uh, illegal businesses. It's usually car repair, um, although it has been other things from time to time, uh, out of a residential building or out of an old commercial building where they don't have the permission to be, or running multiple build businesses out of the same building but only have permission to run one, um, or having uh, cars stored where they're not allowed to be stored, <coughs> having uh, screening devices that aren't in place, things like that. Uh, things that are like the calls that you guys receive all the time. Hey, there's a guy running a tire shop down the street in a building. I don't think he's supposed to be there. Uh, so what we've done is we've worked through the zoning department. Uh, Rob and Larry have been incredibly helpful. Um, the task force could not have been nearly successful um, without their help. Um, but to identify those locations, oftentimes through citizen complaints, uh, and to work with those businesses to get in compliance, say, hey, you don't have a CO, you can't be here will help you get a CO, or if the problems are intractable, uh, you say, hey, this is not the place for this, uh, you've got to shut it down. Uh, so too many to, to run through, but uh, we've, we've uh, shut down a number of those throughout the city, um, or help them to get compliance. So what's next? Um, over the last year, we feel like we've picked most of uh, the low-hanging fruit, most of the easy wins uh, we think that we've kind of worked through, especially on the commercial demolition side of things. Uh, so now we're moving into kind of more difficult problems. What happens when you have a hotel that says, uh, screw you, we're not going to work with you, we think we're doing just fine. Uh, what happens when you have an occupied uh, commercial structure that you need to get torn down? What happens when you have a property owner that just won't work with you? And those are the issues that we're kind of moving into now. Um, but that comes with increased cost and that comes with increased time for our staff members. Um, so, Robbie has been incredibly generous to this point in basically, uh, I don't want to use the term blank check, but uh, mm -hmm. saying that this is a priority for us and if, if it costs X amount of dollars, then we're going to spend X amount of dollars to take care of the problem. Um, and so, particularly on the demolition side, uh, we have uh, 
that ex grossly exceeded our budget on a lot of these um, in order to get these projects done because the bottom line is they just cost more money uh, and there's no way to get around that. So uh, we continue to appreciate you guys uh, supporting us in, in those efforts. Uh, so uh, kind of some of the things that we've been talking about as what do we do going forward. Um, we take a harder line on what qualifies as substandard. Uh, currently, we really are just kind of focusing on those uh, properties that are very obviously substandard. We can see from major thoroughfares, uh, we could move into uh, kind of a more ticky-tack definition of uh, making sure that those buildings comply. <coughs> Spending more money on commercial demolitions. The, the number of commercial buildings that we can take down in a year is directly proportional to how much money we spend on the problem. Uh, there's just no way of getting around it. Uh, so continuing to uh, feed the Kraken, as we say, uh, to allow those projects to, uh, to happen. Um, some of these properties, uh, we, they, we've well, talked to our lawyers, talked to Ryan, uh, and gone through some of our legal options um, for uh, properties that we just can't come to an agreement on. Some of those properties, I know there are a number of apartment buildings that you all can think of off the top of your head. Um, that certainly qualify as substandard structures that are breaking a number of different city ordinances, either in the quality of their property or the CO or their uh, the size of their rooms. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, so in those cases, if we want to start really fighting fire with fire, uh, we can ask for legal receivership. Uh, we, can, uh, we can do that either for uh, the conditions of the building to say this building is so bad that uh, does not qualify as an apartment building. Uh, we're asking the receiver to step in. Uh, or we can do that from a public nuisance standpoint and say, hey, this is an apartment building where the police have had to go 200 times in the last year. Uh, this is a public nuisance. They're clearly creating a problem through the conditions of how they're running their business for the city. And we can legally step in and uh, make that happen. Um, zoning citations uh, through the municipal board is something that we work through. Uh, we can file lawsuits. We can file a civil lawsuit for uh, somebody that just refuses to go along with our zoning requirements, refuses to get a CEO. Um, and something that Rob has been working a lot on, and I'm by no means the expert, um, but I know he's got a presentation planned for a future council meeting, is uh, implementing a property maintenance code where the city would actually have one or more employees who would go around to the different multifamily locations in the city every year and inspect them uh, for all the problems that you would think would be associated with a multifamily building. That's something that Rob's been working on uh, among his million other tasks over the course of the last year. Uh, so the conclusions. Uh, I, I'm very proud of what this group has been able to accomplish. Um, it, it's not, it, the secret sauce is not uh, that secret. It's really just making all the people that have the ability to solve these problems get together, talk through them, uh, say, okay, you're going to handle this piece of it, you're going to handle this piece of it, he's going to handle that piece of it. Uh, that's really all we've done. And the group is good at holding those people accountable. It's every two weeks. Uh, so you know, two weeks from now, you've got to show that you've moved toward this goal um, in front of the group. So I think we've done a fantastic job. Uh, Zach, as I said, deserves a tremendous amount of credit for having this idea in the first place and for uh, putting it together. So now the uh, left and right hand work together, and someone else's job is down. Nate, I've got a question. Yes, sir. Is there anything we can do about Southgate Apartments? <laughs> I am so glad you asked. Oh, uh, oh wow. So Southgate, <laughs> Southgate Apartments, which we can name by name, uh, was owned by Apex. That's the city apartment building that's uh, about 40 feet from an elementary school, Washington Elementary. Uh, it's been <laughs> public enemy number one on our list for the past year for all of those different problems, the fires, uh, the homeless people living there, all the copper being stripped out of it. I mean, it's just an absolute disaster. So through Chip's office, uh, on Monday, we had a nine-hour uh, court session in the municipal court uh, where the new owners of Southgate argued that the city should not tear it down, and we argued that we have to tear it down. Uh, the judge did rule in our favor, gave us a demolition order, uh, issued a $10,000 fine on top of that, um, and they have 30 days to either tear the building down or we will do it for them. Uh, they do have the right to appeal. However, uh, we have been informed, fingers crossed, uh, that they do not plan to do that and that they plan to handle the demoli demolition on their own. Um, so in theory, uh, 30 to 90 days from now, Southgate should be 
I didn't know that. I want to mention two things. Uh, there were, were children and Rob specifically uh, did great in court, uh, helping to get that taken care of. Um, Nate has been awesome in really being a right hand and getting a lot of these things taken care of and coordinating between departments. Um, I wanted to speak to a little bit and give this one example. I told Nate I was going to give this. I gave this to Rob. Um, we, we've become a victim of our own success a little bit. Uh, there are multiple places in this city right now that we could take an action on today. However, it, it is expensive. And, but we started going down this road with a few of them, really not expecting the success that we've had. I was telling them, it reminded me kind of just to give you a picture of what this looks like. The very first time I got in a foot chase, I was about 150 pounds, so this was <laughs> a while ago, right? And I get in a foot chase, and I'm running between, in between these two alleys after a guy that's about 300 pounds. And after a short bit, I realized, I'm fixing that catch. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> That's us. That's how we've been in some of these multifamily complexes where we've gone after them, and then we're like, yeah, we need to run a little slower uh, because we're going to outrun our coverage, either financially or through litigation or some point. We're, we're going we're gonna to outrun uh, ourselves here in a minute. So... There are several places in town that we are intentionally a little bit slower on because uh, Southgate in and of itself is taking a lot of manpower, it's taking a lot of time, um, and it's one of those that we realize we're about to catch them and then it's, uh, we're going to sit on their head, because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, we, that, I just wanted to, to reiterate that, that you may drive by and see a place, and it's highly likely that we are almost all the way there. It's just we're lacking this one little piece. And the thing that we don't want to do is, is cram it down to anybody's throat and say that well, we've done all this, now you've got to pay for it. And we want to do it all in a timely manner. And I also want to reiterate to y'all that we are proponents of affordable housing. And, and it's not that we go around and just pick some place to pick on. It brings themselves to light, the number of calls for service, or that eye test or the general conditions of the property that shed light on itself. So those are the things. There are, there are metrics and issues that we use to bring them to the table. You, they, they, nothing just pops up. It's very intentional about how it goes. Because we want to make sure that as a city recovered from beginning to finish. Because we may end up in a situation like we're on Monday. Where we have to answer to it. And if we do it right, we'll win like we did on Monday. Yeah, that was good. Good job. Awesome. That was a good deal. Hey, let me, let me ask the councils. Um, appetite on something. Um, I'll need Mary's input here. So we inquired of our bond council and financial advisor about our ability to use um, bond funds to do uh, commercial demolitions, right? So just as a, as a matter of reference, um, a residential structure, single family residential structure average is a few thousand dollars, right? Five, six, seven thousand dollars. Commercial are multiples of that. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm not proposing that we go out and uh, bond $20 million to go uh, put to, towards our commercial demolition structure. But is there any appetite in using, uh, continuing to expand the program or continue to path their on in whichever way we can get the funds? If we have available funds, uh, through the general fund, we do it that way. If it's tight there and we need to hold on to reserves that we, uh, you know, start creeping into uh, those funds. So is there a general appetite based on what you've seen and know that we continue down this um, commercial path a little bit further? If, I mean, what's our, I imagine it's, it's more to tear them down, but when you get another commercial building built there, Right, so is our payback rate pretty much the same between, I think, would we say it was like five years with residential? Right. Something like that? Do we think it, commercial? It, it probably depends. Um, so on, on the um, Woodman Circle property, for instance, uh, how, many, how many units, um, th that's a multifamily unit project, and 
Uh, their plan was for 300 units to it? <clears throat> about 300? Okay. So that's about a $30 million, I mean, probably north of, but conservatively, $30 million project. Uh, $100,000 a door is is very conservative for uh, for that. So um, $30 million is um, $150,000 a year in in property tax, and it took a, hey, Nate, what was the, uh, the cost of Woodman Circle was about a couple hundred thousand? About 90. Oh, 90. It was the city's portion. Yeah, slammed up. I mean, so that <laughs> one's a <laughs> one-year playback. Or, Woodman Circle is not, is not a good example. No, it's not, but, yeah. but it ranges from that to, it, it's not a 25-year payback. It's yeah. a few years. But to Robbie's point, Southgate, I mean, I feel comfortable talking about that since we've got, I mean, it has 58 units, so if we can do a residential unit a house for $5,000, 58 units, that's $290,000. That's not a $290,000 demolition, though. That's an $800,000 demolition. So if you're talking about, yeah, maybe the property values are a lot higher, but are they three times as high? I, I, I think the answer to that is case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess if the... Um, if that is included in the algorithm that we're using yeah. to decide to go, then yeah, I would say go just to make sure that well, I'm, I'm, I'm good with I'm for it. And with this eye test, with the, you know, if you're talking about premium corners like Wooden Circle that are going to drive a huge value, <clears throat> and it's a no-brainer. Yeah. If it's in a TERS and we can we can you know utilize dollars that would be we created. Can use TERS dollars for demolition too, can't we? Yep. Yeah. So that that seems like a no-brainer. Okay. You know, and there are probably plenty of those. Uh, to focus on for a while. I mean, before we came back with a, and I'm extremely thankful on the Southgate that the property owner, if they follow through, uh, are going to be the one footing the bill because we were talking internally about that possibility. We would need to have come to you guys to spend that amount of money. And so we're not just going to go approve a, a $300,000 $300, teardown without coming to you. But if there's no appetite for it, I don't even want to bring it to you. But you're just saying on a case by case, if yeah. it makes sense and it right. meets these metrics um, of the eye test and prime locations and other things, you're willing to hear that. There's just from the valuation going up and everything that's happening, a lot of these properties, the owners are going to realize they're sitting on a gold mine and it's going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. But for those stubborn ones where you can't get any motion and they're sort of pass all of our tests and all of our criteria, yeah, I'm okay with because it's 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 a good investment. Yeah, and, so. and you may not know this, but what was the property of assessed value on Southgate? It, it actually was 1.8 the way it sits now. No, it, what was my favorite part is that between the time that it was it, it was occupied, uh, where there were still people living there, and then when it was abandoned, uh, they increased the valuation by $700,000. Wow! Well, <laughs> no! Okay. I don't believe that. Dollars. Not our assessors. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> wow. Everything you need to know about the prison. That's interesting. <laughs> What's the ma <laughs> major win on that hotel on Texoma Park? Well, I've never, mm -hmm. We, we office yeah. next to that, and that's the reason we basically so. moved. I've never seen anything like it. Your police trucks were in our parking lot every day. We had those folks coming in our office. We ultimately had to move. and uh, those were my clients. <laughs> <laughs> Passed out business cards over there. But I was on grand jury twice, and the amount of problems that I didn't even know existed in our city that were honed in in that space, it's unbelievable. It's a long overdue, but I'm glad we got yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's been interesting to see, even from uh, Chief Marshfield's mentioned, how his, his paramedics today will tell a difference in the number of calls that they're making. Yeah. And because we have, we have dual responsibilities. We need to take care of the citizens. We also need to take care of our employees. And if we're setting our employees up to fail, that's not doing what we need to do. Right. So uh, we've been able to accomplish it, uh, a win on multiple fronts. Good. Yeah. It's Good. been a great, fantastic program, in my opinion, just successes all the way around. So Yeah, I'm for reinforcing success. So. Yeah, what's our budget for that department now? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> what well, I'm sorry, the sub, 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 sub standard, sub standard structure uh, like closed yeah. <laughs> 200000 Good grief. Wow. So we were, we, yeah. what we're saying is that money would come from a bond? Well, we don't, bond we don't, we don't know right now. It's just come from our uh, general tax revenues. Um, but is, and before we would 
I'm not in favor of going and issuing a big bond issue for this, but you know, if there is a project that qualifies, mm -hmm. um, I am willing to at least consider that with these metrics that we've talked about right, and bring right. it back to you. Congratulations, um, we're, we're simply yeah. spending <laughs> over in different areas, uh, whether it's code enforcement to go clean up uh, uh, what I would refer to as a trespassing count, um, or or something else. You know, we're the money's not always there. But when the opportunity arises for us to take care of it, yeah, we find a way to get that done. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we we can't budget for how many homeless camps there be in a given year, um, but we we spend the money anyway when we need to take care of it. Yeah, and yeah. Mary said that's that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mary was actually wanting to use the term blank check. I thought that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Debit card. Uh, so, yeah. Nate, I know this, not, this isn't a pitch for an increase in your substandard structure program budget, but how often do we run out of money and your guys got to sit idle? Well, in years Never. past, we have uh, tried to throttle the program toward the end of the budget year when we run out of money. Um, but in the past year, since a conversation with Robbie, um, I mean, we've really gotten the full steam ahead. Okay. Uh, and we just manage, um, I mean, this is a subset of how we manage the entire general fund. Mm -hmm. When you guys improve a $50 million general fund budget, you're not approving, technically speaking, you're not approving $10 million for the fire department, $9 million for the police department, et cetera. You're approving $50 million. And so we manage that $50 million just in whole, and then so we true it up at the end of the year for things like this that could go over budget or equipment that it costs more than we thought originally. So usually in the first meeting in September, usually in September we come back and say, hey, on all the major funds, hey, we ran over for these reasons, uh, we do the budget amendment and we true up at the end of the year. So this would fall into that category. If, if there is low hanging fruit, like uh, Southgate or uh, these uh, hotels, motels, I just say go go get her done and we'll true up at the end of the year and then during a planning session like this we say hey we're making progress do you guys feel you know you know that we should continue <laughs> well, on with well, it. So. In other words there are eight people around this table that think this is an awesome plan and there's one who's just really not a big fan. <laughs> 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 not many names. Uh. <laughs> so, hey I, I got a question. So what do you do about those those uh, multifamily locations that are not really in a prime area, the uh, like uh, the Baltic? Yeah. You know, that's a problem. I mean, I was looking at the whole list, and they they hit every one of them. I mean, police presence, uh, mm -hmm. CO violations. I know there's people that live there. That, that, and that's the big problem. It's yeah. not. If we could we could lower the hammer. We could shut them down. Some of them, not the same one specifically, yeah. but we could shut them down for lack of a certificate of occupancy. In a lot of these cases, we'd say, "Sorry, you're operating outside the ordinance. You got to shut down." But then, what do we do with the hundred families that live in that building? If we don't. The city certainly does not have the capability to relocate those people. Um, certainly, when our friends in the press to accuse us of you know, but, being calluses. But that, the problem is still there, though. I mean, yeah, so I'll tell you specifically where we're at on that individual place right now. We have pushed hard enough on them mm -hmm. that the owner flew in from California and showed up in Rob's office and said, I've tried to schedule a meeting, but I just, I need, I got to get with you. And we've got to go look at this together. That's where we're at right now. Okay. And Rob and them have done that. And they're taking steps towards rectifying some things. Which way does it go? I'm not sure. We end up on top of a hill, we're going to roll one way or the other. They're going to get into compliance, or, or at the end of the day, we're going to rectify some sort of situation. We don't know what that looks like, but we have pushed hard enough that, that we've gotten their attention to go ahead and just fly in. That's a win for me. Rob came over to my office and was like, I got this guy over here. Sounds great. Let's, let's handle it while they're here. So, um, again, something that we're addressing, the due diligence that we take on this, it does take time. I mean... I think each of you have seen the South Kid uh, situation from out of its infancy to where we are now. It's over a year to, to get to this resolution. So there's a lot of due diligence that takes place because, like, again, if we do it right, we can win even if they take the hard road. No problem. We don't get to choose which road it takes. It, Rob, is, if we did a maintenance ordinance, would that be retroactive? No. Yeah. Like, like existing non-conforming? Non -conforming? Correct. I don't believe so. But that point so we got a guy that goes around and does inspections every year 
one of those five apartment buildings that we all like to talk about has failed 12 or 13 street inspections from the fire department. So it, that does, that's not that's not the only answer. You, you got to you still have to figure out what you do with the people. And is that enforcement side? Is that litigation? Does that have to be done through ordinance or? That's kind of that goes back to that slide. Sides, yeah, yeah, is that that there are a number of different legal routes we could take, and they all have different pros and cons. Yeah. Okay. And the thing that I I appreciate most about this group is that uh, it's discussed among everybody. So there is not one single person that's sitting back saying this is the thing I want, so this is the thing that'll happen, and everybody has to live with it. And these decisions are affecting a lot of people. And so we have, I mean, a, a group that works through this thing. Uh, very, very conscientious. Um, each decision is is taken high. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's a perfect example of why you think this group has been successful. Is because that that apartment building, Rob says they don't have a CO. Fire marshal says they failed X number of inspections. Substandard structure says, yeah, we can get it for substandard structure. So we put when you put all your heads together, you have all the range of options available. So, out of curiosity, I mean, I know uh, Chief Hartsfield individually and his guys come out and inspect us annually, and when they threaten fines, it gets us moving pretty quick. These guys apparently have no fear of fines, and they, they just uh, allow them to accumulate, or do we have liens? Are we creating liens? We work through all that. Okay. And <laughs> it's kind of real clear cut. So, ordinance says we can charge a fine every day. Yeah. They're in violation. So, we work through... Do it. We've worked through these processes with the judge because what we don't want to do is go into court with a situation that's going to yeah, fail. So you. Uh, we can we kind of try to assess those fines and allow them an opportunity to rectify it. Then we'll come back again. So it's not as heavy as the ordinance necessarily allows. Uh, what that ordinance allows and what's practical sometimes is a little bit different. And so we, we just approach each one a little different. Uh, when they show us, uh, again, you fly over California, not work with we, it, it's it's really a case-by-case -case basis on each of these things but yes we are setting ourselves up to be able to do each of those things I'd say when we started we weren't in a place legally through ordinance to be able to do everything and so we're working uh, to get ourselves in a, in a situation where we can we can do that we, we came to y'all to be able to hold uh, to put liens on places um, and just a few months ago, we were dealing with some of these apex properties and the water and things like that, where if there's an avenue to get it done, uh, we just didn't have ourselves in a position to do it. And to be honest with you, we stumble upon those sometimes. And so as we do, uh, we'll keep bringing them back to you to set ourselves up to win. And to your point, Sean, that the, the fine that the city was entitled to on the Southgate claim was a $462,000 fine. The fine that we got was $10,000. Oh, okay. It's but our but the object of that fine wasn't to get the money; it was to get resolution to the problem, mm -hmm. That's right. which we did. It was through a bunch of pain and gnashing of teeth <laughs> and a year's worth of time. Yeah. But it's it's a, that one's a grand slam to me. I mean, and we don't need to pay for the demo. Right? Yeah, yeah that's where I'm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. we were going into it thinking, man, just to get it down, we should be able to, we should be willing to contribute towards this. And we were working with the school districts and some others that may you know, have had a, a, an interest in doing that. But number one, to get them to move. Number two, that they might, um, you know, they're, they're planning on, they say they're going to, I'll believe it when it's down, but if they're paying for it, that is a, that's a home run. And the second they decided they were going to do it, our whole tone changes, right? We say, great, we're going to work with you to get it done. We're not going to fight you anymore on this. Let's, let's work together. Yeah. It's been a great program, so mm -hmm. I, I appreciate uh, Zach and Nate and the entire team really that's put this together. Yeah. It's a shining, awesome work, shining star. Keep it up, awesome, awesome. All right, um, we've got a city hall update. Is everybody? Uh, we're about 45 minutes outside of having uh, or an hour of a big lunch. Do we need a five minute? Uh, I want you to alert for this one. Do you need five minutes? Uh huh. Five minutes. He, he's going to wait until the food kicks in, then he's going to start asking for money. That's how this works. No. Say my turn. Say my first rodeo, Robbie. I know how this works. I have been warned.
We need to get into your evidence. Just make sure it's all good. But two things. We can bring it into the regime of the city. The other one would be if we could raise money. I mean, we should come up with a resolution. And, um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the top yeah. Two.
to cover? Yeah, Zach. All right, Zach, you're going to uh, do the intros? I am. Oh, and we have a clicker. Uh, but I want to so I want to introduce everybody. I'm going to kind of give it over to Barry here in a second to go over this. So uh, we've had a team working together to work on some City Hall concepts and, and uh, high level things um, to get us to a point where we can have some vision into what a future City Hall would look like, kind of some costs associated with that. Uh, we brought Gensler. Uh, uh, as the architect firm on, uh, many of y'all have seen Brian Nicodemus, he's not able to be here with us today, but Barry Hand is here as the principal. Uh, Burn Construction is also here, Gabe, uh, uh, Cortez, and Jason Moore is somewhere, there he is, Jason Moore. Uh, Burn has been involved working with Gensler to go through estimating and what that process looks like, the mayor knows much better than me. So. Uh, with that, I'll just uh, allow Barry to introduce your staff and let y'all uh, get started here. Sure. Thanks for having us. By the way, it's fascinating to hear your discussions about commercial buildings that are degraded and task force that are taking care of 600 staff members. It is in every city right now, especially the first street suburbs are dealing with a lot of degraded buildings. But you obviously need to also take care of your staff. My name is Barry Hamm. I'm an architect and a principal with Gensler. I'm also a practice area leader. I've got with me today Kim Dresner, who is a city planner and urban planner. So she'll have a bit of this presentation. But last but not least, Kevin Turner is a consulting and strategist with us. He's been working with your team on a program for the City Hall. Uh, we're going to be looking at a building today that's about 50,000 square feet. Not so much for purposes of a final design. Please, please, please. This is not a final design. This is a test fit, a concept design that allows the contractors to get their arms around the price. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done with your staff and your different departments. Fascinating to hear that you have 600 people probably scattered. Where does that go? 600 people probably scattered all over your city. And it'd be good to bring a lot of those people in house. Obviously, some people like the police will have their own facility on the ground right now. But that's a key part of recruiting and retention. And we're going to probably talk about that a lot over the next several months. Especially for you as the So uh, what we're going to do quick is just set the context of kind of how we got where we are today as a team working with your staff and with the contractors. And Kevin's going to walk us through the background. You want to use this or you want to just tell me what <coughs> Hello everybody, my name is Kevin, again. And, um, so like Barry mentioned, uh, we really started this process out really as a, a listening session in a workshop um, with a number of city staff so around here as well. Um, really we, we wanted to focus on two main things. Number one, kind of what is the experience of City Hall in the workplace for city employees? And then also, uh, what is the experience of downtown? mostly focused on City Hall, but understanding that the city, city Hall can really start to be a heart of downtown, or a main destination. Um, so these are the two main things that we were uh, looking at in uh, kind of a, a beginning workshop. We actually had you all come down to our office, um, very appreciative, you all beat me to the office almost uh, <laughs> in the morning. Um, but we had an all-day work session where we went through a number of different activities, uh, ranging from images, um, to discussions, to actually kind of drawing up notes, and graphs um, on these two main kind of different topics, City Hall and downtown. Um, and it was really great to really hear firsthand from you all, everybody that was in attendance, and what makes Sherman special? What makes City Hall special? How do you want to show uh, the, the character of Sherman through your institution? And so to get a little bit of background and just a very quick summary on what we heard, um, we heard a lot about um, the way that people work together, um, the really great kind of community that's, uh, that's born in the office, we like to keep it fun, um, and also we want to really be angling towards kind of timeless design that's not trendy, um, that will be kind of a, a lasting testament uh, as Sherman continues to grow. Um, and again, we, we look at this through a number of different ways, uh, so this Polaroid exercise is a really great icebreaker, um, we have a number of different images out ranging from what uh, workplaces look like. Um, to the lower right hand corner, kind of things around employee culture, or what the, what the vibe is, if you will. 
Um, so really, we, we got a good understanding that we want to be focusing on a bright, modern, comfortable environment for employees, um, but that's also welcoming to the public. Um, again, kind of doubling down on culture, we really wanted to understand where you all are today um, versus where you all are tomorrow. Um, and this is really notable. We do this exercise with a couple of different clients um, as, as we go through these projects, um, but your team is very much <laughs> aligned um, and you can see in this leftmost one where all the dots are in the same place. <laughs> uh, you all have a really tight-knit culture um, that's pretty evident just from, just from this kind of first investigation. Kevin, let me just say, that's important because it's not uncommon for us to meet with a lot of corporate clients. And they'll bring 10 people to the meeting and all 10 of them have a different point. So it'll literally become scatter map. So it becomes psychoanalysis trying to get them back to one single. So your staff seems really aligned around a big culture. Okay. And, and, you know, this really allowed us to see the extra sticky notes in here, too. We got to be able to dive deeper into these ideas, um, not just trying to be a mediator, but really understanding where does uh, Sherman as a city want to go uh, looking forward. Uh, we also did some work style mapping. Um, so this uh, crazy mess of a graph um, essentially boils up to say everybody's doing uh, their own Kind of thing. They've all got different needs, um, and so we really need to start thinking about a, a, a city hall and a workplace that enables these different types of work streams. Um, each line on here represents a different participant, um, so as you can imagine, people are going to be doubling in and out and all around meeting together. Um, really want to make sure that we're bringing that through as we envision the concept design. Uh, and kind of as a, a, a marker point for the end of this kind of workshop, beginning workshop to set the tone for the project, um, we developed two vision and purpose statements, uh, one around the workplace and one kind of more broadly around downtown and City Hall's place in that. So when it comes to workplace, um, we were able to we co-created this, but uh, landed on this vision of City Hall as a workplace which will provide space to gather, share, collaborate, and give a platform to pioneer the way forward for sure. Really uh, kind of emphasis on that platform. And then around community, kind of what does City Hall mean for the community? Um, City Hall will be a center to a social business district. Um, it's kind of a phrase uh, that we've developed along the way, but really, again, getting to the heart of the community. Um, for the community to conduct affairs and come together, improve quality of life, and honor the legacy of Sherman. Uh, Kim's going to talk a little bit more on the development on that side of things, um, but I'll kind of transition very quickly into the guiding principles of the program for City Hall that we so we developed a set of guiding principles with the team, uh, kind of namely um, kind of ensuring a variety of choice in the workplace, and getting it back to that crazy graph, everybody has their own needs. Um, key moments to come together, um, the team really, as an anecdotal um, point, really love the idea of just being able to drop in on somebody real quick and get a, a task list kind of done real quickly, so making sure that we're being cognizant of that. Uh, connection, to the connection and access to outdoors and natural light especially in the workplaces, make it bright. And then careful attention to public and staff spaces, understanding the current city hall, uh, people might be able to get more access than uh, necessary for workspaces, so making sure that there's space carved out for the public and uh, city workers to interact um, collaboratively. Uh, so very quickly, I'll kind of run through uh, the preliminary program that we were able to develop off of this work session. The main themes that we used uh, carry forward from those vision purposes, or vision statements, if you will, and the, the principles to really kind of hone in on these four main things. So number one is kind of implementing a consistent space standard, um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Uh, working towards a paperless environment, understanding that um, as we transition more into a, a technological field, uh, we don't need as much storage, or we can manage that a little bit differently. Enhancing public access and safety. Again, we just kind of talked about this, but making sure the public can interact uh, collaboratively. Uh, and being strategic on how to grow. Um, different departments, as we kind of looked at, uh, are growing either a lot or maybe not so much um, in their kind of respective outlooks. Um, so we want to be sure that we're allowing for that space um, moving forward. So real quick, just to, as, a, as a data uh, person, I love Excel. It's what I do weekends. <laughs> That's not a lie. Mary's place kind of stand a These kind of 
set our, our, um, our growth assumptions and inclusions. Um, and we collected this, uh, again, kind of based on headcounts, um, as well as distributing uh, program surveys to each of the named departments um, to fill out. So not just a headcount and a prospective growth rate, and kind of looking three years and 10 years out, but also we asked them that questionnaire, what's important to you? What's, what do you need to get your job done? How do you interact with the public? Um, what are your kind of main key things? Um, so for each of these departments, we kind of looked at, um, for some of them, what their current square foot um, in the city hall is, as well as their headcount and all of those kind of other uh, qualitative. Touching back on space standards and uh, kind of setting a standard across, uh, these is, this is just a sample, uh, but these are kind of spaces laid out uh, to help visualize what different types of spaces might be for each of these departments. Um, so we benchmark these um, on our own projects, um, on city halls and civic projects, as well as um, industry research um, for, for the time. Um, so the size of a small conference room or a medium conference room um, and understand how many people fit in there comfortably, uh, it's all kind of uh, data backed, but also mapped to the needs of each of these departments. So from there, and again, kind of emphasis on preliminary here, um, but we developed a preliminary program um, to understand in two phases kind of what the size of City Hall might be based on these headcounts and then these space standards. And so just very quickly kind of touching kind of the overall gross square foot of these inclusions came to about 54,000, 55,000 gross square foot, again, based on this preliminary calculation that's taking into account uh, offices, collaboration space, um, a large council chamber, um, as well as a large cultural space and public space kind of highlighted in that yellow color there. Uh, phase one is looking at a three-year outlook, so when what the headcount might be when conceivably this may come online. Um, phase two is looking at what the headcount would then be looking 10 years down the road. And so we wanted to understand what is the delta difference there? Is it large? Is it small? Is it kind of manageable? Um, since that will inform how we might approach phasing the site. Is in the building. So we do that calculation, it comes to just under 60,000 square foot. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on what the current programming numbers are a little bit later, um, but again, these preliminary kind of outlooks that we use to kind of form the basis of our approach. Uh, and then lastly, before I'll hand it off to Kim, uh, we did kind of, uh, as part of that questionnaire and through this whole process, start to map which different departments want to be connected most closely to others. So the, the solid lines in this diagram here represent direct connections. The dotted lines are a little bit more fuzzy. Um, the size of the bubble represents kind of the amount of space that each group is getting. Um, but again, kind of as we start to wrap our head around how we fit this program in, these forming the basis of how we want to put these different puzzle pieces together. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Yeah. So our scope of work is for this phase is looking at City Hall. However, we felt it was important to take a bigger picture look, as Kevin kind of alluded to um, in the very beginning, looking at downtown. So this is, again, very preliminary, very high level um, look at what is going on in downtown and around City Hall. And so I'm gonna, all the land uses, and I'm gonna dive in just a little bit deeper so you can see each, each category. So this is residential. So you can see there's very little residential in downtown. Um, commercial land uses. So this breaks up um, down to automotive services, dining, um, goods, uh, office, uh, service and banks, and then salons type uses and storage. And then we move into um, institutional land uses. So your government land uses, your schools um, and churches. And then open space and unbuilt. So this is vacant land, this is maintained green space, kind of all the green, whether it's Pretty or not pretty. So that's kind of a high level picture of what's happening in downtown. And that kind of plays into when we think about how people are getting to City Hall and their experience. So taking our, um, the information that Kevin has did on the programming um, and working with city staff, we did a charrette to kind of come up with the strategy for City Hall and how that would sit on the site. So from that charrette and Kevin's work, we then distilled these four concepts. Um, so I'm just going to run through them real quick. Scheme A, Scheme B, Scheme C, and Scheme D um, were the different options. And from there, we heard from staff that A and C were the favorites 
and with a, a little bit of B that we picked up. So that led into the master plan. Sure. So you can see in those 10 minutes of presentation, your city hall is an interface for the public and government. It's also an office building. Frankly, that's what it is 95% of the time. It's an office building. But it's also your opportunity to kind of catalyze an expression of Sherman government in your city. Uh, Sherman's like a lot of county seat towns where you have the courthouse and the government center, uh, you know, whether it's McKinney or Sherman. A lot of the county seats have that square where at one time there were two intersecting highways and it was turned into a square and commerce set up around that in the 1850s and 1860s. So, to Kim's point about kind of reorienting the land use here at City Hall, you can see down here at the park where the music festival happens. We're going to talk about that a little bit. This is Pecan right here, Elm, Mulberry, and Crockett over here. So your current City Hall sits in this area right here, for the parking lot here. <coughs> so we're proposing a bit of a change in the land use. Uh, whether it's phased or just one building at one time that's built out, you know, maybe just shell for expansion in the future. We've got a lot of time to talk about things like that. But in this particular uh, master plan, you've got the College Auditorium up here, which is a beautiful terminus on Mulberry Street. Obviously, the Methodist Church infrastructure over here. Crockett is a boundary over here. And then whether this is new or repurposed existing commercial shells, I think this is kind of a cool urban edge along Crockett and Pecan to somewhat anchor this new city hall. Surface parking moved to here. Last but not least, we've got some nice topography to work with here. It kind of becomes the temple on the mount in a way. If we use the topography right, the way it drops here, and then we can convert this to a predominantly a pedestrian way. We really want to bring more activation to the festivals that you're doing in the park. So if we can make the city hall a backdrop to that festival by moving the stage probably to a better location right here along this street and then play up toward the city hall as a backdrop. That's just the idea for now. There's a lot of different studies we can do, but that's where we are for now. I'll show you some detail on the actual Plans. Kevin and Kim talked about some aspirational imagery. This was, these were images that were pulled as favorable along with our team and your team. So again, you're seeing a lot of lush placemaking. Keep in mind, people don't live or work in building facades. They work in the spaces between the buildings. That's really what's going to bring life and activation to your citizens. The space and the place we generate outside the building. That's why the existing culture you have in that festival right now is so important where you have your city hall. So let's play that. Let's exploit that. Let's use that. Okay, so this is just a quick orthogonal view, kind of a bird's eye view, looking down across Pecan Street. Uh, you will see some ideation for possible expansion of surface lots on some of these vacant. We don't know for sure that that can happen, but it's just ideas at this point. Could you take on some other properties around uh, the city hall to maybe use for surface. So what you see here on the south, so this is the west end of the site here, kind of perched up on the hill. We've got, we've got topography dropping off here down toward the park and the college auditorium. Uh, so we've got the, the city hall kind of perched up here on the hill. We'd like to see this converted to a pedestrian way. If the fire department needs a fire lane there, it can be a mountable curb or something like that. And we can work that out, I'm sure. But you can see this is generally, as far as the land use, this is the council chamber area. Back in here, council chamber, conference rooms, what have you. And then this part of the building becomes more office and administrative back in this area. I mean, we're proposing open, green space, pedestrian areas. This could ultimately be expansion area. If you didn't want to go up higher, you could expand into that. You see that in a lot of city hall complexes. And then we're showing whether it's new infrastructure or renovated uh, buildings back here along Crockett. Uh, you can see the program summary up top. I won't read through all these because you can. Generally, the program that Kevin and his team set up was about 50,000 feet. That's what we think you need to grow into. And we're, what we've actually designed here is approximately 52, which at this point is around there. So don't worry too much about what you see. 
right, as far as the specific plans, and again, this was for purposes of pricing. Please, 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 these are not final plans. Don't worry about where your office might be. We've got a lot of time to work through that. You may remember this was that southwest corner right here that was perched upon the hill. So we think, given kind of the uh, nature of the axis that goes down to the auditorium, which is, I just went blank, that is Mulberry Street, thank you. Uh, this is Mulberry Street. We think this is a really important address for you. And terminating on this lifestyle use down in here, we think it's important that your public interface be right here and ultimately be a backdrop to this open space park plan. So as far as the plan goes, I want to use, where did that cool laser go? Here we go. Okay, so uh, this would be the west, north, West corner of the property right here. So your council chamber and uh, work session areas would be back here perched up on Mulberry. And then your public interface into the complex would be actually kind of like it is now, coming off of the Mulberry, on the Mulberry side. So this would be your public interface side here. Uh, we're proposing operable walls that can be used in as kind of flex space, so think of this as either one space or three spaces. You can have events in here with pre-function space in here. And then this is other mixing lobby space right here that ultimately has a connecting stair up to another floor. And then without a lot of, a great deal of detail, we're showing this is office space in here on the ground floor. <clears throat> Once we get up to the second floor, this is open to below, this is your council chambers. Again, conferencing and collaborative area up in here on the second floor uh, for meetings just like this. And then you've got second floor of uh, office or administrative areas. Notice the balconies here uh, are terraces. We think these terraces are going to be important going forward for workplace, whether it's collaboration, meetings, people just taking a break, focus space. There's a lot of work that our group is doing as far as workplace. And so the data is very strong. It's coming in post-pandemic about how the workforce of the future will work. And it's different. So let's go to the next image. Um, this is a diagram that basically shows 33 parking spaces underneath this ground floor right here. We've got some topography to take advantage of. Uh, we don't typically do a lot of structured parking. Uh, in complexes like this, but given the topography and that the land slopes off pretty significantly down here, we think it's a great opportunity to do a couple of bays of structured parking, council, senior staff, what have you, park down in these areas. Uh, some rendering views. This is the public interface running parallel uh, west, looking west off of Mulberry into your council and city hall. Uh, entry, kind of, this is the entry sequence for the citizens coming into the building. Again, Mulberry is over here on the right. Once you're in the building, uh, you can see this is kind of a double height space with administrative over there. Security, obviously security is, is pretty big these days in these government complexes. So we'll have to go through that. Uh, and then all of your kind of public interface for government and council is over here on the right. So we're, we're still looking west, out across the park. And then this is looking the other direction with the council chamber on the left. Now we're looking east with the administrative office areas on the right. This is that double height space and the connecting stair up to the collaborative and office areas. Because once you're inside that programming area that was right up over the entryway, so whether it's public meetings or Executive meetings or staff meetings, whatever. We think there's going to be a big demand for that in your workplace. This is that terrace I mentioned uh, that we actually showed a stair coming up off the park. This is just a massing of the college auditorium in the background. But your current building, your current city hall, is somewhat inward. It's, it's, it's inward focused. It doesn't have a real public face. So we think a building like this is appropriate for Sherman's future as far as the expression of your brand. This is that bottom southwest corner where the grade drops off pretty quickly on the con and you have this 
area where you can drive in under the building. You can see now the entry sequence from the west up off of the park and this elm, which we'd like to see that be kind of a more of a pedestrian type street. We're getting pretty close to the end here. This is at the top of the hill of Pecan. The parking lot is over here. And then this would be the two floors of office building as you're driving down the hill. That's what we have for you today. That was just an update on an idea that the contractor can get his arms around for pricing purposes. There's a lot of work still to do. But that kind of gets us something for you to react to. And that's it. So, okay. go ahead, go ahead. Barry, can you flip back to the slide that represents the City Hall orientation to the, the existing downtown spaces? I believe it's one of the first ones, possibly. This one, or you want to go further? Uh, go back to where you show kind of our downtown area. You know, on the map. Sure. And this might be, a, this is an urban planning question. As, you, is. as yeah. you looked at our City Hall site and the orientation of our downtown and our downtown merchants. Um, one of the goals of of the council, as I understood it at the time, was to open up City Hall to make it, you know, not only City Hall offices, but make it a destination. When and you've shown that retail on the, I guess that would be the east end of the property. Yeah. Yeah. How? As far as urban planning and future use, maybe of that lot across Pecan, how do you see that impacting our, yes, impacting our central business district as far as coffee shops, restaurants, things of that nature that we could could encourage on that site? It's a great question. Uh, currently, your, your kind of formal CBD square is obviously here. And then you've got this patchwork, and, and I watched this with Brian a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. You've got this patchwork of a lot of kind of just no, it's disparate yeah. uses, right? Exactly. There's a couple of single family houses in there, down by the church. It, there's no real character, specific, distinct character to what's happening in this zone right here. Mm -hmm. The church obviously is permanent and has a very uh, kind of stable brand, but these zones right in here seem transitional. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and, and I know that what our team would love to see is this government complex, if, if ever it needed to expand, come this way. There's nothing wrong with you having presence on Crockett. You know, the, we, we looked at this on the way in today. The, the, the federal courthouse, let's see, is it this one? Yeah. So the federal courthouse here, but ultimately this is your kind of historic downtown core that we think should be invested in. You know, there's a, every suburb in North Texas is in the business right now revitalizing their old downtown. Mm -hmm. So you actually have a real downtown with actual real historic buildings. You don't have to recreate them. So we think there's tons of opportunity to invest, not just in this downtown core, but to your point, yeah. create this linkage from yeah. right here to here. And it, and it ultimately becomes a destination that connects down to the festivals, and then it reinforces right. the hotels that might want to camp out in here. And I think this area, too, might be a great place for mixed-use um, retail with residential above to really connect from the downtown core up to your nice park that you're building up here to really... Yeah bring people all the way through. It's a great point. One of the things Kim pointed out, which is striking, uh, is the lack, it, how, how actually very thin the residential is in your CBD. Um, there were eras from the 50s to the 1980s where cities were in the business of chasing residential out of our CBDs. And uh, we've since learned that what, what activates and revitalizes the downtown cores is residential. So this isn't probably the time nor place uh, to talk about this, but if, to Kim's point, if this could become a bit of a lifestyle right. zone that is anchored by your government district, then you automatically build the connectivity down Crockett and, let's see, Travis here. Travis is a great address. Uh, you could build linkages from here down into your core. We know there's hoteliers that are interested in something down in here uh, because the presentation that preceded us just is such an uh, evidence of the explosion that's about to happen. 
So laying this stuff in now will just only accelerate those lifestyle components that ultimately attract the educated talent that cities like Sherman are going to want. Right. And then right. adding in that lifestyle mixed use component, then you're talking about a 24 7 activated place. It's not, it doesn't die at 5 o'clock. Right. Right yeah. now it is very quiet. You can shoot a cannon down Crockett at 5 30 and not get anywhere. Right. So, and that's right. one of the things that we as a council, I think, have discussed is, you know, right now we're uh, in the process of investing in our downtown core and areas with, you know, new infrastructure and things of that nature. So, you know, part of our, I guess, contribution to downtown not only in those tangible investments but something where we we invest in a city hall site that you know encourages the growth down Travis down Crockett and will you know create an impetus for people to invest in kind of that I don't want to call it the dead zone but kind of that Area just south of the city hall. You can right, call it the dead zone. Right through there. I, I, I don't want to do it because people have invested there, and 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 it's. I don't want to call it that, but you know we can encourage additional investment, and and growth in those areas, and really create something unique for Sherman. And so I I want I want the council to think of the city hall as more more than the office building because we're in fact doing urban planning right. to a large degree creating a walking path if you will right. um, throughout our downtown and um, so it's 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 bigger than just offices yeah and again this is all very very preliminary very right. high level but you know we would love to to take the opportunity to really dive in and investigate those like just like that kind of site where you yeah. can really see the growth of potential that would really spur so much development in downtown I mean, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked, you know, the high school, mm -hmm. the stadium. Right. You know, what are all these institutional uses going to be long term? Uh, again, this is probably neither the time or place to answer those. But uh, long term, looking at this side of downtown is only going to be catalyzed by a new attractive government complex that's there for them. It, it encourages other development. If they know you're there for the next 100 years, they're going. And then if you could begin to build in character districts that have multifamily or let's just say mixed residential. There's a lot of different residential, residential typologies that would sell extremely well around this historic downtown. You don't have to go very far to McKinney to see the success they've had with their downtown. And it's actually very, very similar to what you have in scale, courthouse, square, retail. That's a great case study. Can I also add that even during our one of our work sessions when we were looking at the blocks and, and trying to figure out you know where we wanted uh, the council chambers to be and what the lobby should be, that kind of led into that conversation. Even even when thinking about the lobby of the building, we thought about how that would go behind to that retail space and open up. So even our employees, if they wanted to go downtown um, to have lunch or whatever. They were kind of directed that way, whereas now you kind of go through the blocks and such. Yeah. So, and then that with the lobby connected from that retail space all the way through the building down to the down to the municipal yeah. lawn. You can see this concept yeah. here was doing that. This was ultimately not selected. This is kind of where we ended up. Uh, this is pretty close. And that red space there is that lobby area yeah. that yeah. kind of drove the, the connection. Oh, look, this is your entry sequence, right? Yeah, yeah. and this area right here, like mm -hmm. providing that. Oh, yeah, and I forgot yeah. to mention that. We were breaking through. that urban edge so that people could go straight through the front. We also talked about having some sort of linear element to, to the library. Mm -hmm. um, may not be direct because there's multiple properties between us, but there, there's different elements to this that have a, a uh, linear aspect to the library. Yeah, so Try to provide option. that connectivity. You have that. Yeah. Right, so here's, here's the library. Yeah. Right, and there's the...
So Mulberry is still a great address uh, mm -hmm. for your civic uses, but then ultimately we think building a lifestyle connector on Crockett would catalyze other lifestyle uses. Look, it's a given. Whenever you've got a county courthouse, you're going to have bail bonds, right? That's where the attorneys are going to be because it's close. But if you could use them as a sort of anchor tenants to catalyze along with what you're doing here, there's a good chance you could, you could see yourself over the next 10 or 20 years revitalizing all of this. So, <clears throat> Barry, let me ask you this. When we go to different cities, we see, you know, scooters, bicycle rentals, you know, a few of us have had bad experiences on those scooters, but... <laughs> Um, that being said, would this create a, a situation where we could, in fact, put in some trails or some bike paths or, yeah. you know, something like that? And you need to be strategic about it. Yeah. yeah. Here, let, me, let me interject a little bit and um, kind of tie these things together. So, um, our, our goal as a staff... Uh, through these past few months has been to get to this point where we have enough, uh, you know, 30,000 foot level programming and thinking about um, City Hall and not just uh, confined to City Hall as office space, but really at all the things that we've talked about today. Um, if there's appetite on the City Council's uh, part to consider um, what would be next steps in City Hall, which would be a, a, uh, a formal design um, and some, you know, architecture work. I think it would be valuable that we spend some money to do some planning that is more uh, broad for the entire kind of downtown area. And you guys have told me uh, in the past downtown is a priority. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we want it to be a destination. We want it to be more than just, you know, government offices. And so, to me, um, having that plan and making sure that that plan fits in with our potential plan for City Hall would be meaningful. Um, but I don't want to go down that path if there's, um, you know, if there's not uh, support to, to look at City Hall stuff. What I would say about um, City Hall that I think you guys would may need to know um, as a decision point moving forward is um, I, I would I would want to bring back a plan that includes um, here's what the scope of City Hall would be here's we already have an, a, a rough estimate right it's it's uh, depending on size. It's somewhere in you know the thirty thousand, thirty million, not thousand. If it's thirty thousand, let's sign up right now. Um, depending on square footage and depending on the input uh, we've gotten from uh, CMAR and from Burn, and it's it's actually good uh, good info because we've cross referenced that with um, the project we're going to talk about next, the fire station, about new what what are the new values. Um, a, a very kind of ba bare bones today, post COVID, starting in 23, starting in 24, is somewhere in that 600 bucks a foot. How well you want to finish it out is you go up from there. That's right. So, so somewhere, if I said 30 to 40 million, I'm in the range. Uh, my, there's more discussion to be had. Number one, do we want to move forward? Number two, if so, what? What are we comfortable with uh, in terms of finish out? And then we would, uh, as a staff, work on the space needs because the space needs right now is is 50,000. I can tell you right now, my sense is it's probably going to be less than that, 50,000 square feet. The building we're in right now is uh, 14,000 square feet. And so um, somewhere between 14 and 50 is where we're land. And I'm just saying, I. I think it's uh, I think it's more in the forty to forty five thousand square feet, not fifty, and not thirty, and so um, we can use that as a proxy. Uh, the other thing I'd say is, um, while we're not asking for approval today to go issue bonds to build the city hall, 
um, we would want, if there's an appetite to bring it forward, and you want to set some parameters like, hey, um, City Hall, it's got to be functional, it's got to be the right amount of nice. Uh, we don't want it to be a burden on taxpayers. So if you, if you guys say, hey, if you can bring back a plan that doesn't involve uh, a future, uh, you know, a burden on the taxpayer. So if, if whatever we set the rate at this year, if future rates aren't more than that, and you guys want to say, hey, if you can do it within our current rates, have at it. Uh, we would still bring back more discussion, but I would like to, I mean, this, this meeting is the time for us to get to a, a, a go or no go decision on the next steps. And the next steps isn't construction of one, it's design of one. And so um, I'd, I'd like there to be some, and we can, we can dive into the, uh, I mean, th these are very rough scale numbers, but we have Burn here who has like up to date I mean, they're in the business. They know what things cost today. Um, if we want to have a, a discussion about cost, we can do that. It, it may be a little bit preliminary, other than to say it's, it's a range, and that 30, that 30 to 35 to 40 million is probably the range, depending on size, um, and finish out. Um, is, there, is there appetite to take next steps? Um, so maybe pause here and have some discussion on that. So um, I think more than talking about a building, at this point we're talking about a campus, really. Correct. Um, I think we need to give a little more clarification for what is going to be the disposition of the municipal building in Kid Key, because what are we going to use that for? And on the other side, you've got... The old football stadium, ISD spending forty million on a new football stadium. What's the disposition of that? Like, how much space mm -hmm. outside of just the building um, is going to be available, and what's it going to be used for? Plus, all of the stuff we own uh, coming back to the south. Um, so, I, I think it's more than just saying, "Hey, do you want to pay for this building?" Uh, if we build a building and it's going to be a campus, I think having at least some preliminary idea of the bigger campus writ large and like the mayor was talking about how that leads to development of downtown, I don't know if necessarily those two things are enmeshed in the same conversation. And I don't, I'm not trying to muddy the waters yeah, here. No, but I, I, I think I, they are. I don't, um, I don't want to say... Yeah, go on this, and then we go on this, and then the ISD says, oh, yeah, yeah, we're selling our football stadium to a multifamily developer. Or, you know, oh, it turns out we need a municipal building, and it's going to be in the way of this or that. And I don't want to miss an opportunity, because we're not going to do this again, hopefully, for 30 or 40 years, right? Yeah, so, at least. Um, well, <clears throat> and I think that gives a lot of a lot of weight to what Robbie's suggesting. Let's go ahead and take the next step. And let's reach out to the ISD. <laughs> and at least we'll have, you Wait, know, to, who? to the ISD. Oh, to the ISD. Yeah, yeah. ISD. To, well, I thought you said the ISD. No, yeah. to the what? ISD. Wait, hold on. Let's reach out to uh, <laughs> now. now, because the information I have is that they're going to continue to use the stadium for middle school games and freshman games. So yeah. let's confirm that. And then if we take the next step, we'll have something to, to really look at and... Uh, so you know, answer, are, answer some of these questions. Yeah, but so are you wanting, uh, I mean, this is kind of bleeding into the idea that we're doing a, at least a broad stroke master plan for yeah. downtown? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so uh, that's going to take months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it, so is the direction then it's not a no on City Hall. It's a let's not make a decision on moving forward with the City Hall until we have a plan for what that might look like well, overall downtown. Well, I mean, look, I think I don't I don't have a problem moving forward with uh, planning the building and getting more granular and what the building is going to be and starting that design process. But I don't want to start the design process and as we're 80% through design, not know what 
the surrounding areas what their ultimate disposition is going to be. Yeah. So I would say if you want to move forward with design, it needs to be at least simultaneously moving forward with answering those questions and developing a, a master plan. Okay. And, so and like a mini master plan. Questions. Like a mini master plan. Like a mini, you know, just yeah. Because there, I mean, look, we, there's a ton of property that we own out there, and there's a ton of question marks with yeah, all so, of these green. So Kid Key would still be used uh, for municipal building. Would yeah. it still be municipal, like water? Uh, mm -hmm. IT would likely courts. still be there. Courts, courts, courts. would still be there. Yeah, uh, so some of the offices, other offices, would likely move. Finance, HR. Uh, Let's leave Nate over there, though. He doesn't need it. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. At least get him a foosball table. Yeah, yeah, right. that's true. <laughs> he can but to, out. Your, to your point, there's other things going on in that whole, all the way over to 75. I mean, we're talking about possibly putting uh, parking and parks underneath the 2,000 foot long or yeah. however long that is uh, and structure underneath. Yeah. Well, and so how does all that tie in? Yeah, it, it, it's going to be the crown. It's going to be the, the jewel in the crown. I, I, I get that. I'm also interested in, in the crown. So to speak. Yeah. You don't so, want well, to be offset now. <laughs> that's right. And that's a good point because, Kim, if we say, okay, that area under 75 is now a city park, that leaves more opportunity to, you know, for trails and other things where, mm -hmm. where the overall goal is to, to link our parks with trails and bike paths and things for our citizens anyway. Yeah, and everything directly east of the municipal lawn that they sort of use for interest and egress for all the high school football stuff, well, maybe they don't need that anymore. And then, yeah, I would say they wouldn't. Yeah, what, what, what can we do with all that? Now we have all this parking going to the south all the way to Lamar, like, Okay, well, there, there seems to be a lot of meat on this bone. I, again, not trying to muddy the waters. I, the building is the building, and that's important. But I think if we're going to do it, let's just do it once. And But it does go back to the vision of this. The intent of this and our, our intent wasn't that this is just a municipal building yeah. that, that houses people 8 to 5. Right. But it's a part of a bigger picture of downtown. Right. So, Robbie, yeah. another thing that I was kind of curious to see, and I don't think we touched on this much, was when we originally... Um, contracted with you guys. I think some of our expectation was to see what we currently have now, what the options may be, but also, um, you know, we have square footage in downtown, we have square footage at City Hall, and you know, wh like what is our immediate plan if we have to build a City Hall, if we don't have to build a City Hall, it was kind of a judging uh, whether there was this immediate need for this. And so I know we didn't dive into that, and I'm sure you're still working on that. Uh, but we would certainly probably like to see uh, what is our demand for a city hall. And then we know that until year 2029, we've got big demands on all of our funds. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, is it going to be possible for us uh, right. or not right now? I mean, I don't know, but I'm just saying I like the concept of the downtown campus. I like the concept of the city hall campus. I love that. Um, I don't think that there's a problem with investigating that more, maybe doing a thorough, thorough study. Um, but uh, I'm real curious to see. I mean, we've got 18,000, 18,000, some people 14. 14,000 square feet. Uh, I'm talking about the old police station. Uh oh. Um, How much? 20? 14. 14. So between the two, we've got, you know, 28,000 square feet. Um, does that buy us time? Does that, yeah. you know, uh, does that get us to 2029? I mean, there's just a lot of questions that I'd be curious to know uh, before we make a major financial commitment um, sure. this year. I'm not saying it's a no, I'm just saying yeah. there's a, the, the, the needs assessment, uh, I haven't seen that portion of it yet. Yeah. And no, so I'm, I'm real curious. Part, because I think also in that, along with your master plan, you're building a sequence. Because mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to have to put people out of this building at some point just to rebuild it. So I think building a kind of a decanting sequencing plan is part of what we can do. Let me just say this, though. I, I, I do think you have some really important urban components already as assets. And as we looked around and walked around your downtown area, there's nothing in the world wrong with this site, and there's a lot of good things about it. Uh, there's two philosophies. There's two schools of thought for city halls. You can build them on the freeway, which are easy to get to, or you can embed them in your cities generate value around them. Uh, Richardson's a good example of whose city hall is right there on the freeway. What is that, 75 and around? And there's really nothing of value around it because nobody wants to be there. 
Whereas you're inland from the freeway and you kind of built a catalyst here with this park. And this park is more important than you might even think because it sets up a really cool place. And then if you could lace around that and, and strengthen this with food and beverage and lifestyle amenities and maybe even start to layer in mixed income, not mixed income, mixed residential, sorry, that's another thing. Mixed residential in these areas that, that further reinforce this downtown core, you've really begun to generate appraised values at that point in your downtown area. So there might be some other lands that are possibly more accessible, but they won't generate as much value. So the city hall, think of that as a catalyst for other redevelopment. What cities have the city hall campus like you're suggesting here? McKinney? Are they close to their downtown? McKinney is kind of doing that. Wow. And they've got some walkability around it. Rick Plano has not really capitalized on their inland city hall. Farmers Branch. Farmers Branch is a great example. And they're building a fantastic walkable village around it. Their, their vision, we just finished a special area plan for Farmers Branch. They have a super cool walkable village planned around their city hall. Farmers Ranch is a great example. Grapevine have had that as well. Grapevine has that. Unless the city hall is 42,000 square feet. <laughs> and Richardson's actually going to rebuild their city hall. I'm going to say this as a resident of Richardson. They're going to build it in the same place. So they're not doing anything to enhance the property values around it. They're just tearing down what they had. They can't do it in five. That's one for But I think that's a school of it's kind of a it's, it's a philosophy that maybe you as leaders need to get your arms around how you want your city hall to function in your city from a real estate perspective. And, and we can help you with that. We can bring real estate analysts to the title to really crank through that really fast. Kevin's team is really good at stuff like that. So I think I, I think the takeaways maybe are um, more information. Yeah. So a more um, a, a more um, a broader look, uh, expanding out the look uh, of what role City Hall would play in the city, in, in the municipal campus, which then plays in the overall downtown, combined with plans for, okay, well, here's the timing of uh, what that would look like, here's what the current space is, here's what phasing of that space could look like uh, if we did it now, if we waited for three years or five years and here's how the space could be utilized that we do have old PD existing um, City Hall um, and then bring that back yeah. uh, for more discussion when they did the police department that, that original time they gave us a zero option a option of you know we put in pillars and block off the, the parking underneath it and they gave us here's the, the 3.5 million dollar option right and we got the kind of yeah. You know, flush through all that. But given that, hey, if you don't do anything now, you take over the PD, here's what you got, this is your space limitations or whatever. Right. If you do something now and you want to go Taj Mahal, it's 600 bucks a square foot. Maybe that's not Taj Mahal. If you, uh, you know, there was a, I sent you uh, some, uh, and, and you should share that with council. I sent you a recent city hall that was just completed like last month. Yeah. Um, and it was similar to this in scope and style, a lot smaller. But it was like three hundred fifty dollars a square foot, which was substantially less um, money. But it was not—I mean, there was probably some elements to it that weren't near as uh, elaborate, you know. Um, but uh, you know, just all the options for us of what is the, what are all of our options, and why do we need it? Because right. you know, I understand we need it, but gotcha. but I'd like to see why, so we can explain that to the citizens when they say, "Hey, this is costing the city three million dollars a year." Sure. Um, you know, why did y'all have to do that? Yeah. You know. Gotcha. Yeah, and for me, the concepts that you guys showed, I love. I think they're great. I can't wait to be up on that terrace and watch hot summer nights. You know, mm -hmm. um, that seems. The discussion. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, I was just out there and I was thinking, boy, that pavilion really needs to be over there at the bottom yeah. instead of halfway up this hill. Um, so I, I really like the direction that you're going in. I think that we need to keep City Hall where it is um, because it is such a benefit to downtown. Um, so I, I'm, I'm okay with with going in more on design, but like I said, I, I really would like to see more holistically 
and considering all of the areas around there and just nailing down what's it going to be and how can we best fit this for that. You know, Josh, maybe we just fast track the pavilion piece today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Approved. So, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> and, look, and, and for my money, you don't even need that walking yeah. trail. It can be grass all the way up to the building. For Go ahead and put so, the pillars in, too. So from what I'm hearing, Council, we're asking for two things. Number one, yes, do the next step so we have something more defined as far as design and also task uh, Gensler with looking at like a mini master plan for our immediate area. Is that kind of yes, sir. Okay. That, yeah. that would be my yeah. take. Tying up the existing downtown and its elements to this campus and probably going all the way over to 75 and, you know, so that's getting with the school. Yeah. So. What that'll do is it'll give you a vision. When people show up and say, hey, what do you want to do here? You've got something on the shelf you can show. Yeah. And that's, that becomes very powerful if you have a vision. You know, we always say, if you don't set a deadline, you should never work. Or if you don't set a goal, you'll never get there. So if you have something like that on the shelf that your development services people can work with, it becomes a very powerful. Yeah. And it's quick and relatively inexpensive. Yeah. So we're going to do what Sean said as well. We're going to get. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we would bring. My, my oh, thought is we would just bring all of that back at one time. Yep. Yeah. Um, so my, to put you on the spot here, is that a, um, when could you have that? Visioning and kind of a draft, draft master plan? a presentable draft of a master plan oh, for yeah. all of that. A draft? I think we could be back with something in a month or two and wrap it up. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll ask her September first. Does that sound good? Okay, you tell my husband. <laughs> Robbie, I think yeah. something we want to talk about scope too, because we've seen a couple of them, mm -hmm. and we've gone back and forth yeah. on the scope of what that looks yeah. like and narrowed it down to. To just this, yeah, because uh, we started with looking at the CBD as a whole, right? As our scope narrowed it down to just that block, yeah. And so, what scope do we want? Just uh, the northwest CBD, how about that? Yeah, I'm so, good with, well, I mean, you, you <laughs> well, tell, we, we have to us. consider downtown just overall, yeah. but then we are, we're, we're not trying to programmatically plan the entire CBD. No, no, no. We're really yeah. just right. saying, hey, if we start at the square and work our way north and west yeah. and go yeah. over to 75 and then include all of those. Yeah. Yeah. So my recommendation, be something like that. My recommendation yeah. is um, yeah. actually going to further out to the <laughs> no, CBD, but then, like, to your point, you hone in onto those catalyst sites. Because you're not, everything's not going to happen all at once. Right, sure. But you identify those key areas, and it will likely be here. Yeah. But once we start doing our investigation, our analysis, and, you know, again, high levels, eyes looking at a map. You know, we, we, this is not, this was just two, two minutes of, sure. of research versus us going, really diving in to see what are the economic drivers here, you know, uh, population counts, all that stuff that will really dictate kind of what we would then recommend for catalyst sites, right. key strategies, you know, if this site is ideal for X, Y, the use, I mean, I assume there's a downtown zoning which embodies a we need to look at that. So. Right. So let me share a couple of terms of lingo just so you know these going forward. So we're going to do, and Clint and I were just drawing here just loosely. So you're actually, and we can come back with you, to you with a recommendation. Your downtown master plan will be something like this, but almost, I don't want to say this, don't write this down almost gratis, we're going to look at all of this yeah. as what we call area of consideration. It may, may or may not end up with a master plan part of it, but to Kim's point, we've got to look at real estate values really all the way the off the page here. Mm -hmm. And, and look at growth potential, it. where your appraisal value potential is, because there may be a nugget or a little treasure out there that nobody's thought about. Uh, ultimately, this right here is an untapped jewel for you. Uh, it's actually working pretty well, but if you really reinvested in this, it would start to spread through all of this. And if you drove this catalyst down here, it would cement. And that's why I think Tim and I instinctively are saying, this needs to be your downtown master plan. These blocks right here, what is that, 14, 16 blocks? And then all of this, even off the page, will be what we call area of consideration. Okay. So. Uh, we'll start. We'll start at two weeks, and we'll move up. <laughs> two weeks. You definitely higher. Two weeks. Two a weeks. month. At least a two, month. Two months. 
I mean, it really depends so on you're talking the final product or I'm yeah. talking about a draft enough to yeah. come back to them to have an yeah. idea uh, of a decision to move forward or not on, yeah. Two months or less. Okay. Well, we can come back. And I'm going to counter you and say, <laughs> are we doing any sort of, like, steering committee to help us uh, guide decisions? Uh, um, and there are a lot of owners here. We'll sure. We'll be talking yes. to any strategic owner. I would say we leave that um, as an open item for now. We, we don't talk to anybody you don't tell us to. And, and, and it's not about uh, we want to keep it to ourselves, but let's, I, I'd like to have some more kind of discussion on the scoping. Sure. Yes. Uh, because they're probably not as interested in, well, this property owner says that he's willing to sell, and, you know, it's not. Oh, he is? Right. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's more, it's more really? conceptual, certainly more conceptual. That, that, in, in that's nature. important. And so I, I think that's, I think that's the concept. I mean, there's going to be more uh, significant, more investment right down here soon. Yeah. And we need to know those things if we can. Do you think there are things about the pot? We need to know that. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. You know, really, what this would amount to is us moving the core of downtown over, I think. You're sort of shifting all. the episode. Yeah. We, we are. And, and that's what I want the council to understand is that we're, this whole complex is, you know, not only does it reflect our new status with Global Wafers and TI and, you know, all the other companies coming in as, you know, a you know, high-tech manufacturing center um, of Texas, not only that, but also, you know, with our friends at the county investing, continuing to invest in the jail, I think we have an opportunity here to move our the center of downtown over and do it with, um, you know, have something of substance mm -hmm. that people can go down there and enjoy the space. Yeah. Well, and it's not bordered on two sides by a state highway that you can never right. shut down. You're, That's right. You're we can offsetting, and, and, offsetting the center, right? The yeah. center's not in the courthouse anymore. Yeah. It's exactly, yeah. exactly. See, that was a comment. Still be that was a comment in the last South. County and Zoning Commission meeting yes. about the county's investments. Is that maybe we just need to move the downtown? Is yeah. one of the comments that was shared in that meeting. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and this is a great way to do that. Yeah. Plus, just find another place in CBD with this much open space around it to begin with. I mean, this might really be the only option to do that, yeah. period, full stop. Well, yeah, you know, I think what we want to recommend to you is other uses that need to be activated in mixed residential capital. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. I think we've got uh, marching orders from here. And we'll be getting back with you guys uh, on scoping yeah, and whatnot. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Any other questions uh, on this subject right now? All right. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you very much. Um, any, we, we doing okay? We want to keep marching on? Anybody need a five-minute break? I think we're done with the 15-minute breaks, by the way. So we're, we're down to five-minute breaks, uh, maybe seven. Um, so let's go, yeah, let's go public safety now. Um, Robin, you want to start off with this Let's go, no, let's go <coughs> slide probably 118. Yeah, I'm going to get some Yeah, see what you're saying. Yeah, will you grab me one? Okay. Hey, it's coming. You better start getting the coffee. Oh, it is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait. Uh. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it does. Uh, oh, this isn't me. This is, uh, this will be, this will be Jason. Okay, well, we'll take a five minute break. <laughs> <laughs> they thought that you said five minute break. That's yeah.
Jason's going to kick us off on public safety. Here we go. Well, I will let you know first off, I am not asking for anything like the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. Inside your building. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to start off with a few accomplishments we've had over the, the past year. Um, so as, as you know, we're we moving to our new, new headquarters. We're very gracious for it. Uh, it's worked out really well for us. Uh, we received our uh, reaccreditation with uh, TPCA last year. Uh, Y'all saw us get the uh, award there at City Council. Uh, we've been able to increase our patrol officers per shift, uh, which we think been able to increase our staffing levels, which has been a big, big help for us as well. Um, a big number that we had um, from January of last year to January of this year is we were able to drop our crime rate significantly. Uh, and that's the total crime rate, which includes uh, violent crime and property crime. Uh, we dropped it from uh, 1.73 per thousand to 1.15 per thousand residents, which is really, really good. And for the fourth and second year, our overtime uh, costs have remained up under budget. And we're grateful for that. Yes. You get a gold star. Uh, so we'll talk uh, today some of our, our goals or a market adjustment uh, for our staff. Uh, talk about replacing some of our weapon systems, lethal and non-lethal. And uh, also uh, becoming fully staffed and retaining our staff. And we'll want to also increase some of our community events, which we've already started to do. Uh, coming up in, in July, we have our Youth Police Academy. Uh, it's going to be a week-long event. It's going to be the first time we've done that. Uh, we're really trying to push that out. So if you get any getting momentum and you can push that out for us. Uh, we haven't had a real big success rate with it yet, but we would like to have a lot of youth come in. Uh, we also have some uh, animal shelter events that we're going to continue with. Uh, had some good luck with those last year as well. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. What are the ages on the youth? Uh, 12 to 17, I believe. 13. 13, 13 to 17, that's right. So as you know, uh, back in 2021, we took over the animal shelter. It was a dumpster fire uh, back then. Uh, since then, it's really uh, improved drastically. Um, just some of the numbers that they've done last year, uh, which is pretty big numbers, uh, almost 1,000 animals that they adopted out, uh, rescued 331 dogs. Uh, they responded to almost 3,000 calls for service, which is quite a few calls for those people down there, over 1,000 meters. And now everyone is issued with a, a body cam, so they, it, it ties into our system here at the police department, and we're able to view any type of uh, complaint if they get or anything like that. Some of the things that they've done, uh, if you've ever been down to Animal Shelter, this building here uh, was rebuilt recently. It used to be just an old dilapidated uh, metal building uh, that was full of rats, and it was really horrible. Uh, so we're able to get that done. We still have a little bit more work to do on it. We've got to add electricity, and we'll be able to outfit that completely. Uh, we're able to uh, redo our website. This is just a screenshot. Peter, can you click on that link for me if you don't mind? So it's, it's really uh, a friendly uh, website. Uh, gives information. You can click on it, and it, uh, you go to the adoption link, and it'll show available animals that are available currently if you want to go down and, and adopt an animal. I uh, just get some fees and things like that, but it's really a, a friendly um, website. I think that they did a real good job on that website. But add that that was built internally. It was. And that the, uh, not that we're there yet, I'll say that we're investigating the, the look and feel as the city's internet presence moving forward. We haven't done it. We haven't went into a contract with anybody to do that. But we're looking at it, Nick and I specifically are looking at uh, unity among our website presence as a city, consistent with something similar to that, something that can yeah. fresh, this easy to see. off of the police department's right. website, which is yeah. also very user friendly. Not that we would be able to do that internally. That would be a large overhaul, but. Just to let you know that we're we're looking at looking at that. How often do y'all update this? Uh, as far as the animals that are available, mm -hmm. it's immediate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple there, like we talked about their community event. They had the uh, clear the shelter event in August of 2022. Uh, the almost 150 animals uh, were adopted, and then they also had the C cap event, which uh, they came up and we did free rabies shots and also did some micro chips. Uh, that was all sponsored through them. The city wasn't out any money. Uh, 
Uh, some of our uh, move to the police department issues and kind of what we're at. Um, some of our, our sworn staff numbers uh, we currently have 78 uh, funded positions. As of today, we have four openings. Um, since January of 2022, uh, we were down quite a few officers. Uh, we've been able to through, uh, hire 15 officers. Uh, two of those were through the lateral transfer program that y'all approved. Uh, we were able to snag one from Prosper and one from another agency in the Metroplex. So uh, we did have a little bit of success with that. The last test, uh, we didn't have any success with it, uh, but we were fortunate to get those two officers and they were able to hit the streets really quick, which helped us out quite a bit. Um, which plays into our officers per shift. Um, back in 2022, we had 6.25 officers per shift, which is not very many. Uh, we have been able to talk with probably and increase those numbers. And, through our, our pay and, and lateral program, we're able to up to 7.6 officers per shift, which will play into some numbers that we'll look at in just a minute, I believe. Uh, we also conducted a, another staffing survey. We've done one back in 2021, is that correct? We did another one in 2023 after the TI, uh, to kind of include the TI effect in that. So over the next five years, we will start have to increase our staffing numbers just to keep the, the level of service that we offer our citizens. Uh, some crime data. Um, so this is a big number for me. Um, January 2022 to 2023, 33% uh, decrease in crime rate. Um, we have started to see a little bit uptick uh, in the crime rate again this year, but for that one year for sure, we definitely had a 33% decrease in crime. Uh, last month, uh, we averaged, or we averaged about 3,200 calls for service. Last month, as you can see right here, we have our 3,700, over 3,700 calls for service, which is the most we've ever had as a police force since we've been tracking numbers, which is, is a, a lot of calls. So I think that plays into the number of officers we have per shift. We're able to keep that, the, the uh, calls, call times down low because of the number of officers that we have. Um, our priority calls, it's just our priority calls for service under six minutes response time. The national average is about 10 minutes, so we're, we're well under the, the national average. Um, any questions about the, the crime rate or, or call for service rate? Um, do you know, it, like generally speaking, does, uh, is there ebb and flow to the numbers? So I, I noticed there's a, um, between January and June or July, it kind of peaks and then it goes back and then I notice our, this is start, This is yeah. kind of following the same so trend. Yeah, usually the summer months are our busy months. Okay. Uh, doubt. In, in the wintertime, not as many people are out, so we don't have as many calls, uh, not as many wrecks, things like that. Gotcha. Uh, so that's kind of where that So we would have expected the numbers to go up some. True, sure. yes. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Jason, it's kind of interesting to me. It went from January 22 to 20, 2,900 calls. In January and 23, the calls went up by three or 400. But your number of crimes went down. That's correct. So it's like we were getting calls for things that weren't really crimes. Yeah, we, we, we do get a lot of calls um, for citizens, you know, uh, various things that we don't, there aren't reportable offenses. It's just they are time consuming for officers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also end up with vehicle accidents and things like that that aren't criminal in nature. Oh. And there, there are things. Yeah, that, like wrecks on 75. Highway yeah. 75. Yeah. yeah. There's a 25% there's, there's reduction when I heard the call. call. Yeah. <laughs> that really was last that. Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, is that based on uh, divers? This is UCR not, part yes. one, it is. essentially. So That's correct. there are other things that are crimes that don't fit mm. the formula for what that. That's correct. Gotcha. Right? That's correct. Okay. So some of our asks this year, um, we do have to redo our non-lethal and lethal weapon systems. Uh, first, is, uh, we'll talk about is our, our taser program, uh, where it has basically a five-year life cycle, uh, where they'll warranty that they, they won't back their product any, any longer, so they're, they're proprietary. Um, so we're, that's where we are now this year, that we need to start replacing everyone for the department. We've done typically five to seven uh, tasers per year to replace, but this year I think it's time that we get on their lease to own program. Uh, so that's what this is. And we'll be able to replace every officer, uh, current officer and officers that don't have a taser currently, because there's a, probably about uh, 25 officers in the department that don't have a, a taser. We'll be able to outfit the whole department uh, with a taser. <coughs> It also includes the cartridges, which is the expensive piece, as well as the training. Uh, we will not have to pay to send officers to get trained or get trained to train or things like that. That's included in it. So it, it's a five-year program. Uh, it's about 
$22,000. It averages about $67,000 a year. Uh, and then that could go up depending if we add officers and, and things like that. Chief, are we tracking our taser deployments? We do. We okay. track. Um, I can't give you the number. Okay. It's low. It's very okay. low. Uh, moving into our lethal weapons, um, we'll talk about patrol rifles first. As you know, uh, kind of the events in Allen, uh, they, they are they hit home. Uh, we do most of our patrol officers. Let me say that you know, all of our patrol officers are equipped with patrol rifles. Uh, most of them are getting old. Uh, some of them are approaching close to 20 years old. Uh, they don't make the parts for the rifles that we have anymore. So we're looking forward to moving forward with replacing all those and making sure every officer is outfitted with a patrol rifle. Um, we're looking at uh, replacing 80 rifles at about 161,000. These are all things that are in the budget, by the way. These aren't asked, so they're baked, they're baked into the numbers that you're going to see here in just a little bit. Uh, moving into the Henry, do you have a yeah, I got a question. I'm sorry. Uh, what happened with the with the old rifles? Right. So we will trade those in. And to okay. get credit as well, uh, okay. and that's kind of the way that we'll work it out. Okay. Uh, so we get a little bit of credit from the manufacturer as we trade those in. All right. uh, same thing with the handguns, we'll do the same process uh, trading those in. Uh, they're along the same lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've also moved to this style of uh, Glock that has a uh, timing system. Uh, it's a, it allows the officer to be more accurate, uh, to come on to a phone target a lot quicker. And we'll also help get every officer with a, a lighting system as well. Uh, so we'll redo the whole department. We've slowly been doing that for the last two years, but we'd like to just jump off and get it done. Uh, we'd like about half of the department to get outfitted, uh, and that will complete this, and it's about 67000 So moving, talk about market adjustments. Uh, we've been very fortunate. Uh, Y'all have uh, given us the adjustments in the past. Uh, unfortunately, we have fallen behind. Again, uh, even some local agencies we've fallen behind them. Uh, I would like to uh, get up to that level again, be the, the premier law enforcement agency in Grayson County for sure. Um, yeah, let me let me take a couple of these, okay. uh, Jason, too. So uh, I work with uh, Jason and Billy and Zach on these issues for both police and fire. And, we do this uh, exercise really for all city employee positions every year. We use our um, now what is our 10th annual um, peer survey, I think, um, with uh, peer cities. Uh, occasionally, we um, also include other data points that aren't in those peers. Uh, peer cities are cities that are about our size, uh, that are similarly um, maybe uh, located uh, compared to the Metroplex. So some outlying cities and some other things. We also put Denison in there and Texarkana. Um, Denison because of their proximity, Texarkana because of their size, Huntsville, some others. But um, our goal for all of our pay, uh, for all of our employees is to kind of be in that top, um, you know, that top third of this range of about 10 cities. Um, so we do that every year, police and fire no exception, uh, but there are other considerations for police and fire that kind of come into play, which is the second bullet point there, falling behind some local agencies. Uh, you know, the, the, the basis for the request then for this is both that peer city uh, survey results and us just needing to be competitive with Cities that are smaller, but that are in our same pool. Right. Denison, Anna, ben Alstein. ben Alstein, Melissa. Um, you know, you could go over uh, to Salina and, and talk about that as well. But And those those folks are trying to do their best to keep up with folks that are closest to them. So our goal isn't to, um, you know, isn't to be the highest paid uh, department or city is to be uh, fair with our employees, number one. Number two, you know, we're not going to be able to complete, compete right now with the uh, Frisco's and McKinney's of the world. They're, they're probably, you know, 10 to 15 percent higher than, um, in most positions. Um, so, but it was important to me uh, for public safety as we look at kind of some 
other issues, uh, other data points to make kind of a big swing at the fence on this one. Um, usually, annually, just to keep up, it's somewhere in that 6% range, 6 and a half. Um, and if you look over our, our history, uh, that's what it's been the last several years. This one, uh, there just needed to be more than usual. Uh, so it wasn't arbitrary. Uh, and we didn't, it's not across the board either. It's not, hey, let's just give everybody an 8% raise. We went rank by rank, position by position. What does it need to be uh, to be competitive with our peers? And so uh, I did want to put some financial boundaries around what the total impact was just so that it, it's, you know, um, affordable. And so uh, we ended up same place, uh, about 8% overall for police, about 8% overall for fire. Um, and uh, every, every, every step, every rank um, is adjusted uh, according to their own individual needs. You also might be uh, reminded that um, it's really kind of the only departments, I think, in the city that have um, planned step increases based on your tenure, right? So if you start out as a police officer, you start out as entry level, and after one year, you get another step increase. Two years, you get another. And so patrolman has, I think now seven? Seven, seven steps. <coughs> Move up to corporal, well, not corporal, because we're doing away with those. Eventually. Eventually. Uh, so corporal, each rank has that own, their, that own system. However, the higher the ranks, uh, we don't have seven steps in corporal three and sergeant and lieutenant. There's three in each of those, I believe. So they have kind of built-in um, increases in pay just by the passage of time. Um, and then they also get these market adjustments, which are really just keeping us on par with our other where we need to be there. So that, that was kind of the, uh, that's kind of the, the pitch there, and that also covers the first slide for the fire department. Uh, so I'm, I won't make that spiel again, but that was our methodology. It's kind of interesting. I had these guys uh, do their own. They did their own um, calculations and survey. Um, unbeknownst to them, I had already done mine. Um, and it was amazingly close. Um, I mean, there were a few tweaks. Uh, particularly in some of the higher ranks because of uh, uh, capping adjustments and, and whatnot, but it was amazingly close to what they had kind of come up with uh, and were, were uh, suggesting as well. So I, that was just another kind of uh, Great validation. Minds. Great minds think alike. So yeah. do y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all I had. Do I have any questions? Uh, anything that I had? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Robbie just went over for the PD fire department. A lot of these uh, lines are going to look really similar. But it just shows that Robbie, uh, the same ideology. There is one item in here that I do want to park on for just a second, and it's that first bullet point. Um, in the past, we have um, we've had an incentive pay, uh, certification pay for paramedics, and um, and so uh, some of the some of the new hires that we make are not paramedics; they're EMTs, which is a, a basic level of training. Paramedics is an advanced level of training. Uh, so we've incentivized that, um, not through base pay, but through a certification pay. The structure that we're proposing, kind of this is behind the scenes, you know, you know we're not going to present the details here, but uh, behind the scenes, uh, what Chief recommended, I thought it was a, a great idea, is that for the firefighter ranks, uh, and remember for each rank there are numerous steps, for firefighter steps, I think there's seven of those as well. Five? Okay. Um, and based on the same passage of time. But now, 
um, on the entry level ranks. If a firefighter is coming in as an EMT, it's one base pay. If he's coming in, if that same firefighter c comes in with the same level of experience, but he's a paramedic and same certification, um, and new, it's a different, it's an increased level of pay. So we're building into their base pay. So you'll see a, uh, instead of seven, six or seven different categories under firefighter, there's 14. Firefighter uh, one EMT, firefighter one paramedic. Firefighter 2, EMT, Firefighter 2, Paramedic. So we're building that into the base and making that premium higher. Okay, so it's not that we it's not that we increased the paramedics more than we should have. We just didn't give the EMTs, uh, th they're not getting this 8% average overall. They're getting a much smaller um, piece, as, and that's part of our uh, how we're doing the incentives this year. So... Uh, that's that's what that first bullet point is about. Well, that retention specific pay increases. So we're, we're paying the employees we seek to retain our highest asset employees. Right. To, to be competitive in the market. Uh, since we've taken over, myself and my administration in February, um, we've asked for higher standards of professionalism. Uh, higher expectations of ourselves and all of our duties and the staff they have answered that call uh, we've empowered them with more responsibility and authority and uh, like always they are they are excelling at every call for service that they are on uh, those higher standards that also carried over in our hiring practices uh, just to touch on what we're doing in 2023 uh, the entire hiring process uh, I challenged them to raise the bar on what is a Sherman firefighter, and uh, they, they took it, and they're carrying it out. Um, you know, the council granted us eight new positions last year, and the slide later on, but we're going to fill those at these higher standards. Uh, it's going to be a great year. We could possibly hire 16 new positions of firefighters in Sherman. Um, an operational update on what we've done this year. So last year in 2022, we were still operating under the five fire station model uh, with four firefighters at each station. Uh, when you run five fire stations, you ideally would have a 20% call volume at each station. And as you can see, we had two stations that were over that 20% and three that were under. You really get to looking at efficiencies and how effectively we can do our job. And that kind of led us to some of the operational changes we did in 2023. So in January of 23, we combined stations one and two uh, through the 3,400 calls for service thus far in 2023. Uh, we see closer margins to that 25% now at four stations instead of five. Uh, station four on there, uh, that's the one right across the street that you can see. It's still below that 25% call volume. But if you take a look around, that's where all of our big construction is. So we don't have any doubt that that, that number will relate at some point. Okay, so what does it look like combining station one and two? Um, I want to take a minute and just stop right here and look at this. This is the heat map from the 3,400 calls of service that we've done in 2023. And each one of the numbers at station one, at station two, there's three, four down here, five. The red indicates a heavy incident count, and we can kind of give you addresses. Um, you know, that's that nursing home in 500 North 1417 right there. Uh, this area right here is 817 West Center, which is over at the center right there beside. So if you take a fire station and you draw a mile and a half circle around it, that's its response to Station two was inside of station one response district. And the same was true for one to two. So when you look at which one of those had uh, a more uh, robust call for service area, it was station one. 50% of station two's call area was out here. And uh, the calls for service heat map really drove us into some of the decisions we made. So one of the 
things we also are doing with that is we see how much better we serve our community by putting more resources right here at Station 1. And when we have these hot spots right here, just down the block, um, that's, that's better service for us to our community. Uh, the response times is also something we watch on a daily basis. There is a standard. In 2022, Station 1 had an average response time. The response time is from the time the call comes in to the time uh, the firefighters walk in the door, get on scene. So the average of all the ones they did in 2022, 7 minutes 53 seconds Station 1, 6 minutes 56 seconds for Station 2. Together, through these almost 3,400 calls for service, 7 minutes 11 seconds. still right there within our standard. But folks, I would also like to know that the station one times is also uh, during the time of 75 construction, where station one does not even have the Houston and Lamar roads to get to the west side of their call area. They are going to Washington and Center to get to part of their call district. Paramedic usage. Um, so we look at how many paramedics being our high asset employee uh, we can put on an ambulance to help out spreading that workload. Uh, by combining station one and two, we increase the ratio of paramedics per ambulance. Paramedics divided by shift, divided by how many ambulances we have. Uh, provides for a workload distribution. Uh, prevents burnout of those employees, it aids in retention, and increases the customer service of those that we provide those calls of service to. So, in 2022, five stations, four ambulances. We were at 1.46 paramedics per ambulance. By combining stations one and two, and we've hired a few more paramedics already this year, so there's two variables that move in that equation. Uh, we're up to 2.16 paramedics per ambulance in 2023. That's a ratio I'm going to bring up throughout the next few slides because 2023 we're going to be able to drive that number up even higher. So we've all talked about uh, the Station 1 rebuild and what that looks like. We're going to dive into that farther on. But uh, if it were approved to do the rebuild, what do we look like operationally? So Station 4 right across the street here, when it was built brand new in 2018, had six bedrooms. Right now, every day, there are six firefighters over there. There is not an empty bedroom over there. We often have um, brand new employees who are doing their FTO training, students who are riding out. Just when you have extra staff available that day, we do not have the availability to put anybody else at Station 4. <coughs> we would build an extra bedroom at Station 4. It would be step number one of the Station 1 rebuild. Um, the battalion chief, which houses at Station 1, after that bedroom is built, will move out to Station 4. The square footage for that bedroom is already inside that building. It's just being underutilized for different things. So, moving a wall, putting in a door, a little air conditioner duct, not bad. Uh, engine and Medic 81 that are currently at Central Wood. Uh, we're very fortunate we have, just happen to have an extra fire station. <laughs> they could relocate out to Station 2, and they would house there for about a year of the construction. So, and, you, and you see almost everything that's, that we're getting to at Station 1 is still inside that Station 2. Um, it's not ideal, but it's doable, but not ideal. Doable, but not ideal. Yeah. Short period of time. So last year we undertook, we hired on Hydell and Associates. They conducted a <coughs> facility survey of all the fire department buildings. They identified specific areas to address now and the plan to prepare our department for the next 10 years of operation. Um, they identified <coughs> current fire stations and identified future sites as the city grows. Uh, add additional bedroom to Station 4 now. Uh, renovation and add-on to Station 1. And then uh, 
when that project is complete, uh, we would start talking about a renovation and add-on to Station and Brewery, which is now 22 years old. So through its 50-year life cycle, about 20, 25 years, you do a renovation, get it up to date so we can finish out its life strong. Uh, some of the stuff y'all gave us last year in 2023, uh, y'all approved the eight additional firefighters. Those positions are set to be filled on July 5th of this year. Like I said, we raised the standards and we still were able to fill them. And we're excited about this class coming on. Uh, it should start July 5th. Uh, it'll further improve that paramedic per ambulance ratio, drive it up even farther. And uh, we also added a civilian uh, logistics position. We had sworn officers, sworn firefighters who were doing logistical stuff, counting supplies, filling orders, and stuff like that, stuff that could be better handled by a civilian. Uh, Mr. High has been awesome for our staff, freeing up chiefs to go do chief stuff instead of counting widgets. He's been great. Uh, Y'all also approved, as Robbie brought up earlier, uh, the ladder truck. Ordered it for sure in October. COVID, oh God, it'll be here spring of 2024. But uh, that's that's what it'll look like. Maybe a few other changes right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ti will be open for that. Yeah. <laughs> He said, T.I. will be open before the truck gets here. <laughs> Austin Commercial won't start building fire trucks. 440 days to build a vehicle. This should not be the industry standard. Uh, uh, ambulance, another, another ambulance. That's the one we took delivery on a few months ago. Y'all approved another one. We've ordered it. It should be here by the end of this year. Paramedic students. So, do we do we keep our old ambulances yes. or do we trade those in or we just add them to the fleet? We're, um, we cycle them through. Right now we own seven ambulances. We okay. run four front line because much like you, when you send your vehicle, an ambulance goes out and they send it to the Dodge House or the <coughs> service center and well, we order a part for it. It's going to take a month to get that part Medical calls don't stop coming in. Right. So we currently own seven uh, ambulances, and we do sell them once we get an extra. We'll get we a just, new one and cycle the old one. Yeah, we roll off the oldest or the worst in the fleet, right, as we, as we get there. There might be one that's a year older, but it's got less miles than the one above it. It was at Station 4 first life instead of at Station 5, so it's got less miles. Right. Uh, paramedic students. Um, when our staff took over, uh, it was a clear priority of Zach and Robbie that our paramedic, we needed more paramedics. So we have set about to get more paramedics. Uh, we have added four paramedics so far in 2023. We currently have six in paramedic school through this company called Percom which is funded by a house bill, a house bill that actually worked out for local government, and they reimburse our tuition 100%. Those firefighters stay on shift. So there's, there's probably at least one of them over there right now. We put a laptop in their hand, they go through paramedic school, and they make calls while they're there. We got six of them. Started in February, they're all over halfway done. They should be certified paramedics by September. We have six more starting in August. We got word yesterday their tuition was also 100% covered by that house bill. Mm -hmm. So six more. <coughs> four. How many were we getting the four each year? Did I jump again? No, you didn't. I didn't have a slide in here. But before the previous decade, we were probably averaging adding three to five paramedics per year. Wow. Um, 2023. Possible to add nine more, so you take those four or nine, that's 13 paramedics added to our staff in 2023. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. at, a, at a shorter uh, time to boots on the ground, counting towards our staffing. And right. still working. And still working. Yeah, still working. I mean, it's, it's, there's, 
holistically, it, it, it's more efficient over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robbie asked. Robbie challenged the staff, and they answered. And Mason gave y'all that update at the council meeting. And, uh, they've been on the go. So our 2024 request, uh, a fire truck. Oh. <laughs> what a shocker. <laughs> uh, this one's a little special, though. Remember that 440 day build time I talked about? Uh, we have an opportunity uh, to purchase a rescue pumper that's currently in production. Uh, it's set to arrive in January of 24. So the one you purchased in FY24 would get here before the one you purchased in FY23. Wow. What makes this truck special, although being a rescue pumper, uh, it would operate out of Central Fire Station with rescue capabilities. Um, went to fleet services and had talks with, with all those guys. There is a, a federal emission mandate that's coming up for 18-wheelers and big diesel trucks that starts very soon. Uh, that L9 motor up there, there's only probably 100, 100 of those left out there to go on fire trucks. We have the ability to buy one of those. I don't know if anybody knows diesel trucks, but you did not want to own a diesel truck the first or second year after they introduced DAF or put a big emission change. So this is our opportunity to buy these last L9 motors that fit in with our fleet, which is already tooled up for that engine. If you don't get that one, the next two years are going to have the newer model while they work out the bugs. Um, also, Chief Martin, he, he hit the brick front and, and he went and found this model, which is also three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, two. Yeah, close to three hundred thousand dollars. Close to three hundred thousand dollars cheaper than any other fire truck we could order right now. Because it's already been being built. And, and it's kind of like a, um, it, it's in production, so I mean it's not a custom build. And it fits our fleet. It's the same Spartan truck that's already in our fleet. Just called 10 people instead of one. We found this opportunity. Uh, other let, me, let me talk about that just a little bit, a little bit more just to, to speak to what your administration's done. To get that first large fire truck, that, that big ladder, it was more expensive than what we really wanted to stomach the last year. We worked with the staff and said, hey, the, this rescue truck that you've got sitting at the fire station, the station one, that's not manned, it can't run any water. The utilization on that and efficiency of it, man, that's not a, that doesn't seem like it, it's really doing what we need it to do all the time. If you sell that, we'll do this. We did it. They, they, they compromised and uh, were flexible, and they sold it. Not only did they sell it, they went and found the people to buy it. So... Um, we sent that, sent that off. So they've been working without it, making it work. This accomplishes both purposes. It carries the tools that they need, that the other one carried, that we sold, and it carries water. So it's, they, we've asked them to be more efficient with the things that they're using, and they're doing it. So I just wanted to brag on that real quick, that that... There's more to just that picture than just a fire truck that's in production. Yeah. It accomplishes multiple purposes for them that we've asked them to do. Ooh. Where would that truck go? New Jersey? No, where would it go uh, here in our fleet? Is oh, that this one would yeah. go at Central. It goes to Central. Mm -hmm. And the ladder goes here? And did, was there a push a, a year or two ago for equipping all of our trucks with ladders, or was that, is there a, did, we, did I remember that correctly or no? Um, some towns toy around with the, like the Quint model where every truck has. Yeah. But it's, you know, like Zach was saying, when you really do a utilization study on, on a fire truck, what do you need on each fire truck to get there? There, there is a difference between what a city who had one fire truck showed up with only one tri fire truck to a fire, what they need on that fire truck, and then a city like us who shows up with four fire trucks on every fire, and we can kind of diversify what those 
four trucks do. And, uh, yeah, makes sense. You know, when one fire truck shows up at a fire, you need 2,000 foot of fire hose on that one truck. But when four fire trucks show up, you can only put 1,000 foot of hose on each one. And then you have more compartment space to carry rescue tools because we do have a, a highway that has wrecks, industrial areas that need to be confined space, rescues in. Yeah. Um, and then an ambulance, just like I said, we refresh our fleet. Uh, an ambulance is seven, eight years old. By the time we flush it out of the fleet, we'll just keep cycling them through. Any questions about any of that? That's it? That's all you got? That's all you got. Oh, no. <laughs> Great. That's the warm-up. Yeah. That's the warm-up. Aaron, you don't even need an introduction, right? Okay. Uh, so, like I said, we, we uh, went with High and Associates. They did our 10-year facility master plan. Uh, that is available if you would like to see that. Uh, but, like I said, it shows the three uh, future sites that we would go into and what we need to do with our facilities uh, before the data tells us we need to build another fire station. Uh, so that is available upon request. We'll be in our offices. Uh, and then Aaron, architect of this building. I think you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's been working on our station one rebuild. And proud to show you what he's done thus far. Yeah, I'm excited to show you where we're at on Station 1. I know I was in front of you guys back in January at the very preliminary stages of this, and so we've progressed forward with it. We have a design that we want to present to you today and tell you the benefits that we think we have in place for that design. Um, I'm going to really focus on, on uh, Fire Station number 1. Uh, the the I'm going to go over the project status, We'll look at the site and building layout, and then we do have a cost associated with this. So uh, I know Gabe and Jason Moore from uh, Burn Construction were introduced earlier, but they are also helping with this on this. So we have turned over a schematic set of drawings for them, which you're going to see today. They have priced that design out, so we know what our target is uh, for coming back to you at, at a point with the GM. Uh, I wanted to start off a little bit and piggyback on what uh, Chief was talking about as far as the facilities master plan. So for Station 1, we have some overriding goals that we're trying to get accomplished in this renovation. Those do align with the facilities master plan we did. Uh, some of those for Station 1 specifically is we need to expand the capacity there to combine Station 1 and 2. So what we're looking at, what you're going to see today, is a station that can house 11 uh, firefighters at any given time. We want to promote a healthy working environment, and this is really uh, a goal that we have for all the fire stations, a meaning that uh, we'll talk a little bit about having isolated zones for contaminated items, giving the firefighters a place to decontaminate those items, and then having living spaces that aren't contaminated by those. Uh, we really need to make all the fire departments accessible. So station 1 was one that was lacking that, where women really couldn't work there because of the bunk room situation and because of the restrooms. And then we want to extend the lifespan of the building. So we are reutilizing Station 1 and the components of it, uh, re rebuilding it, expanding it so that it will last another 50 years. And then uh, our last goal, which is more specific to this site, is securing a parking lot and an outdoor area for the firefighters. Uh, they really don't have one at Station 1 currently. So our timelines are steps. And as Chief discussed, 1 and 2 have already been combined. The fire admin was originally at Central Fire Station. They have moved out, and they are in the temporary location of 5 and a half. So the building currently right now is really just those combined firefighters from Station 1 and 2. That's all that's in Central at the moment. Currently, we're in the middle of our design process, and that's where we're giving you an update today. So we have looked at the existing facilities. We've looked at a couple of different schematic plans of how to expand the building. We've settled on one that we think is, is the right and appropriate solution, um, and then we've established the cost with it. Our 
other other item that uh, Chief mentioned was Station Four. So we're assisting in converting an old room in Station Four to the bunk room. That will happen most likely over the summer. Uh, we will come. We will finish our drawings after our meeting today and come back to you. Um, we'll turn it over to Burn. Have them price it, and our target would be the end of October, first of November, to bring back the GMP price to you guys. During that point or period of time, obviously Station One has to be vacated, which Chief went over. Uh, during our investigation of the Central Fire Station, we did run into asbestos that has to be mitigated. Uh, it is a rather involved process because of the type of asbestos that it is. So the thought is that when we're sort of in this GMP pricing period. We would move the firefighters out so that the asbestos people could come in. They're telling us about a month or so to, to get it. So what our target would be is once you give us council approval of the GMP, we would start construction in that November time frame and the building would be ready for construction. Uh, we're anticipating construction to last about 12 months. So the building would be open in um, somewhere in the November time frame, November, December of 2024. So the building itself, the building was built in 1964, it's about 9,500 square feet. I'm utilizing this picture to go over a few key components that we want to improve. Currently, the bay height is 12 feet. Industry standard is 14. With it being 12 feet right now, it limits the type of equipment that the fire department can buy, not only now, but in the future. So we would like to, to change that. The apron, as you can see, their ladder truck does not fit on the current apron. So on a daily basis, they're coming out and they're pulling that, that unit out. It's, it's uh, impacting South Travis. Interior, like I talked about, bunker gear. It's just sitting in the bay. Industry standard now is that should be in an isolated room so that any contaminants off of it are off gas out of the building and not circulating through. Decon is just in the Bay Area right now. This needs to be in a separate area as well to where you're cleaning off those items and decontaminating them. And then the staff areas or staff spaces inside really don't meet standard industry standard. They're not large enough for the combined station. So really it needs to be updated. So how do we do that? Well, we know that the existing building is really at the corner of West Cherry and South Travis. Um, there is an apron on the southern portion of the building that we are going to keep and reutilize. That really has worked well for overfull parking for the fire department. The actual site does touch Crockett Street. So we, we do know that we have the ability to, to come off of Crockett Street as well as West Jones. The intent is that our expansion zone is this way. So we can reutilize the existing facility and expand. We do know that we want to exit off of South Travis. That is where, where our exit point really needs to be. We also understand that the visual identity of the building is really off of South Travis. That gives us the opportunity to bring in site access off of both West Jones and South Crockett into a secure parking facility. What does that look like in concept? Well, we would have an equipment entry off of Crockett, a secondary entry, and a staff parking area. We do an expansion of a drive through bay to the north side of the building, rework this into the living areas, so we have a new apron and exit out on South Travis. We have a new visual identity to the building. So Aaron, if I may, we not only, just as this place, not only did we, we could have just selfishly built the building, but we put together a plan that improved the entire block. And this gives you an idea of, of where the existing bays are and revitalizing this. We have a tower off starting to identify it, and then you see the drive-through bays as they are to the north side. And as Chief's talking about, so now we're really starting to touch and encompass the entire site and re really brand, re brand that area, give it a visual identity while still utilizing some of the existing components that are there. Yeah. So what does it look like internally? So the new drive-through bays 
uh, we looked at different sizes for these, and we settled on a three-bay configuration that is deep enough to double park certain apparatus. So we're really keeping it as efficient as we can, kind of the right size to utilize it for now and in the future. Uh, the bay height. These are bifold doors, 14 feet. The idea with a bifold door is from an operation standpoint, it opens up quicker, there isn't something to hit as the, as the truck is pulling out, and there's a long-term maintenance cost or issue with the overhead doors, it's an ongoing maintenance issue where the bifold doors have proven that they're much more efficient. They are a higher initial cost, but there's a long-term benefit to having those. We pushed the drive-through bays back to give us a deeper apron. So now we have enough depth that we can bring out any piece of equipment and it will not impact south traffic. That would include a ladder, right? That would An include aerial. a ladder trim. That's correct. So this more, more aligns with industry standards for fire stations, where you have a contaminated zone, we sort of have this decontaminated zone, and then living quarters. So we're creating this yellow zone or area to where we're storing the bunker gear. We're decontaminating the bunker gear. We have showers in there so staff could come in. We have a sauna in there. So there's a way for the staff to clean themselves off as they get in before they get into the living zone itself. Living zone itself is comprised of day room kitchen. We have 11 bunks. We have four individual toilet showers. And then we have a battalion chief's office, bunk, and individual shower frame. So if it gives you an idea, this is the existing building or area. We're really revamping and reutilizing that. So we're taking all the walls out, revamping it into a new plan that works. At the end of the building, where the bays are, we have a lobby area, which would be glassed in, and we can take the MAC that the fire station currently has, and that is located within the lobby area. So it's really the identifying element of the, of the fire station as you come into the lobby, and then the back side of that, we would punch openings in the existing wall and create an outdoor space for the firefighters to have that's a covered outdoor area for them, which is lacking and doesn't exist at the moment. These just give you an idea of the visual identity, how it changes. And as Chief was talking about, then the idea is we have 18 par new parking spaces total between South Travis and uh, Jones Street. We do all new curb and gutter around it to really improve the whole site. And Aaron, you get back real quick. I just want to make sure we point out that the old police department parking, uh, I realized that uh, we've actually worked on replatting that entire piece. Um, and so, Parking is always a discussion for downtown. I understand that's taking away from parking. However, uh, there is a, a supplement in about parking at the old police department. So, yeah. What, is that a city parking lot that's on the back side of the fire station there? Yeah, that's the church. 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 Okay. How's that? Um, Aaron has, spoke, has said it several times that secure parking in the 50 years. We're revitalizing, revitalizing our downtown. You can imagine 10 years from now what the Saturday night walking traffic is going to be in and out of downtown. Um, so we wanted to give our employees the ability to put their vehicles in there in a fenced area without worrying about somebody just reaching over in the bed of their truck and grabbing something. That's the idea behind the secure parking. Keeps the, the jail employees from parking in. <laughs> 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 oh, wait, 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 think about that. Yeah. So this is the component that, that Vern was inter instrumental in helping us with, and what we're bringing back to you, to you today is basically right at a $7 million GNC for what you're seeing within this. Uh, how does that relate, just to give you guys an idea? If we did a new facility on this site, what would it cost us? Well, we estimate we're, we're a little over $10 million to do that. By the time we demo the building and put a new one up, we're somewhere in the $10 million. How much is it? I could do the math, but I want you to. How you much is that math. per square foot? It's a 10. Million, so it'd be 14,000 square feet. So you're. 14, 5 sevenths. 
728. Yeah, okay. You said you were going to let him do that. Yeah. Oh, no, I said. I was just confirming. Yeah. It, well, can't help yourself, can you? Can't speaking, help yourself. speaking to that. Right. Um, so these are, I tried to find uh, fire stations that had been done post COVID. Okay, so most of these costs that you're seeing, I'm giving you a GMP date of when they were bid out. And I try, they're not apples to apples, right? Because no fire station's apples to apples. But to give you an idea, they range from 24,000 to you know, 12,000 square feet. We're 14,000 is what our new building is. They're in the range of, you know, 715 is the high, and we're actually the low at 484. So to give you an idea that we're, by reutilizing the building and making some smart decisions, you know, we're trying to give you a new facility, but it has value to it. I think that's all I got. You guys got yeah, questions? so this one also is built into our budget as well. Uh, I mean, obviously it's bonded, but... Um, as we go into the numbers here in just a little bit, uh, it's baked in at $7 million, uh, right now. And uh, so we would come back, I mean, based on your input, um, you've got enough meat on the bones. Talk about, um, remind them on the timing. So the timing of it is for us to complete our drawings and turn it over to firm to do a GMP. We we'll really think we're coming back to you guys at the very end of October, 1st of November, with a GMP for you to approve. Okay. Good. And then it's 12 month construction after that. Okay. And Chief, is five and a half going to be your permanent home? Or? Uh, no. Likely they would be in uh, whatever the city hall looks like. Okay. The uh, fire uh, admin. We're the cool kids. Mm -hmm. And Robin wants to keep us close. Or? Gotcha. I think there's an office open next to Nate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we're leaving Take contingencies in. in. There, there are several contingencies right. in that 10 year facility master plan. Okay. Cool. Okay. Any, any questions on that one? I mean, we're going to come back and wrap all these up, but any other questions? Nope. Good job as always, Aaron. Thank you. Great. Great. All right. Okay, five five minutes. Two. Two. Let's go. Let's go five. A true five minutes.
That's right. If you want to spend it, let's spend it. Oh, gotcha. Robbie's coming. Yeah. Gotta get, get your caffeine. Gotta get now. caffeinated. <laughs> wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up. Yeah. No, they're they're preparing for the the uh, the numbers after yeah. this. So. So did we decide? Parks is more fun than buy in. No. No. Yes. That's messed up. Okay, so I'm going to go over a little bit about our operations, some current projects that we have going on, um, and compare where we are at um, to the 2017 master plan, as well as some future potential projects. So this is our parks maintenance and cemetery services crews. Good looking mm -hmm. bunch of people. Good looking crews. <laughs> hard work. Absolutely hard work. So, uh, if within the last 15 months, we added we added a grounds crew that uh, took over some of the contract mowing that we used to do. Uh, we eliminated our 16 full-time temporary positions that we were having difficulty filling. Uh, they were at 1,000 hours per year. We replaced those with six full-time positions. So we currently have four crews that work cemetery and parks maintenance with a total of 43 employees. That includes admin and superintendent as well. <clears throat> so last year we had 135 internments, which was the number was down a little bit, but in this case that's a good thing. <laughs> um, the mausoleum, we've done a lot of repairs on the outside of the mausoleum. Do you recognize that photo? It looks, it looks great. I it used does. your photo. That's great. Yeah. That's uh, we did building. a power washing on it. There's still some repairs that need to be done on that building. Uh, the building was built in 1920, so it's over 100 years old. I think it looks the best that it's looked yeah. in a long time. The guys did a lot of uh, tree planting around the cemetery also. Um, we did some trees along the road, and then each year we do a section of repaving. So eventually we'll have the whole thing repaved and probably have to start over. Parks maintenance, uh, along with the mowing of 454 acres, they do a lot of different projects in each park. This is one that we recently did at Rosedale Park. We replaced the bridge that, it was a Boy Scout Eagle project. We turned it into something a little safer, handrails. We added a sidewalk up to it. It's a lot more accessible. We um, added race beds to the Harmony Park. The guys really like to do these extra projects too because it's something different. It gives them an the opportunity to increase their skills. Hillcrest Park is, I don't know if y'all remember when we had the ribbon cutting out there a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, the Sherman Rotary added one playground. The Grayson Rotary added another playground. The Grayson Rotary also paid for the new pavilion that's out there. So we went from this to this with uh, help of two civic groups, the Pride Fund, and then we also did some of the self-performing. Um, our guys actually helped build that pavilion as well as do the concrete. They did some dirt work and different things just so that we could make it a complete project. Still a few things to do, like add uh, benches, and we're going to be expanding that parking lot a little bit too. Uh, as far as our recreation programming, we've increased from 164 programs the year before to 189. That includes everything from the lady on the on my far left is doing Tai Chi, which has become very popular at the rec center. And then we also have a father-son keep up, which we're coming this weekend. Athletics programs, the number of teams we have in our adult softball has increased. We have 22 teams this season, as well as our T-ball. Last fall, last spring we had 12 teams. This season we had 20 teams. Wow. So it's a big increase. Um, a lot more games, obviously, we had to buy more equipment to take care of it. But the kids have a great time. Look at that coach over there. Coach is a great man, too. 
<laughs> Those are good days right there. <laughs> they have so much fun out there. They really do. Uh, we've included more summer camps this year. Um, this, is, this camp down here is one that we did over winter. Uh, basketball camp, it was completely full. Soccer, tennis, basketball, dodgeball, anything you can think of. Just keep kids busy. And then Taylor Street Gym, you notice our numbers have increased from 2021, it was uh, 1352, and this past year it's been 1816. So that's quite a big jump. One of our, is, I mean, everybody knows pickleball is super popular, but chair volleyball. Every Friday morning, we have a group that plays. It started at the senior center, it got too big for that space, so we moved them over to the gym. A couple weeks ago, they had a tournament between different senior centers in the area, and there were 200 people playing chair volleyball. It was wow. amazing. Mm -hmm. Teresa, do you think our outdoor courts, pickleball, are going to, is it the same clientele that will use that, you think, as use this? Yeah. So that will either add to our capacity or take away from some of the traffic from yeah. here? Or? We're just expanding. It's going to be full also. Mm -hmm. um, with it being indoors, obviously, they can yeah. play in hotter temperatures or colder temperatures, but the outdoor boards are going to be marvelous, and they're going to love them. The pool, our numbers, of course, have increased um, since COVID. Last year we had a real popular year. Um, we are looking to increase our pay for our lifeguards and lead guards, cashiers, and maintenance techs. What we're finding is we can find 15-year-old lifeguards because they cannot really work anywhere else. But that second year is when we're losing them. Senior center programming. There's there's a chair volleyball that they used to play in the, the low ceiling and hit, and hit the ceiling fans. It was it was fun. But um, our here today we have 778 people that are registered to use the senior center. You can see how the numbers. We probably are bouncing back from COVID. We've increased the number of programs that we offer at the Senior Center, um, doing different um, different athletic type, athletic type activities. Um, we're doing a stretching and a walking class out at the Center Street. Um, we are doing more outdoor stuff too, which I think is good. So this is our special events. Um, our Nights of Lights, the first night of that, we had over 2,500 people out at Palm Grove. Um, we took the numbers from the PACER and uh, were able to establish how many people were there over the whole month and it was an increase, I believe, by 300 people over last year. So we're really excited about that. And then here's just some numbers of some of our special events that we do. And this fall we are starting a new Crossroads Music Festival. will be held on September 23rd and it will be out at Palm Grove West. Looking forward to that. You'll have learn more about that next week at Customer Nights, where we will announce the end. And Teresa, will you spring not necessarily announce the bands, but just briefly let everybody know what that event is about? Sure. It will be a ticketed event where we will. Uh, this this year it's um, red dirt type of music, but in the future it could be a different type of music. Um, we have four bands that will start about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we'll play until probably 11. Um, anything. Are these going to be local bands? We're gonna, no. No, okay. Well, the, the first ones, we'll start with the sure. local and build up to a, nice. a bigger name band. That's cool. But who, who did you say the headliner was? <laughs> we were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just you. To do. All right, so some of our current CIP projects. I took this picture last week, and it's already progressed um, further than this now. Um, they look at really, really good. I'm really proud of them. Um, and uh, they're going to be so busy. And that court is not going anywhere. No. <laughs> they dug down about 58 feet yes, and uh, reconditioned the soil. So it should be complete. We're planning on doing a ribbon cutting. Um, it'll probably be the first or second week in July, but they may actually be open before that. 
basketball, same thing. I took this before the things fly over. Uh, Con Grove lighting and shading. We open the bids on May 30th. Um, it will be on the June 26th City Council agenda for approval. Con Grove East, we are uh, doing chair lighting and a restroom there. Um, we contracted with Hewitt Zoller um, at the last City Council meeting that was approved. MLK restroom. That's what it used to look like. And this is what it looks like now. And I'm really proud of the parks maintenance guys. They have, they have gone out there and we've done some other touch-ups, like we put new picnic tables underneath the pavilion, new trash cans, um, planted grass, put some boulders, a new roof on the pavilion. You, you notice the new parking lot also. It used to be a, one big pothole after another. Um, so it's, uh, it's going to look really great for the Juneteenth activities this weekend. Can we use the parking lot in house? Yes. Okay. No, we did not do it in house. I'm sorry. Okay. The uh, basketball court across from there, I think we've talked about it before. Who's responsible for that? Is that city or is that still school? It's still school. Okay. That sidewalk that goes just north of that, that's uh -huh. the dividing line. Okay. The school has offered that facility, that entire facility, up for the city. Really? Offered it. Wow. Mm -hmm. For call. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we've had another one of those. Still, it's our extra gym. Yeah. Of course. No, it is. It's um, extra gym. I don't know what they want. I don't know if we can take part of the building or, but I don't. I haven't brought it to you because it was really just a uh, converse, sidebar conversation with Tyson. Mm -hmm. If the council has any interest in taking a 50 year old or 60 year old building, we can. I can have more discussion. I do like the gym idea, but uh, with that comes some other responsibilities. So I think we got enough sixty-year-old buildings, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, that was my thought, but uh, uh, can we train them? man, yeah, yeah can we swap them. them for something? Yeah. <laughs> so we did rotate the restroom around the other direction, so it leaves that space a little bit more wide open, more visible from the road, it provides more security for us. Um, this is the North Creek Park that um, y'all approved the playground equipment for a few council meetings ago. Um, it has been ordered and we're planning on doing a ribbon cutting at this park in conjunction with Sherman Rotary um, sometime in October. Inkwood Park contract, this is the original first design that we've gotten back from the American Ramp Company. Um, we have requested that they um, go back and design it so there are two paths going the same way so that we can eventually, not going the same way, but they mirror each other so that we can have uh, events out there, races, that type of thing. It's, it's a biking, what it's a cycling that? thing? It's, it's cycling, yeah. Oh, it's, okay. gotcha. it's asphalt. It's like the dirt ones that we have out there now, but okay. it'll be yeah, asphalt. Be and it'll be gotcha. So the, this is the Fairview restroom, the one that um, we are working on the scope of it. Um, if you notice, we added some storage on this old one to the right, and we would like to do a restroom, concession, and storage. But um, after getting the quotes back, we need to scale it back a bit. What, what were the quotes? It was 900000 so we're just we're just trying to maybe have one less stall that kind of thing. Is really the <laughs> but this is the last of our open air restaurants. Henry, you think you could do something for for less than nine hundred thousand out there? That's a plan. Like one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the with the home discount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This this is like I said, the last of our open air restaurants. Um, we have kids climbing over your top, uh, vandalizing this all the time. We put some bars across to prevent that, but it's uh, it's the price was long. for taking it down, rebuilding. Mm -hmm. it, it would have been considerably larger than this one, yeah. but mm. we just need to narrow down our vision. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this, um, we did apply for a, a grant for a trail. We're calling it the Southwest Trail at this point. It's a 2.8 mile, 12 foot wide shared use path that'll run from Moore Street to Binkley Park. Um, the total estimated cost on it is over $6 million, but um, if we are funded through the grant, it tech stop would cover nearly $5 million of that. So our portion would be 1.2. Um, applications were turned in on June the 5th, and we should know something October. And that, that is concrete trail. Concrete trail. Uh, wide. A couple different bridge crossings. Yes. And we're really, we get half of Herman Baker Park trail paved with this application. So, and it ties in behind the road where the land was do donated for that development. So keep your fingers crossed on that. Um, outdoor Chapel, um, I don't know if y'all remember, but we were funded to uh, put an outdoor chapel at the West Hill Cemetery. Um, it has been ordered. It was approved by the last city council meeting. Um, that's the location it's going to go in. Basically, it's a shelter where we will be able to do uh, funeral services underneath that um, instead of necessarily taking out all the tents for a lot of times uh, people may not have space to, in that area to do a service so this will be where there'll be a lot more parking that type of thing but what area of the that, that used to be the, we used to call it the old tent shed it used a long time ago was the cemetery office it's toward the back of the, the cemetery so is it um, uh, west of the cemetery buildings or what, it would be what southeast. direction southeast. southeast it's like right over here is uh, so we're over here on this map <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> There's a cemetery. Okay. Perfect. That really worked out. Does everybody know what I'm talking about now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is a list of all the things that we have accomplished since the 2017 master plan. Um, the Beakley Park, they're either already completed or they're in the process. Uh, at Beagley Park, we've done the new pump track and trail improvements. Cherry Street, um, walking trail, playground, basketball court upgrades. Ely, new playground, fielder. Um, we've done some pavilion upgrades. Herman Baker, we added the kayak rentals. Hillcrest, we completely redid. Um, MLK Park, new pavilion, new playground, new restroom. Lamar Street Green Space, we cleared out a lot of the trees out, added parking, added a crushed concrete trail. Congrove East, we have the new trail lighting and the restroom. I mean, and then at Congrove West, this fall, Rosedale and Rex Cruz were new playgrounds. Fairby Park, restroom, dog park, football courts, basketball court, lawn park, new playground, new skate park, and then at Congrove Athletic Complex, the new athletic field. So we're at the point in our master plan where we've completed a lot of them. Um, so moving forward, or some of our future staff use projects that weren't necessarily on the master plan, but things that we need to continue to move forward. So, this is a playground that we could possibly put in at Hong or Fairview. All of our other playgrounds that we've ever done are more of a cookie cutter type of playground. This is a custom playground, a destination almost type of playground where it's a lot more inviting, I think. It does all have the, the surfacing. Um, that's surface. Mm -hmm. that's Doesn't it look cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Splash pads are another thing. Uh, the, our splash pad that we have at <coughs> Pond was built in 2002. So it's over 20 years old. Mm -hmm. They've come a long way since then. Um, splash pads obviously are very popular in Texas with the heat. Um, very limited maintenance on them. We've been very happy with our program. Let me park on one thing there, um, Teresa. So one of the considerations on splash pads that comes into play, uh, I mean, cost obviously is gonna, gonna be a consideration, but you can, you can piece them together with different apparatus as you want, but um, they use a tremendous amount of water, hundreds of gallons a minute. Um, if we were to supersize and have four good size splash pads, if they were used um, 
if they were used heavily, they could be collectively nearly half a million gallons a day. So that, now that would, that would mean if they're used, uh, you know, eight or ten hours a day and every apparatus is running, which all of that's not likely. Right. I'm just saying these use hundreds of gallons a minute. And some of our largest wells produce hundreds of gallons a minute. <laughs> so part of our consideration is you don't, want, you don't want 28 splash pads around town because we're trying to figure out how to have enough capacity for our residents just for drinking water and our industries and our businesses. So there will be a balance here. While everyone maybe would love one of these in their backyard or close enough to walk, we just need to be, um, you know, deliberate about how many and where and the sizing and all of that. So all that will come into play. They do have that recirculate the water. The one that we have currently does not recirculate. Yeah. Um, but there are other, it, it, they're higher cost. We well, they're higher cost and higher maintenance. And higher maintenance, right. So, Robbie, does... Does Jim's group get to charge Teresa for that water usage no. being over 20,000 gallons a day? <laughs> 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 one more cut there. <laughs> Teresa, I mean, too, just real quick, uh, to speak to the maintenance part, you've got stuff ordered for on farm. You've got Absolutely. things out there to make yeah. sure as efficient as possible. Right. But, the tumble buckets right now are not working. We've been ordered apart back in March, and it still hasn't arrived. Um, but... You know, it's it's over 20 years old. We have had some problems with some of the solenoid valves and things like that in the vault, um, and we're we're working through them. And right now, it's operational. I wouldn't say it's working 100%, but um, kids are still on it and getting sprayed with water. <laughs> Step up from a garden hose. Just a step up. Okay. I mean, compared between a pool and a splash pad, though, I mean. Oh, it's not even the same. It's not like, no. the same. These are a few hundred thousand. I mean, these probably are three or four hundred thousand up to That's six or seven, spend. however much you want to spend. A new a new splash is going to be 15 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus, you don't have to have staff. Staff. That's the right. Now, yeah. The only might the only thing you might have to have staff for some of these are. For those that recirculate, they uh, they use a chemical feed system and pumps and all that. So you've got to have somebody that is, I'm sure, testing the water, uh, chemistry, and, yeah. and all that periodically. So and we do that at the pool. Basically, the same maintenance that you would at the pool, but you wouldn't have a lot of parts. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they and they make attachments uh, for swimming pools, I believe, where you can hook on to the same system the water that's already treated. And it flows back into the pool. Oh, like if you wanted to have one of these out at Fairview? Yeah, if yeah. they were wanted to have one at yeah. Fairview. And we use the pool water to feed it right. and already yeah. use the pre existing yep. filters. And that's, that's what we smart have it Look at you. Slash hey, have Captain Gene. Every once in a while. We're shy. We're shy, man. Herman Baker, Captain Baker, uh, fishing here at Kayak Drop. This is something that since we. Put the kayaks, There's rentals out there, um, what they're doing is dragging the kayaks to the lake and it's stretching them up really bad. And this provides people, they don't have to get in the water to actually launch their kayak. And that's a company, is that a company doing the kayak rentals? Yes. Yep. It's like a paddle board. But we get a percentage of the rentals. Uh -huh. Old Southern's Park lighting upgrades. If you notice, uh, up here we have a, a little issue. This is on field three, and this was this picture was taken the day before the Memorial Day weekend. Um, that that field we use that for 100 practices, 100 games during the spring season for SYSA. So it's something that we really need to take a look at. All the lighting out there. Um, it does seem like a good idea to be putting your finger down there, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Everyone who does. The fire department was called, though. Okay, Conroe East. Uh, we've been working with the Lions Club. Uh, probably for the last two years, they've been really interested in adding an inclusive play um, playground. Um, this is one that um, they've already raised over $100,000 for project like this through donations and through grant funding. Um, so this is something that we would like to be working with them. What they would probably do all the uh, equipment and we might have to do the surfacing. 
resurface the tennis courts. I don't know if you noticed on uh, Nate's uh, drone footage when he flew over the tennis courts and how they look compared to the new painted pickleball courts, but um, we're definitely in need to get these resurfaced. I, it, it's just like when you paint your living room, then your hallway needs painted, you know, and then your kitchen needs painted. It's, they're, they're in pretty bad shape. Trails, I think we're, we're at the point in trails that we, if we get the Southwest Trail, what comes next? Um, it's just working through that trail master plan and, and continue to look for opportunities with Rob's help. <laughs> and that's the end of my slides. Anybody have any questions? We're going to talk about some of the projects uh, and the pricing and the funding of some of those new projects uh, here and just coming up right here. So, I have a question. Yeah. On, uh, on some of the parks, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about Home Park. Mm -hmm. Parking is a big, big issue there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that included in some of this? Uh, yeah. We are planning on expanding the parking this year. Yeah. We'd like to do some. So, the and I can run through kind of our ideas on yeah. wh what each of these are. So the, um, and all of these are targeted at major parks, not little pocket parks, because over the last few years, you can probably go back to her list of since 2017, we've done playground and other upgrades like at Fielder Park, at Ely, at, you know, some of the pocket parks. Um, so this, these would be dollars for the larger parks, for Han, for Old Settlers, for um, Pecan Grove East, for Fairview, for Pecan Grove West, uh, the larger uh, community parks. And they would be uh, like very noticeable. Uh, I mean, I, I know you notice them, you know, even at the smaller park, but regional parks are destination parks. They have parking available, usually lots of parking because there's more than one. Many of them are both active and passive parks. They have sports fields and or practice fields. They have playgrounds. They have pavilions and spray grounds and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, our thoughts, in addition to the things that are already in the hopper, like uh, lighting the fields at uh, Pecan Grove West. So the new stuff that we're thinking for 24 are at Han, it's uh, parking, spray ground, uh, Probably replacement, not just rebuild. It's 20 years old. I, I hadn't, I would have missed that by about five or six years. But I mean, it's 20 years old. If you're getting that life out of the spray ground without major renovation, you kind of gotten your money's worth there. Uh, major playground, uh, this all-inclusive, um, you know, rubber or whatever type of surface that's kind of all weather uh, pavilion. And uh, light, we talked about lighting. Uh, some of the lighting is already, we're test driving some solar lighting sorts of things. So yeah. on gets a major, major facelift. We originally had um, more money in old settlers for different things like a spray ground and some, some other things. But uh, after I realized kind of the dire nature of what's going on with the electrical system, uh, and the, the, the price tag of that, by the way, the estimate is $3 million. Um, now, we can't bite all of that. We're not proposing to bite all of that off in one year. And so I've got right now, what's going to be in my presentation here in a minute is a million and a half. And we're going to see how far we can go with that. Uh, but that would be, that's not the quad. Right. That's the old, uh, the five old fields and other lighting around is needed. But... I mean, the lighting is buried. It's not even in conduit. Right. Is that what you said? Right. It's like somebody, you know, ran a... Anyway, uh, it's probably the best we could do at the time, but um, old settlers need some, um, need some love. But I didn't want to be the guy... I told the staff this. I didn't want to be the guy who spends $1,000 on a new Kenwood uh, system in his truck and needs a new transmission. Yeah. <laughs> so sure. let's pay... The, Let's get it functional, yeah. and then we can think about spray grounds and, and other things at Old Settlers. So it's Han, Old Settlers. Uh, MLK eventually, I think, may be a location for a small uh, spray ground, but not for 24. Um, 
Fairview, uh, already we're kind of in the middle of some renovations there already. You saw pickleball, you saw the uh, basketball. Um, we've got um, um, restrooms. We're trying to figure that part out. Um, pavilion, uh, doing away with the old uh, there are pavilions. Two pavilions. And number four, and number two. <coughs> number four actually used to be an old restroom, and the concrete on it is different levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it needs a new roof. It's yeah. Ready. So it's doing away with all of that. Um, new, totally renovating the uh, playground area that we kind of parked on at the, I think that was, uh, seems like days ago, but it was the first part of this meeting, wasn't it? Oh. Um, at the, the flyover. Oh, yeah. Uh, where all the play, current playground equipment is at Fairview. Uh, so it's that, it's the uh, pier, the fishing pier at Herman Baker, um, and I think that, oh, Pecan Grove East uh, playground uh, like this, Pecan Grove West, uh, splash pad, I think that's, I think that's it, Lars, that's it. Okay. Um, we are about done. We're about we're, so we're about to the work the work plan and financials. We're gonna whoop and ride here. Do you need a five minute break? Do you want a five minute break? Okay. Just keep going. All right. We're at the budget part of our budget workshop. Here comes right. the boom. Here comes the boom. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just sit back and relax. Yeah. Uh -huh. No. Um, Nate didn't like. <laughs> Play, uh, start the Kenny G. Start the Kenny G. Turn the heater up. Uh, page one. <laughs> Two fifty, maybe? Hmm. Not there for football, do you? Or football show. Or football show. Oh, that's the other thing that's uh, in the slides, too, is uh, an allocation for um, uh, kind of dipping our toe in the turf field. Uh, space, like the all-weather turf field. Um, not going crazy on it, but um, either, if we don't even have the load. The places we've looked at in the past are Fairview Park, Field 6, uh, Center Street, um, those two fields at Center Street. Uh -huh. Those are the most logical places because there's already uh, the space there and already, you know, parking there. So, uh, more to come on that, but um, that's in as a, as a placeholder right now. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So, all right, in terms of work plans and kind of summing up everything that we've talked about, I'm gonna come back at the end of Mary's with the council direction. But if we have um, discussion on these items, let's have that now. Mary, uh, all of these things are already baked into the numbers that Mary's gonna present. And then so, um, Let's discuss it now. She'll present the, how all of this fits within the big picture, and then we'll come back and check off, okay, on this, 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 this. Let's do, do some more work on this, whatnot. Um, all right, so uh, in many of these, uh, all of these, we've really touched on at some level. Uh, so call is for all the employees, um, market adjustments for other groups, including public safety streets and then individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we, we do still plan to put uh, contributions for the HSA plan for next year, even though the um, plan is struggling. The uh, plan is struggling a little bit. We feel like we can still um, make that happen. In terms of new positions, uh, here's what you've got here. Some of these we already have, like the fire admin support. We already have a part-time position. It's just taking that from part-time to full-time. Um, some of these are um, also funded in different ways from just the general fund, but you can read those for the general fund, IT, uh, cybersecurity analyst, as we just <coughs> go on in time. This is, uh, we already do a ton of work that's just spread amongst all the employees right now in IT relating to cybersecurity and safety and security of our network. So uh, we do propose. Uh, a dedicated position for that. Stormwater inspector, that's if, if if we get the stormwater fee increase, that's where this would go. If not, then 
that's a no. Um, and then uh, solid waste, we just need another wrap driver just from the volumes. Uh, this is a summary of the, that adds those seven to this, to this list. Um, we talked, just finished talking about all of those major park improvements. Uh, there will be a slide uh, that Mary's going to do that we'll park on for a minute about the, um, uh, the actual dollars associated with that list of projects. And so we can talk about those lists in, in just a minute. Um, many of these, like the enhanced incentive programs for downtown, uh, this is a rehash of the input we got from you guys. We saw this slide at the very first part of the day. Uh, so um, I think we've hit elements of this uh, throughout the day. Um, so wrapping all of that up, um, we've talked about all of those. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, any, dis any more discussion on uh, the Station 1 uh, rebuild? Okay. Um, City Hall, we'll come back to that one, but our, our, um, our charge is um, let's look more holistically. Let's uh, get some more data about alternatives, like uh, we've got this space here, we've got that space here. What would it take to get that space suitable to, and ready to use as an alternative to building a, a brand new city hall? How does that compare? We'll bring all of that back together at a future meeting. It sounds like that's um, August-ish time frame, what we heard from Gensler. Uh, significant park improvements. Uh, we've talked about a lot of the, um, both at the CIP meeting that we had um, last month and today, talked about the significant general and utility CIPs. Um, talked about the block, the increasing block uh, rate structure there and renewing the street sales tax. And the uh, Clint talked about our enhanced street programs and, and what we're able to do with more people and higher, um, higher budget for materials there. Do you want to see, we have it in your slides, do you want to go over details on the other than big fire trucks and stuff that we've already talked about. Okay. Um, we will finance that through tax notes. And uh, we want to be um, uh, opportunistic, I guess is what I would say, about the community improvement program. That's what we heard. You guys were uh, kind of impressed and whatever with the work that we've been able to do through the community improvement program. So we'll continue to pursue that. Um, downtown. Um, the enhanced incentive program is already there. We're working on our plan for uh, the infrastructure, the actual engineering, um, and have that underway, and that will be issued uh, there. Uh, solid waste, we talked about that for a little bit. Uh, we talked about that early on while you and Nate were gone. Um, we'll know more in um, late summer, early fall, about what Taswa's position is on distributing um, excess reserves there. And so our, our um, proposal is that we don't do anything with rates today, or decision with rates today. Let's wait and see what happens there. Um, environmental, uh, oh, we've got some money in there for um, increase. This kind of ties to the community improvement uh, program. And then uh, this is more operational than budget, although we just approved um, a contract with, uh, with HAP for the subdivision ordinance provisions. In terms of rates, um, what we're proposing with all of the CIPs is to keep the M&O rate unchanged at 26.5 cents and that the total rate then be uh, 0.508. And uh, Mary has a slide on how that breaks out uh, comparison to the no new revenue tax rate and, and whatnot. She'll go over that in just a minute. Um, incidentally on that, as we'll see on the five-year look at um, both the general and utility fund, we believe that there is um, relief that can start, you know, on 
the general fund side, maybe in the 26, 27 time frame on the rates. And, uh, you know, to go back down and then a little bit later, two, three years after that on the utility rates. Uh, we talked about the rate study and solid weight. We talked about that. Stormwater fee, a dollar. We talked about that. Okay. This is just a sneak peek. This is like, I don't know how many asterisks and whatever I need to put on this, but um, this is, makes a lot, of a, different, a lot of different assumptions. But the important ones that you need to, to understand are, we, we take a look at fund balance and make sure that this fund balance is healthy. You'll notice that this fund balance is greater than we normally carry. And we're doing that for reasons of not knowing exactly what um, values are going to be going forward, particularly in this time frame, first of all. Second of all, um, in, I mean, I'm going to switch back and forth between the utility and that. You'll also notice that we have general fund transfers out here near 27. So we're using general fund to kind of prop up utility fund as needed to, to cover this desert time frame. I don't know if that needs to be three and a half million or six and a half million or any at all. Um, we just don't know that as we stand here right now. So part of the reason we're keeping these reserves at higher levels, uh, particularly in this time frame, is because we don't know what's going to happen in the utility plan. Um, also, we have some other projects that we may uh, need uh, reserves for other development type projects. Uh, so that's kind of points number one and two. Uh, at this current rate, uh, or uh, with these assumptions, we have uh, 508 built in there, which is uh, no change in 24 to the M&O rate, and then that would be a debt rate of 0.243. Um, <clears throat> so about uh, 3.8 or 9 cents. Also what this builds in um, is some amounts in new debt each year. Okay, we've stopped it at 28. I mean, maybe there's some in 28 or not. We don't, we don't know, but we wanted to build a model, a what-if model. Hey, with everything we know, with our projections on assumptions on growth of new property coming on, uh, increases in values that are, you know, projectable, what we know about uh, sales tax, both street and uh, regular sales tax, this is our, this is our uh, best guess today where we stand for both 24 and for the next five years. So um, a good, I mean, th there are no, um, th nothing to fret about here in, in terms of financials. Um, building reserves a little bit higher than they would otherwise be in this time frame. Um, if we get to 28, and we've got 150 days of reserves. That's, in my opinion, that's too much, right? So we would. Uh, so my point in the previous slide is, start getting into this 27, 26, 27, 28 time frame. The pressure on the general fund goes down, which means that these rates could go down, while still funding the debt service that are earmarked for different projects. Okay, so that's good news. Uh, this is just a graphic, I mean, a, a chart form of what we just saw. Uh, it's maybe easier to see here, and it's no surprise that all of that revenue increase really is coming from property and sales taxes, which are a vast majority of our general fund revenue sources. Utility fund is a little bit different story, uh, and we had uh, Will Dan talk about that this morning. This time frame is a little hairy. More, um, that's when the, the debt really starts to come on. And so we, we're building up reserves in this time frame for these, for, for, to cover this, so that we keep these fund balances adequate. Now, what I would say is, generally speaking, for, um, for 66 million in expenditures, you probably need, just divide that by six, that's 60 days of reserves. That's about 10 or 11 million. So you might say, oh, well, 8 million is a little light. Well, yeah, it is a little light, but that's also five years from now, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So we're going to, we're, to me, we just continue 
charging forward uh, on the path that we're on. Uh, we continue with the uh, rate plan, the block rate plan. We'll, we'll pivot on that as we need to. Uh, but if we continue on the block rate plan, it would generate these revenues based on the volumes that we're projecting, and it would generate these results. So again, not anything to, to worry about, but just some concern in this time period. Okay. Um, so the takeaways there, um, sales and property tax are very healthy, and um, the, the drivers in both the utility and the general fund are CIP, I mean nearly exclusively CIP uh, related. Um, we'll modify our rate plan, our utility rate plan is needed based on the volume. And then we took your input from a meeting or two ago, uh, budget meeting ago, and, and uh, hey, let's put the um, rate burden on those that are driving the need for the rates, which are our large water users. So the residential users are bearing um, essentially none of, that, um, none of that cost. Now, we did get the kind of asterisk with, let's look at the very, very small users uh, in the rate plan see what impact it would be to leave those alone for a five-year stint, um, like maybe up to 3,000 gallons. We'll come back uh, with that at a future meeting before we finalize the budget. Um, and then this one just says, hey, uh, we'll, we'll modulate the utility plan as we need based on volumes. Okay. I think I have you start from here, or do you want me to take it? Um, doesn't matter. Either okay. Way. I'll turn it over, and then we'll jump in. Um, I want to um, spend a little bit of time on that general CIP uh, utility list uh, when we get there. So. <laughs> hey, is everybody doing? I mean, we're nearly there. I know we're like we're full stomachs, and we're yeah, but we're. we're uh, and we have a meeting at four, <laughs> right? Can't yeah. go anywhere. Okay. Okay. Good news, Mary. Let's have it. This is only good news. Um, so the good news is our values are increasing. Um, There's still about two billion dollars um, under appraisal district review right now. So um, we've estimated the rate fully funding on our capital projects at. 0.508 that maintains our, our operating rate and what it was last year. Um, I can tell you I would be shocked if we guessed the preliminary value right on the money. So do expect some changes there. Um, so what this slide is showing is this up here. Up here, that's our no new revenue rate. That's the rate that we would use um, if you wanted to use the exact same amount of revenue on property tax in both years for the fiscal year 2024. That would not include any of the, um, uh, that would include um, some part of the debt, the debt rate also. Um, so here's the voter approval tax rate as adjusted. That's 0 0.525. That, uh, include some of the unused increment that we have from last year. Here's our current rate here. Here's our preliminary rate. You can see we kept the, the m and rate stable at 0.265 and then this funds all of our debt service here at 0.24. And that gives us points by the way. So it's a 3.9 cent increase in taxes but it's all for debt. None of it goes to operate. Uh, and here's how we manage our tax rate. So last year, the voter approval rate was about 0.52. We're estimating um, for that fiscal year 22, 23, it was about 50 cents. Now it's about 52 cents again. Here's that unused increment uh, that we talked about earlier. We can add that to the voter approval rate as calculated, and that's what gives us the 50. In any unused increment, so if we did a 0.508, that's about uh, 17 point, 
1.7 cents. So that 1.7 cents would get carried forward to next year to be used. Uh, you know, 22 rolls off. It's a rolling three years, right? Yeah. It's a rolling three years. So, you know, 22 falls off, which there's nothing in the unused increment. Uh, and then 20, 25 estimate would include, uh, a, you know, 1.7 cents or 1.8, whatever that number is, uh, roll forward, right? Yeah. In unused. Okay. So this is the rate that we're estimating based on the preliminary values that we would be at right now that would maintain our operating rates and fund all the projects that we've talked about today. So the no, no new revenue rate to the citizens, no, no, no additional cost on their tax bill is 41? Um, that's correct. Yep. Well, um, mm. raises the same no, your tax bill still is. It would lower it, but you'd end up with the same revenue. Same yeah. revenue, lower rate. Yeah. Right. 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 Then call, it, that's where they paid the exact same thing last year that they paid this year, right. on average. On average. Yes. Yeah, that's I got right. you. Yeah. Um, here's the proposed uh, tax note funding for the equipment that we're proposing for next year at four point two million. Um, here's our projected uses for the bond. This is what we're calling our required projects at $55 million. These are ones we've already committed to um, that, um, that kind of have to do. Um, you can see here's the, the combining stations one and two. These are some buildings down here, some bridges, and the rest of them are streets. So $43 million of the $55 million street projects, almost $11 million will be funded by SEDCO, meaning they'll pay us back for the debt service. Uh, these are the projects that, um, that really are up to your discretion. Here's the city hall right there at $7 million. That would be land acquisition, design, site work, um, you know, um, all of those pre-construction costs, maybe some construction. Um, here's some of the projects we talked about. We have that parks bucket. We have the additional projects listed on another slide, but they're, they're the ones that Teresa presented to you a few minutes ago. Um, those non-required projects that we consider discretionary, that's about 20. So on this slide, guys, um, this, is, this is actually 23 CO, right? Not that's 24 right. CO. Our hope is that we go to the market with this this summer um, so one of the things that I need to know from you so let's for now let's set aside the whole city hall design land there will be some more in that whatever that number is but let's set that aside for a second is there appetite on your part to for us to move ahead with uh, 78 million seven of which is city hall so if, if you didn't want to commit to that right now uh, we probably need some to get Gensler to do some more work for us. So somewhere in the low 70s is where this number would be without that. Are you okay with us coming back to you with a notice of intent? Is that what it's called? Notice of intent, which is your uh, authorization to have our financial advisor go forth uh, with a bond issue, a 23 bond issue this summer would fund, I mean, if we started in July, it would fund in September or October? September. Okay. Um, well, really, we have to, um, if we want it to fund September, probably about the latest we can get it out is that last meeting in June. Okay, so that's n uh, June, a, a week from Monday. 25th, right. So, Part of the discussion I need from you today is, and most of these are just boring, right? you, you don't have, the, there are, either, there are things that we've all talked about, except for that 10 million parks bucket, which is what we just talked about. Um, separate list to come that, that spreads out that 10 million, but it's, it's those things at Han and Old Settlers and Fairview and whatnot. So what's, what's your appetite on that? I mean, I, it's less than I thought it would be. So I don't have. It does not include construction of City Hall. I mean, just to be yeah, yeah, yeah. to be clear there. Yeah. So seven million to that. Okay. 
Yeah, and that's that just that, that's like done. preliminary pre-construction sorts of things, and and that number may be five. I mean, even if we left a number in there, maybe a little less than that. But it's that's a not to exceed number, and I don't think it would if we didn't use if we didn't use that number or that. Um, those dollars, if, if they'd only ended up being three and a half, then we would have three and a half that can be used for parks and some other things. So long as we list them as, look, price sure. right. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that the land's definitely not going to get any cheaper. Well, that was going to be my point. Yeah. I would say just leave it if, if we, let's buy the land, because we're, I think we're all committed to staying in the same location. I think everybody kind of feels that way and, you know, it'll give us some flexibility on design. So if we don't use it, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of, we've got about $130 million otherwise <laughs> identified for places to spend, and many of those are streets. <laughs> so the money won't not get spent. Uh, it just might not get spent all seven on, on that. So, Robert, let me ask you this. Um, this would normally be council input at the end, um, not necessarily now, but... Can you fund all those projects and still maintain everything else we've discussed without, if you were not getting a tax, tax increase, if your tax rate stayed the same, if you didn't win that uh, over here? Um, no, that, um, the current rate will not support 78. Right. So, so for me, I'd be curious what, you know, what the current rate could support just in, I mean you don't know for sure that you're going to get the tax rate so right you our, know, our um, I don't want to commit to the bonds until I know what our revenue is going to be our our 49 a 49 cent rate will support um, Was it that 50 yeah, about 50. 50. 50 so uh, so um, we would have to cut probably all the park stuff and dig into not doing some of the streets yeah. that we've already kind of committed to. Just, I'm just curious because yeah, that, that's I mean, the commitment that we'd be making here is that we're committed no, to it, the, you know. No, no that's right. right. And it, so now some of these are already kind of out, like that's what I was going to say. Some of them ball field and to. trail lighting at Pecan Grove West, and so we would have to go back through these, which we can. Um, and if you're um, we can get to a no tax rate increase. It's just that. Uh, so go go back up one, Mary, if you would. And you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. I mean, we'll all give you input at the end. I just was yeah making sure that if this could be supported by the current rates or not is really yeah it ca it, it can cannot be. yeah no. In fact, I mean we'd we'd start <laughs> at big items and like twelve million for Shepherd. Well, we'd have to find a different way to fund that somehow. We'd probably be cutting out station one. And what did you tell us each each uh, each cent on the you, rate? Did you say cutting out station one? Yeah. What do you I mean, mean, if we're if we're getting down to we don't have uh, what can be funded with our current rate, and not have any tax rate increase, then we're chopping essentially all the parks things that we don't already have contracts on, and we're starting to make cuts on other things like station one, and I mean. Some of those we have legal obligations for, so we probably can't do those, but um, yeah, Moore Street would come out. Um, Shepherd, we kind of have made, there's no legal commitment, there's just kind of a moral obligation there that, to TI that we're gonna do that, so. Yeah. Um, I don't know how we don't, all the stuff on the left is no fluff, things that we already kind of have commitment for, and that maxes out essentially what we can do at our current rate, roughly. I got you. Anything else then uh, is going to have an impact on the rate. And we're, you know, the trunking system, public safety trunking system, do we have to have that today? Uh, I mean, is it working? Is it, are can, things working today? Problem. So we could go. Well, and and I'm not that. saying you're not going to get it. I just want to make sure I have my head right. on. No, you're, right you're, yeah. you're correctly right. Yeah. You're right on. It, yeah. it is, uh, it will, our current rate won't support all of this. Right. And to support all of this, is the 50.8 cents. Hmm. Uh, this is a, just a slide of uses, well over half is streets. Um, this is our proposal for the 2024 CO of, of about 35 million. Um, it's just 
the match for TxDOT for 56 West Travis at Inner Urban Parkway that uh, Nate showed us on the slide over some right away acquisition and there's a city hall. So we decided to go ahead with that. But we'll have uh, more discussion on all this before we move ahead with this. Um, this is just a historical look at what we used our bonds for in the past. Debt service slides, outstanding. This is our, our current outstanding debt service without the 2020 code. This is outstanding and proposed. I'm not going to go over all these slides. I'm going to go over the numbers. I'll try to find them. It's by year. Yeah, it's tempting. Don't, yeah, I'm worried. Yeah, here's uh, the child can read the titles on both. Ooh, let's look at that one. That's yeah, good. Yeah, that has lots of colors. You probably like that one. So this just gives us a base year and shows the growth um, in each of these segments, like growth in base, new development, first value, PI, uh, new values, and green. And then here's where we're going to break down the, the property tax rate for you. 508, just the debt service rate from the note, new positions. This is our current rate right there. Um, so utility fund, we don't have a proposed rate increase for those low volume users. Those are the ones below 20,000 gallons per month. They won't have an increase till October of 2025 under the proposed uh, rate plan. So we have the higher volume users paying for um, the huge amount of debt service that we are incurring largely on their behalf. Um, this, uh, for the solid waste fund, we can the additional distribution. We need from Caswell probably about 300,000. Gets us really close to an ongoing balancing. That'd be about a 4% rate increase if we don't get anything from Caswell. We'll anything more? Anything more from Caswell. Yeah. We already received about 700,000. So this would be in addition to that. Um, so we'll wait and see how much we get from Caswell before we have to make that decision on rate. Um, this just highlights some of the new projects we're looking at, continuing projects. So the total tax rate um, of 0.508 funds all our projects. And we'll look at rate reductions further, uh, further years. Covered all this. Stormwater fee um, of the dollar. If you listen to plans. So our fund balances are healthy in the general and utility funds or within our target range of 60 to 90 days. And, uh, now you can see the solid waste fund with 51 days. That $300,000 would get us up to 63 days. Our ongoing balancing, even the solid waste fund ongoing, if we take out the, the one time expenses, we're still not. So this is our capital expenses, or over half of the total budget this year. I look back just two years ago, and capital expenses were 17% of the total budget. How many years ago? Two. Oh. 21. Yeah. Mm. Lots changed. That was pre-TI. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Here it's broken down by so here's the general fund. There's really not a lot of big stories in there except if you look up here. Now this is the proposed budget for 24 up there in the upper right. And you can see the increase in property tax uh, and the sales tax is really the big story. It's been up, so for the year it's up 20%. Um, now if you take TI out of that, it would only be up 8%. But 8% is still historically a, a, great, a great number. Um, next year, we're uh, projecting for it to still be up 10%. At some point, we'll start receiving revenue from global wafers, but we haven't received anything so far that I can tell. Um, and here's our personnel cost increases. Uh, we talked about the public safety, police, and fire. Um, that's about 62% of the total uh, cost changes in 
personnel for the city are for police and fire. Um, this is a look at historically our sales tax, and you can see a large increase starting in 2023. Thank you. Um, this is a, a I, I think Robbie Sun had this, Zachary had this idea for this slide, which I thought was interesting. Sales tax per capita of similarly sized city. So um, I've got this information from the comptroller um, and just divided sales tax by population. So you can see we're number five of 30 um, cities of the same size. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. The pretty interesting cool little tidbit here is he also did uh, <clears throat> he also did for all um, cities over 20,000 population in Texas, yeah. and we're number seven on that list. And that includes Houston and Austin and San Antonio and Fort Worth, and I mean, all those big cities on a per capita basis. Uh, now, those those top three were also in the top five of that oh, statewide. Right. So okay. what that really tells you is we're kind of in uh, high company. Those are very wealthy cities. You think about the colony, they've got, you know, Shields and uh, you know ne Nebraska Furniture and all those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so on a per capita basis, uh, we're we're doing doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well, and, and just another reason for us to continue with our street sales tax because if you just look at that, you think there's a lot of people from out of town paying it, paying for our, our roads. Sales tax. So I mean, if you were building a house and someone was going to pay for half, you would certainly want to. Take advantage of that, and so that's what that's what that says to us also. Um, this shows us since 2012. Our base year isn't shown on here, but it's 2012. We've added 2.1 billion dollars. Um, just our existing property become appreciating, and 1.4 billion um, new properties added to. Um, and this graph just shows both the tax rate and the growth in property value together. Um, this is long-term debt, and I know we've gone over this before, but you can see Sherman here, and that's with our proposed with our um, traditional tax back debt. So the utility debt, we call it revenue debt or utility debt because revenue repays that debt. Revenue from the utility system, tax back, taxes pay back that debt. Um, and you can see we have a lot of utility debt compared to these other cities. Well, that's because our utility system is, is unique. Um, I did look at just this one city, Friendswood, because they're about half and half, um, like we are. And so they buy 80% of their surface water. They um, treat it at a water treatment plant. They operate the plant. They distribute the water. They collect their sewer, but then they don't treat their sewer. And so all these cities have some combination of how they do those things. Um, you can see the ones that don't have any utility debt, they're not doing any of that. Um, and some of these, they're doing maybe just they have the collection. And it's it's kind of hard to compare yourself on utility debt. Um, and these next just show where we are, our tax rate compared to um, other cities. Um, here's the utility fund. You can see 2022 was actually a really great year for revenue. I don't know if you remember how hot and dry it was. And it did not rain at all during the month of August that year. So that was shame. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm too. So, um, but we made a lot of money. Um, so we're, we're projecting a normal year this year. That's why the revenue is not going up too much, even though we have the rate increase of 3% built in here. Um, and again, next year, 24. But we'll, see, we'll see what the weather does. That's the biggest, um, the biggest thing that can happen with revenue. Um, and Robbie showed you that one. Here's our water and sewer revenues and graphs. You can see that's 2021. Oh, 2022. That was pretty good. You can see 20, uh, 20 was a pretty uh, 
Also talked about their they're raising the gate rate in January um, by five more dollars. So there'll be it that'll be forty five. So that's, that's a right, twelve, thirteen percent. Well that's a yeah, that's a twelve and a half percent increase. Yeah. So um, another well probably another three hundred thousand on our well, but for three quarters of a year. Two or three hundred thousand impact more in expenses than we're budgeting in there. Right, so we don't have that increased um, gate rate in here. And we'll I'll go at it probably tomorrow or something. Right. So that'll, mm -hmm. yeah. Not good. Okay. Okay. Um, these next slides are just general improvement fund. So um, I know before I showed you the general improvement fund, there was some color coding. I opened that this year, and I thought I was going to have a seizure. There was just way too much going on. So I split it up. Um, this is city funds, and this is what is funded with tax notes and general fund transfers. Um, okay, yeah, and so um, four hundred eighty-two thousand five hundred then includes um, center dev and airport map. You may have seen that on the tax notes slide. Also, we're not building. Intergov is a uh, software system for our uh, development, development services, services area. It's mm -hmm. just expensive to implement and because of the timing when we're able to pay for it. Um, and this fund is going to be just bond funds. So we, we separate the bond funds with all other funds to keep them by themselves. Um, this proposed is not going to exactly equal the, uh, yeah, the, the bond list, the 2022 CO bond list. So this is the slide, these two slides, guys, are the ones that start to have the, um, mostly the 20, well, I guess all of the 23 COs in it, starting at um, West Hill Erosion at, uh, I'm sorry, Creek, Creek Erosion at West Hill for a million, um, 800,000 for Pecan Grove East, uh, playground resurfacing for Fairview, Baker Park Fishing Pier, um, OSP Phase 1, however long, however much a million and a half would get us, come to West Flash. So you can read that. All of those are kind of what we've just talked about, but put numbers to them. Um, you know, we, we, so I guess we can have more discussion about that. I, we don't, those parks things are things we have to do. I think there are things that are good for us to consider. Uh, if there's trepidation on the tax rate to not take it to 50.8, uh, I would start whacking here and work our way up. So um, some are more important than others, like the old, old OSP lighting. That's kind of a safety thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, I guess we could remove the lighting and not have lighting there because those aren't our main playing fields, although we do use them for games and we do use them for practices. Um, but uh, if you guys don't have an appetite uh, on the uh, CIP or, or, or on the tax rate and therefore the CIPs, then here's where I would start and we just can start work, you know, working our way up the list if, if we want to, knowing that this isn't fully going to get us there, but I mean, knocking essentially all of those on that list gets you a penny or 1.2 cents or something. I mean, if you anything that's not the no new revenue rate, we still have to go out there and vote to raise taxes, right? That's how the legislation. No, yeah, yeah. We're below that. Yeah, well, yeah, but no, no. You, you've but got to vote on the you've rate. You've got to vote to take anything you, that's to not. Take, 
the no new revenue rate and treat it as if it's a tax raise increase, correct? Right. If it's not the 41 cents. Yeah. Yeah. If, and so if and you, no, one's, no one's saying we're going to go with the no new revenue rate, so right. I feel like we're going to have to go out there and do it anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and if we're staying below the voter approval rate, right. I mean, I, I know that you know, uh, valuations are tied to that, but mm, that's outside of our power to affect. Correct. Um, yeah. um, I don't necessarily have a bunch of heartburn as long as we're below the voter approval rate. I mean, our, our approach in bringing all this to you was I, I didn't feel comfortable bringing you a tax rate increase for us to pay the light bill and to pay for salaries and whatnot. Because yeah. that's just kind of, we should be able to live within our means there. All of these are really 100% CIP related and um, most of which we kind of have an obligation to do uh, morally, legally, contractually, whatever. Yeah. I, I, sorry, Mr. Mayor. No, go ahead. I think, I think the goal should be, um, you know, once these uh, new large facilities come online, to begin to reduce the tax rate and the burden on the taxpayers right. long term at large. Yeah, but agreed. We, but until that happens, we are on the hook for a lot of infrastructure, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's fair to everyone else to say we're going to kick park stuff and other stuff down the road. Personally, as long as we stay below the voter approved rate, I, I'm the adjusted voter approval. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's 52, right? 52 and yeah, so we're and half. two and a half below it. I, well, I mean, Trying obviously, what's that? Yeah, and I, I've got some right. comments at the end. I'm sure whenever we're getting sure. probably pretty close. Yeah, right. but, we are. Uh, yeah. Well, I think it's important for the council to recognize that the the tax additional tax dollars are coming from the INS and not M and O, and that's mm -hmm. important because. Uh, as Josh correctly pointed out, there will be opportunities for future councils in the next year to, to lower that mm -hmm. rate. Because I think Mary's right. I, we haven't seen the start of global waiver sales tax mm -hmm. numbers yet. And to be honest, we'll probably see a lot more ETI because they've still got a long way to go because mm -hmm. they're not even... Well, I, I don't not, guess they've even drilled piers for face the second wafer fab yet, so maybe I, they have. But I think, yeah, I, I, I would ask, yeah, they, they've done piers. They're doing oh, foundation they? work now. On, on two? On two. On two? Okay. But, so. uh, but I, I, I asked them, uh, you know, at that meeting we had a couple weeks ago with them, so you just accomplished a million hours in 12 months. You're going to double that, aren't you? T.I. told me. A lot more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my point to the council is, yeah, if we don't get wrapped around the axle for this year or next year, um, there'll be, I think our sales taxes are going to be off the charts, and I think we'll be in position to lower that quite a bit and uh, share those uh, advantages with the citizens. Well, and the property tax values will start coming on as well. I mean, the permanent ones. You know, TI is going to be done with their phase one. It sounds like end end part of second half anyway of uh, uh, next year. With what Al Alejandro? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, after that, so the year after that is when their tax abatement would start. So you know, all the value that has come on is going to go off while the new. Phase two value is coming no, on, so that's that. why it, it does that for a little bit, all the while going up in total. But um, so I think we get to this 26 time frame, and I, I just think there's, as you saw in the projections, I just think there's relief, relief on the way. You know. Yeah, I, I just, <clears throat> I think if we're <clears throat> gonna be on the hook for doing and taking the hit for doing anything that isn't the no new revenue rate, which nobody is advocating for at all. Um, if the taxpayer says, hey, man, here's your, here's your ceiling. Here's how much you can spend. Well, if we decide, well, this year we only need this much, but this year we need this much, I'm okay with floating up and down but staying underneath the ceiling. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, uh, I don't want to set the precedent, well, well, this year we only needed 42, 
and now we're stuck at 42 and we can never go above it and we've created a false ceiling for ourselves. Um, but again, I understand everyone's valuations are going up and everyone is hurting, but that's not within the scope of our control because we also have 8%, you know, cost of living increases, um, you know, everything's yeah. getting more expensive for us too. So for me, I mean, I think I've dated okay. my position. Uh, we'll, sorry, sorry, Sean. We'll wind. <laughs> Don't punch me. <laughs> we'll we'll wind all this out in just a minute. But I just wanted to have that discussion uh, while we're here on the details. Um. And this is the downtown uh, tax increment for investment zone Here's the utility improvement. These are the, the city funds. These are funded. These projects are funded by transfers from the general from the utility fund. This is GTA funds. These funds, uh, this total project today, um, a little bit of that comes off of our books. Most of it is from the GTA bond funds that are deposited in their account. Um, sometimes we spend money on these spend funds on these GTA projects, and then they reimburse us for that. That's just sometimes it's more expedient for us to write the check. Sometimes we have, they haven't received bonds. Yet. But this just gives you an idea of the, uh, where we are in the projects and what projects we have out there. And that's all that is today. It's not a approval thing. It's just um, and here's the slide on our group claims history. You can see we have a little bug up in 23. Let me point one more thing out on the financial side before we just wind up these things. So, um, what's also baked in here, but and it, it's on the detail slide at the end, is we're closing PERS one for one and three, and three, and those close into the general fund. So the general fund is getting some benefit from the PERS that's closing in. And that resolution will come to the council probably in September. We can close these funds because we've made the last debt service payment on TERS number one. But we have to wait till we make it. Done. Where are those located? Um, I'm sorry. My town business? center in Woodmont. No. Yeah. I'm not into TERS. <laughs> hey, uh, and, and there's no, and we don't have, obviously, those are pretty specific areas that mainly are power centers, but there's no uh, planned projects in those areas that we could. Utilize the county and the other, you know, um, since there, there's revenues being well. So, there. is the county even yeah. in Ters One? Oh, they're not even in Ters One. I don't yeah. think they're they're even in three. Not okay, in three. we started uh, in five. Started right. that resource starting in five. Gotcha. Yeah, they're, they're in five. seven. Though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're in five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Seven. Five, so that six, helps. Seven. Nine. That helps a little bit. Um, okay. So. So this is where I need the head nods for, for more discussion. Um, and I'm just going to, anything on that page that we need to talk more about, realizing that there's still, we owe you some coming back on the City Hall stuff. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, and this is, I just stuck those in there. We, we just talked about those in detail. Um, okay, uh, we actually just had to talk about the rates, but is there any, um, this is going to think I did this on purpose. <laughs> left, we're talking about, um, any thoughts, any more discussion on this? There he is. There he is. Yeah. All right, so everybody <laughs> say okay. Yeah. <laughs> just like Justin said, raise them as much as possible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So this is, this rate is um, about nearly two cents lower than the uh, max uh, adjusted voter approval rate, as Josh pointed out. Uh, and we can float, I mean, by law, that's, that is our cap, right? You, you don't have to set that cap, but the state sets that cap. So we're already capped by the state at, at that level. Um, so any more, our, our goal here is 
we're going to wrap all these things up and bring them back in the form of a draft budget. And that will be in July. And then final, there's a, a calendar at the end of this, but um, there'll be a uh, meeting where we bring uh, um, one's the proposed budget, one's the draft. Anyway, we've got some more meetings for budget and for tax rate in July and August with final adoption, I think, in the first meeting in September. Like so, Robbie, I would say um, solid waste, the Taswall issue. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to task you with uh, kind of leading the charge on rallying, maybe with David yeah. and uh, Janet and Bruce and Gainesville and getting support to redistribute the overage just for the amounts that each city pays or to our percentages that we've agreed on upon in the past. Right. We can still charge, they can still charge the other customers and not obviously. Yeah. Um, give us that money yeah but uh, just the amount that we're paying in extra to get our money back yeah or whatever it is you need you know I would just charge you to work with them to, right. to kind of uh, politic with those uh, different groups try to get that money back for sure okay um, stormwater fee um, I love the stormwater program I think if we feel strongly enough about the stormwater program it's not necessarily attached to the fee um, you know if we want to pay for that um, you know I've, I've always been opposed to the stormwater fee uh, because it walks outside the lines of any restricted uh, type of increases. And so I don't like the fee creation. I didn't like that when we did it. Yeah. So if we want to pay for it, I think we fund it out of the general fund. And if we think that's, if that extra staff member is, is important enough for us to fund out of the general fund, the same people pay the fee that pay taxes anyways. So you're charging it to the same people. Yeah. So what I, would, um, what I would say on that is if we don't have like an additional person isn't going to do as much good without additional um, stuff. And so, um, you know, adding one more person uh, helps maybe distribute and we can do a little bit more work, but we would also need an increased budget for materials and other things. So it's not just the cost of a hundred, I don't let's call it a hundred grand for uh, a new person. It would be a hundred grand plus some more stuff to get there and um, materials, et cetera. Um, most of that dollar that we were proposing here, which remember a dollar equals about 460 grand a year. Three fourths of that was for debt service. Yeah. And so that would be for projects. And so if what you're saying out of the general fund, really what you're saying is that's um, either it comes out of the general fund reserves or it gets added to the list, the seven million, six or seven onto their CO list, which everything else held equal is either going to raise the tax rate more than we just said, or it knocks something off the list that we have in there, or it uh, eats into the uh, reserves of the general fund. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't mind looking at. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows the implications. Uh, it, and I'm, I'm really kind of saying four, $450,000 a year, $1 on the average uh, impervious area fee um, is the equivalent of a penny on the tax rate. Right? It is. It is. Okay, so like what, what you're saying is, though, by doing it in a fee, is that we're going to get them from every possible no, direction. It, right. It's, you know? it's not, um, it's allowed by law, and it's set up, um, I mean, there are uh, state statutes that um, direct, I mean, we, we had to do a study. Right, we have to do all these different things. To your point, though, it's there is no, there is a not a no new stormwater fee revenue right. calculation right. or a voter approved stormwater fee calculation. Um, so I, we can build it in however you guys want. Um, and, unless you tell I, me you know, because you know, TI's footprint is going to be so big that they're going to pay. Yeah, well, see, here's the thing. But if we don't leave it at a fee, then our citizens are going to have to pay that. The citizens are already the ones paying it now. The stormwater fee is generated from the square footage. Do we not go through that? Yeah. So yeah. our bigger, yeah. our bigger, like Justin's house, for instance. Yeah. Is yeah. That yeah. 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 He's, He's like twenty-two bucks a month. <laughs> yeah. But what I don't like about putting it in general fund is because I don't think it's fair to the average citizen to have to pay pay their share of a larger right. tax bill. It's actually more fair with the tax rate. No, it isn't because the WalMarts, the Targets, the the car dealers, the 
the people that have the impervious area. The ones with the fifty million, hundred million dollar facilities that pay tax on a hundred million bucks. Well, and they'll pay a larger stormwater fee. And right. And the granny over on, you know, Pick a Street, will not have to pay that for them. That's my point. Yeah, I, and, and I don't know. Figure out which it's way. About, it's figure about out which way is better for me. the citizens. Because I, I'm with David. Is that I want it to be better for for our regular citizens and whatever the best way for that is if charging businesses like walmart that pay they have a hundred million dollar facility one penny is less than what we charge them on a stormwater fee then we should probably charge a stormwater fee but if I'm, what i'm saying is sure. if these big box users pay more through a fee than they do the tax rate yeah then the fee probably is the place to put it well because so i'd rather charge it to so Not the citizens. Let me throw one right. more thing to consider in here. Uh, up until two months ago, we were on a path of a four and a half percent increase, a utility rate increase for everybody, including the citizens. For the average citizen, that's about two and a half to three dollars a month. What we just proposed is we're not doing that in 24 or 25, and maybe not for the next five years. So they're avoiding two or three dollars a month, the average citizen, <laughs> and we're adding a dollar in there. So it's a dollar fifty net from what our other plans were. Now it's not net. That's not. Um, that's more than they're paying now. This would be, but it's less than we would be proposing otherwise to pay. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a, it's a net wash benefit to the average citizen. Really, probably to all citizens. Considering that, if you guys say that the, that our um, utility rate, if we want to adopt this thing, even uh, we still owe you some more information about years three, four, and five. But if we adopt this plan, then everyone's bill is not going to go up. The, the um, even the, the the granny on Jones Street mm -hmm. is not going to go up by two or three dollars. It's right. going to go up by zero, and then this will be added. So. Something else to consider. So, so for the gr the granny on Jones Street, her stormwater fee would increase by twelve dollars a year. If if she's sure. the average, if she has uh, average, it actually she is probably Well, she lives on Jones Street. That's well, why I said Jones Street. Then it's it's sixty two cents. Sixty cents. Sixty two cents. Yeah. Like seven dollars a year. Seven dollars. Seven dollars yeah. a year. Yeah. Man, hmm. maybe better to keep. I mean, I was just saying what, whatever is the best thing for the average citizen, yeah. right? And if we feel so, it, my whole point is if we feel so confident that we need this, yeah. then we need to figure out a way to pay for it, whether we impose a fee or not. And sure. so... And I'm willing to look at those things. I'm just, I like, most people, including myself, I mean, I don't read, I don't read my water bill. People see stormwater probably about like they see utility it's just a bill for seventy dollars and there's trash on it there's water there's sewer there's stormwater there's pride funds there's whatever yeah. um, so um, I'm willing to look at whatever my proposal is one Lance is two uh, <laughs> three. <I'm>, uh, Sean, <laughs> okay. yes, we got a three over here do I have four okay <laughs> All the people who have to take care of that are saying, you know, so. Um, yeah, the, and the reality of the fee is it, it forces you to take that money and spend it on stormwater specifically. Like once it's, it's generated out of that fee, it can't be moved to other things. It can't be moved to parks. It can't be moved to you know, facilities or anything like that. It has to be used for stormwater, which there is value there from a citizen standpoint. My money they know what they're paying it for. Yeah. yeah, and it's more of a user fee. The people that are generating impervious surface, causing stormwater issues, are are the ones paying for it. So we haven't. Uh, we don't know off the top of our head how much of this is residential. Like of the total four hundred and sixty thousand a year, how much is residential and how much is not? And my my sense would be residential is less than a fourth of the total revenue. It'd be How interesting many, because if you Walmart think about a McDonald's, you know, it's probably like like the house on Jones Street. You know, it doesn't occupy very much space. It's all impervious. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe it's equivalent of one unit, 3500 one buck, right? So McDonald's is paying a buck. 
But if it was paying it based on their value of property, yeah. they'd be paying a hundred bucks. You know, but so. The parking lot and, and okay. all that. So here's a, here's yeah. a very rough math: fourteen thousand residents, a dollar, about twelve dollars a year is one hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars in total revenue. One hundred sixty-eight yeah. is proportion of four sixty. I really can't do that one in my head, but it's a, it's about yeah. a fourth. I hear you. Or twenty percent, or uh, you know, don't you wish stuff. we could do this for a whole other day? Yeah. <laughs> hey, don't get me. Yeah. Are we? We're late to our next meeting. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll start at any time after four. But so I need some. Um, I've, I've heard some differing points of view here. I need some consensus on what. What do you guys think about the stormwater fee or not? Uh, particularly in light, I'm making my pitch now, particularly in light of us adopting a utility rate that is going to be zero effect on uh, probably 98% of residential customers. If you use 20,000 gallons or more, which that, that's a lot of water, um, then you, know, you would be affected some, but you know. I'm okay with the $1 a month. Okay. Um, any other on that one? Um, anything that is a, a, we talked about that one. Coming back, uh, I'm going to push on uh, through the, the uh, mechanism, through the powers that be uh, on this item. Oh, that's it. Any other last minute things before we adjourn the meeting and have this other very quick meeting. Uh, yeah, well, we kind of went through, I mean, we kind of zipped over it, but... Are, are we ready for the notice of intent on the Yeah, okay, so CIP, uh, the, the CO for the 23 bond issue. COs, uh, that 70 something, whatever million that ends up being, funded by the rates that are below the no uh, of the adjusted voter approval rate. You, you guys, um, yeah. I've, I've heard from I've heard from What's that? these guys on the on the our okay, CIP okay. list, the 70 the 70 something million dollar um, list of CIPs, mostly roads, a little bit of facilities, a little bit of parks. City Hall, we are on pause. The seven City million, Hall, we're not buying land. Well, I, I mean, that's that's the building, right? No, no, no. But no, the building is thirty. Is 30 yeah. million, okay. The we, so, is 30 something, the seven, which is are we approving that to acquire now? Or are we hmm. on hold that's on that? That's what I'm asking. Pretty much. I would so, be on hold personally. I would too. I, I yeah. would say it's not going to get any cheaper. Especially, you know, we had this conversation, so it's <laughs> definitely not getting any cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to get any cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I agree that, 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 that I agree it's not going to get any cheaper. For sure, it's, it's not going to get any cheaper. If you think there's a chance that we're not going to use it at all, then we, we shouldn't move forward with it. Um, and so, um, if you think there's a high probability, whether it's now or in 10 years, it's certainly not going to be any cheaper in 10 years. Yeah, that, and that's what I'm thinking. If, yeah. if, if they come back right. and the price is not what we want and the numbers are not what we want, uh, I'd rather have it now, like we did some other property off 1417 that did very well for us in the long term. Yeah. I'd rather just get it now and sit on it. I mean, we already said, okay, I think I can live with the rate. We can sit on it. And if it turns out that, you know what, we want to build it somewhere else or whatever, like, it's a land investment. It's not. Let me ask Just, you this, too, Robbie. So, and I don't know, Kevin, and I don't know if you guys are on, y'all have done 16 miles of, of resurface this year, whether it's teardown or mill and overlay, which, if my math comes out right, puts you on pace for 25 this year, if you kept the same average for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, do we have that same plan for next year? Because I know we did some... Capital you infusion. Don't have money left to continue at that same pace. Right. So my, my point is is that Robbie, if you're because I mean I want to continue Kevin's work, okay. Right. And I would trade his work for a number of other things. 
right? right? I think that's one of the most important things over everything else, what he's doing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of important things, but yeah. it's over the things that are wants. That's yeah. a need, right? Yeah. And so if you tell me, hey, we're just looking for $7 million. If we don't use it here, we can push it to Kevin's department and put him back on more roads, then uh, I'd be more inclined to say okay. I mean, yeah, the seven, there is literally no, there's no detailed math behind the $7 million. Um, I don't, it, what I feel like is that number is high. It's a not to exceed number. If, you, if, if I'm putting um, the next phase of some design and planning with a land number, it's probably no more than half of that. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we do that and it's no more than half, then we can use it for anything that we put in our list, parks, streets, other facilities, and whatever. And so if you're okay with that concept, including um, more more dollars uh, for CIP project for streets and roads. 100% cool with that. Yeah, and the head nod is for Mary to move forward with the amount. issue in the debt. We won't actually spend that money until after we've come back and shown what the master, you know, the planned area for downtown is and make sure that y'all are all green light. Like, I don't, we're not going to go start <clears throat> making offers next week to any of these properties. Yeah, this is um, an authority to spend... Oh, seventy-seven okay. million. So, okay. So if we get that information, it's like, no, it's not happening. This, then we can do that. Seven. In some way, this is our best guess about how it would be. And many of those are. Next year, whether it's a street. Shepherd Drive is going to be, we think, twelve million dollars, right? So we think that's a pretty good number. Some of the others are a little bit more squishy. How much is? How much is it for like the city hall stuff? How much for parks? The park stream. So. Well, and my concern, and I know I don't want to harp on roads and streets, and we didn't get to hear from Kevin much today, but my question is, is that I know that we have 250 plus or minus miles of city-maintained streets, and we have more now because of new construction. Yeah. They have to be touched every 10 to 15 years at minimum, re-milled re or whatever, right? And if we're not doing 25 miles a year, because we don't know what emergencies are going to pop up, then we're not on pace to keep up with our roads in general. No, you're right. So here's what my approach would be on roads. I'm sure. Um, we've never, um, we've never been able to spend all of the amount that we've allocated historically. And so um, this year that we're in, we're now at about one point two million dollars in road materials. Because we've increased the size of our staff over the last year or two and added a bunch of equipment, this has really been the first year we've been able to do as much as we've been able to do. Okay? So what Kevin is saying is kind of that in, in, in a different way. Hey, uh, because we're now fully staffed and because we have a, a bigger um, street materials budget, it's $1.2 million now. I think it was like 700000 last year is what we spent. It's nearly double. Huh? Okay, so 50% more. So it's like, we're supersizing all of this, and I didn't, I mean, I could put $10 million in the budget, but it doesn't do any good if we can't spend it, if we, if we don't have the staffing and equipment to actually use it. I don't want to put it in the budget. So, um, I'm willing to say, um, and we'll set them up at the end, um, I bet Kevin can't spend $2.5 million in road material. Now, <laughs> look at that grin. No, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We'll see. Challenge we'll see accepted. About that. Yeah. My, my point is, this is probably one of those things that we say, hey, you keep going and we'll settle up in right. September. Right? You can't spend two and a half million in open material. This year? No, you. Yeah. Without storing it up? <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, we would just lay a whole lot more asphalt. And you have the ability to do that with long. people and equipment. Yeah, if we, if we just laid asphalt. By September. By this September? Yes. Or are you saying for next year? No, I mean this He's year. Saying. Where are we at? <laughs> <laughs> I can spend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you already are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Probably not this year. Not this late in the year. Okay, that's my point. Yeah, I mean, maybe through but, December, yeah. but we're in the next fiscal year for that. So right, my point right. is... I just want to make sure he has enough money to be able to touch 25 miles road next year. No, and and this year, if possible, 
Could be. Well, if he, well, if he can finish this year off, because he's on pace to do 25 now. And so, he's done 13 I mean, so far, He's yeah. done 16, yeah. So we, right. we just need to give him the tools and resources he needs to be able to keep up with the failing streets. No, I agree you with know. that. I agree with that. And I think the way to do that is to uh, continue supersizing his materials budget. And if he can, if he shows this year that he can spend 1.2 million, which is what he's on track to do, if he can spend 1.4, I'm probably going to say go spend 1.4. We'll sell out in September, and we'll probably know between now and when we adopt the budget. And, and, and that's to, to that point. That's what we did in 2018. Yeah. When we first got the mill machine, right. and we were working on Gallagher, and I said I'm going to go over by. If I finish it all, I'm going to go over by 200,000. And he said, Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're doing. Like. Yeah. We're trying to. This is really just our best guess at what we're going to spend in a work plan. Our goal isn't to spend 1.2 million. Our goal is to do this amount and more if we can, and if we can afford it through a budget amendment. And and we know kind of where we stand with things. Our, we're not hurting in the general fund reserves. I don't want to, you know, draw down reserve general fund reserve to 52 days. That's not what we're talking about. It may be another one day of reserves. If, as it's what he may be able to spend. I'm okay with that. And so to me, bringing that back to a CIP thing, if you approve this and we don't need it, we're going to spend it on something. And if you're saying, hey, well, I think we should spend it on streets, 100%, I'm, I, I can, I'm all about that. Because I think we've not been able to keep up with streets how we've needed to in the past. Just because we haven't literally been able to do that. Like, it could not get the work done because we didn't have a staff. There's other things that can prevent that, that can prevent them from getting it done. Yeah, I mean, I mean weather and yeah. availability of materials. If the asphalt asphalt plant yeah. closes, I mean they're out yeah. right. So a lot I of don't necessarily mean they're going to spend it all. I mean, if you did, that could prevent them from getting 25 yeah. done. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to see them get it done. But Sean saw those numbers. You fence it up and go right, like you know, nine, ten miles of just chip steel. Right. If we could put those resources to just paving mm -hmm. asphalt, we would have burned. Three times on the yeah, money because like chip seal is way less than right. asphalt. Yeah. So it's, but right. that's what I was getting at when I said I could spend a whole lot more because I could asphalt it all, which makes it last longer, but it costs way more. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that's what that whole program showed is here's the spots you need to be chip sealing because it's the cheapest cost per yeah. year annual to keep it where it needs to go. Well, here, so here's my charge to these guys. They already know this. This isn't new. It's you guys get as much done as you can through September, and we'll we'll get it paid for. And we'll settle up at the end, kind of, in September. For next year, we got to pick Start a point. Again, man. Whether we whether it's two hundred thousand or two million, it's our best guess at what he's going to be able to spend. And if we have a wet summer, this next year or a wet spring, it may be back to eight hundred thousand because it, no matter how many people he has, may not be able to spend it. So. Maybe uh, to close this one, right. if you guys are okay with this, with the caveat, hey, if that's not spent on these things, and we've got to come back to you anyway to get authority to spend these dollars uh, on right. contracts and different things. If you guys want to tell me, hey, if you don't spend it here, we want it on streets. Great. I mean, Kevin would love that. I think it's a great. I think that's a great way to allocate that. So you're just asking to get approval to go get a rate, not not to issue debt, but to get a rate. Well, the notice of intent. I don't. Know. What's the notice of intent? Is that we plan on? Is it our indication that we are committed to issuing? We're committed to issuing, and um, they'll go ahead and set up the sale date. We'll um, establish a not to exceed number. Now we do have a certain window of time. I was going to ask, how it's, long is it's that? Not, it's not long. It's weeks. It's right. not months where you can say, we don't want to issue. We put right. $78 million in there. Let's do 50 mm. So you do have a little bit of time in there. But what we'll do is we'll list, um, because the Attorney General has become more strict on this, every project, don't let it scare you, be a project list this long knowing that, you know, we'll do the approved project. Because if you decide to take one of those out and substitute it, you used to could do that. Mm -hmm. Now you have to stick to that project. Oh, so what good. you do is you just list oh, everything that yeah. they ever. Yeah. You list every project on yeah. your list. You because just throw it all in there and 
but you'll approve the ones wow. that we're going to do. Mm -hmm. But it, it may be a little scary if yeah. you see that on the agenda. You go, oh, there's only 20 million. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. It's, That's it's when so you were nodding off. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you would want, so you would want to put another, I'm just making up the number, $10 million in streets. And knowing that you can move money around, uh, you, so our our notice to uh, our notice of intent is it's very, seventy-five or eighty million. Yeah. We list projects that are hundred million. Right. Any of that hundred can be spent, whether we issue seventy-eight or right. eighty-eight or ninety-eight. But if it's not enumerated in that list, you can't just decide. Oh yeah, you know what? We get this new project. Yeah, we're gonna, we want to add this. Right. Yeah. Can't do that anymore. So you've got to put as much. On the list as possible. So if you got want flexibility. Bigger, yeah. way bigger than exactly. and, and we only have a couple of weeks to get this done, right? Well, and, and to right. tell you all, to give you a little bit more vision into what City Hall would look like moving forward with your direction, uh, we know that there's space issues, but I think, and correct me where I'm wrong, Sean, what you're asking is can those space issues be accomplished a different way through other buildings that we've got or something like that? And what we, what we know too is that. The OPD doesn't mean ADA compliance, and we've already gotten the cost from well before that that would cost us a, a decent chunk of money to get there. And so um, we would we would move forward with designing what that would look like simultaneously with the master planning and, hey, if we did this other option thing, what would that look like? How much would that cost roughly, right? Say we redid City Hall and the OPD. How much would that cost? And looking at the value, I think, is what you're asking about. Where do we get the value for the lifespan of whatever building there is? Two, two, two types of conversations there. One is exactly what you're saying, and then the other is when we employed Gensler, the marching orders were to bring us back our why we need a city hall, right? Like we have this much square feet, this many people, and, you know, all the things that would tell us, here's your needs assessment of why do you even need to do this at all, you know? And, and you can look around and know we're crowded. <clears throat> They kind of do yeah. that with the square footage assessment some. Um, you know, they, they, but without saying you, you need 35,600 yeah. square feet, they just said, ah, here's kind of a pretty yeah. big number. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, that's, I mean, we've talked about that, the need to have that more granular yeah. and really yeah. dial that back. Right. So that's what I was, what I was going to say was that uh, we're probably going to take two steps back before we take any step forward, to be sure. honest with you, so that we can get to that more granular level. And, and um, But knowing that there would be some costs associated with anything we did. Yeah. Uh, I, like, to Robbie's point, is that $7 million? I don't know what it is. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, a rebuild of Central is 500 bucks a foot. I mean, like, I mean, that's what, and that Aaron, like Aaron, we've uh, had much experience with Aaron, so I, I trust his numbers. I don't like it. I, mean, I still don't want to get off on it, but you can still build a really nice house for 200 bucks a foot. So how is something 500? That's just how it is. So you start at 500 as a rebuild. The numbers were uh, what 728 on the other. Uh, 700, square, 700 per foot, so it's it's in that six, seven, eight hundred for new stuff, and that's what the other things are coming. So, so Robbie, did you get a chance to go tour Princeton and go and talk with Crossland about that? I did, okay. um, and um, there there were a couple of things there. Number one, they started in 2020, sure, and the escalation from 2020 till now is probably 50 percent in okay. building cost. See, they they told me that they were building one. And I'm just offhanded comments, but they were building one currently at three, oh, a little bit over 350. Oh, that one was at 333. But they said they were at like 370 or something on, on this one that they're currently doing. Oh, was that uh, one of the other builders? That wasn't Princeton. Princeton's is done. Princeton's done. Yeah. Crossland did Crossland. that one. And, and they're the ones that uh, I talked to, had a conversation with them offline. Gotcha. Yeah. Because they, they were asking me about projects in Sherman. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, they, they're building one currently at like 370. And I'm not suggesting that we need to go with them or anything. I'm just kind of curious what the differences may be. Yeah, I have, I have not talked to Crossland about that new project that, they're, uh, that they've got going. The Princeton was 330 a square foot. Yeah. So, yeah, you this, yeah. you this, you this, okay. but, yeah. 
Yeah. Anyways, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not we'll get it well, we can bring, no. so that, I think our, yeah. our marching We're, orders on that one is clear. We're going to bring back more information uh, and uh, a more holistic look and bring back more information about alternatives and about dialing really here's what we're asking, here's what we need before we turn them loose to go design anything. We need to, we'll get that coming in. Um, but we do have this other issue, to Mary's point, this 70 whatever million, that we would bring back a list of 100 million, or some number, and spend 70 something of that 100 million, uh, you know, on projects that every single one of them have to come back to you for your approval anyway. And to be clear, we have probably 50, 40, whatever million dollars worth of projects. And what you're saying is, if you go do not exceed 77, and in and, and a month from now, we could say, well, we're only going to do 40. And you could modify that with the with the bond issuance prior, prior to being issued. But only for? Uh, it's a period of time. It's probably two or three weeks. I don't think it's We would time. at least have a council meeting in there yeah. where we could uh, yeah, modify. Probably. Right. And if we bonded for 77 and we didn't spend it all, does that money magically disappear at the end of the year? Or does it continue to exist into the next fiscal year? It, it continues okay. to exist. Okay. Okay. Good. As long we'll as get your to keep projects, it. Your projects are allocated. So we get to keep on your list. Yeah. yeah we'll right. Keep right. Keep the money. So and put all put, just put all the water and sewer uh, projects right. on there too, and then <laughs> then we're covered. We got plenty to spend it on. But look, if you have if you have forty nine, that's a must spend. And I think that's what the number was forty three, something like that. Yeah. So we're talking twenty five. Which is, uh, let's say, call it discretionary. Technically, it's all discretionary, right? Since it's right. so, it, it, are there enough projects currently that need to happen with the city of Sherman that we can enumerate that we can cover that twenty-five? I think, yeah, pretty easy. Hundred percent, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, worst case, you use some of that to float the textile share of seventy-five, but we didn't talk about it all. But we'll be on in twenty-five and twenty-six. So you can pay debts with that number as well. Yeah, you can. You yes, can you pay debt. Okay. Okay. I mean, pay debt. Yeah. yeah. So, hmm. do you have the? It's all clear as mud now. You got it. I mean, you know, it's a new. Yeah. What are we? What are we even voting on? So <laughs> I just need. Are we going to get? What we, are we going to get what we need, or are we playing games? I can't decide what we're doing. Are right. we trying to get a hundred million? Are we going to vote for seventy-seven? What we're, are we doing? We're uh, we're getting direction on seventy-seven or seventy-eight 77 million. million. But that's what we need. Why don't we just issue yeah. the bond for that? And yeah, then if what, we have a little left over at, just, in City Hall, we can... I just need a consensus uh, uh, for, for what that number is, and then we'll make okay. that happen and spend it according to plans that will... I mean, I'm for it. Similar to this, but we'll come back to you for exact... But what you're saying uh, is project. 77 uh, gets us 0. .508. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of the implication is if you're voting on the tax rate right now, if you're shaking your head to say go. Yeah. So you're saying I'm okay with the tax rate. Subject, I mean, that may end up being a little bit more or less depending on the um, valuations that come. Right. You guys can tell us now. Do not bring us back anything more than 508, and we'll not bring you back anything more than 508. Do not bring us back anything more okay. than 508. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anything else? Do we need to vote on that? No, no. no. Okay. That's just direction for us to come back with. Okay. All right. We can we that. can we move to adjourn this meeting? Are you yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. You yes. Too? Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, All right. So we'll take so we a, need to, uh, a motion. This one? Yeah, we're gonna. Motion. Yeah, I move to adjourn. The budget planning. Second. Okay. Motion second. All in favor. Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Now, uh, we'll call the the what are we calling this contract revenue bond series 2023A. City of Sherman project and approving the issuance thereof and the <coughs> pardon me the facilities to be constructed or acquired by such authority. Is anybody here to speak on this item today? Do we need it? Is it a resolution? It's a public hearing. No. Oh, oh. It's an ordinance. Do you need to read it? He just read it. Oh, I read it. I read it. Do I need to put <laughs> any <laughs> magic language? <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so no no. Nobody's here to speak on this, so we'll close uh, public okay. hearing. Council, questions, discussion? I move to approve, Mr. Mayor. Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, if it's okay with y'all, we'll skip council comments. 
Uh, got enough comments tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the case, I move to adjournment. Okay. Yeah. Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.